introductory matter of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Donne, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Introductory matter containing an introduction by Henry Morley, 1888, Walton's Dedication, and Walton's Epistle to the Reader. Henry Morley's Introduction Isaac Walton was born at Stafford in the year 1593, when Shakespeare had newly begun to write plays all his own, and he died in the year 1683, aged 91. He began life, soon after he came of age, in one of the little seamster or draper's shops on the exchange, seven and a half feet long by five feet wide, from which in Decker's Shoemaker's Holiday, sweet beauteous Jane tempted the enamoured Hammond, saying, Sir, what is it you buy? What is it you lack, sir? Calico or lawn? Fine cambric shirts or bands? what will you buy? In 1624, at the age of thirty-one, Isaac Walton moved into Fleet Street, where his shop was on the north side, two doors west of the end of Chancery Lane. He moved afterwards to the seventh house round the corner on the west side of the lane. He went to church at St. Paul's, where Dunn, who died in 1631, had been made dean in 1623, and he found a friend in the poet-preacher who first quickened his religious life. In 1626, the year of Francis Bacon's death, Isaac Walton married at Canterbury Rachel Flood, who was descended on the mother's side from Archbishop Cramner. Fourteen years afterwards, that first wife died, having given to her gentle husband seven children, who all died when young. In business, Walton prospered, and on holidays he went as an angler to the River Lee. The year of his first wife's death, 1640, was that of the publication of a volume of Dunn's sermons, to which Walton prefixed the life of Dunn, which will be found in this volume. Walton's age was forty-seven in that year, 1640, which was closely followed by the greater troubles between King and Parliament that grew to civil war. The civil war began in 1642, and in the following year Isaac Walton, aged fifty, gave up the business by which he had earned enough to live in peace. He was a firm friend to church and king, and loved the poets, and he was a contemplative man, not only when he went a-fishing. In 1646 Isaac Walton married again, his second wife being the sister of Thomas Ken, then a boy nine years old, afterwards one of the seven bishops who were sent to the tower for resisting James the Second's claim to a dispensing power who is remembered also by some gentle verses, among which are the familiar morning and evening hymns. Anne Ken, the sister who became the second wife of Isaac Walton, gave him sixteen more years of happiness in married life, beginning when his age was fifty-three, and ending when he was just reaching the age of threescore and ten. It was in the seventh year of this second marriage, when his age was sixty, that Isaac Walton published the first edition of his Complete Angler. There remained, after the death of his second wife, still twenty years of life before him, and he had also the solace left him of a son who bore his father's name, and a daughter who was named after her mother Anne. The second of the lives, published by Isaac Walton, was that of Richard Hooker, prefixed to an edition of his works in 1666, year of the Fire of London. The third was that of Sir Henry Wotton, prefixed to the Reliquiae Wotianiae in 1670. In the same year, 1670, appeared Walton's Life of George Herbert with his letters, and also the first collection of the four lives into a volume illustrated with portraits of the men described. 
That is the volume here reprinted. Within nine years of its first publication, it had reached a fifth edition, and it has since maintained its position as a living book. A fifth life, that of Dr. Robert Sanderson, Bishop of Lincoln, was not published until eight years later, in 1678, when the biographer had reached the age of eighty-five. Isaac Walton was for some time domesticated with George Morley, Bishop of Winchester, and in the house of his son-in-law, Dr. Hawkins, prebendary of Winchester Cathedral. He died at Winchester on the 15th of December, 1683. Walton's lives are of men who were very near to him, and whose lives touched his own. He was a child when Hooker died, but the George Cramner of whom he tells as Hooker's pupil was uncle to Walton's first wife. Dunn had from the pulpit of St. Paul's first stirred in him the depths of spiritual life, and had looked in on him when he kept shop near the corner of Chancery Lane. Walton was forty-six when Sir Henry Wotton died, while, as for George Herbert, Isaac Walton and he were both born in the same year, though one died in the earlier half of the reign of Charles I, the other lived on through the Commonwealth, and through the reign of Charles II, and into the reign of James II, dying in the year of the executions of Lord Russell and Algernon Sidney. H. M. February 1888 Walton's Dedication to the Right Honourable and Reverend Father in God, George, Lord Bishop of Winchester, and Prelate of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. My Lord, I did some years past present you with a plain relation of the life of Mr. Richard Hooker, that humble man to whose memory princes and the most learned of this nation have paid a reverence at the mention of his name. And now, with Mr. Hooker's, I present you also the life of that pattern of primitive piety, Mr. George Herbert, and with his, the life of Dr. Dunn, and your friend, Sir Henry Wotton, all reprinted. The two first were written under your roof, for which reason, if they were worth it, you might justly challenge a dedication and indeed so you might of Dr. Dunn's and Sir Henry Wotton's, because if I had been fit for this undertaking, it would not have been by acquired learning or study, but by the advantage of forty years' friendship, and thereby with hearing and discoursing with your lordship, that hath enabled me to make the relation of these lives passable, if they prove so, in an eloquent and captious age. And, indeed, my lord, though these relations be well-meant sacrifices to the memory of these worthy men, yet I have so little confidence in my performance that I beg pardon for superscribing your name to them, and desire all that know your lordship to apprehend this not as a dedication, at least by which you receive any addition of honour, but rather as an humble and more public acknowledgment of your long continued and your now daily favours to my lord your most affectionate and most humble servant isaac walton epistle to the reader though the several introductions to these several lives have partly declared the reasons how and why i undertook them Yet, since they are come to be reviewed, and augmented, and reprinted, and the four are now become one book, I desire leave to inform you that shall become my reader, that when I sometimes look back upon my education and mean abilities, it is not without some wonder at myself that I am come to be publicly in print and, though I have in those introductions declared some of the accidental reasons that occasioned me to be so, yet let me add this to what is there said, that by my undertaking to collect some notes for Sir Henry Wotton's writing the life of Dr. Dunn, and by Sir Henry Wotton's dying before he performed it, I became like those men that enter easily into a lawsuit or a quarrel and having begun, 
cannot make a fair retreat and be quiet when they desire it. And really, after such a manner, I became engaged into a necessity of writing the life of Dr. Dunn, contrary to my first intentions, and that begot a like necessity of writing the life of his and my ever-honoured friend, Sir Henry Wotton. And having writ these two lives, I lay quiet twenty years, without a thought of either troubling myself or others by any new engagement in this kind, for I thought I knew my unfitness. But about that time Dr. Gowden, then Lord Bishop of Exeter, published the life of Mr. Richard Hooker, so he called it, with so many dangerous mistakes, both of him and his books, that discoursing of them with his grace, Gilbert, that now is Lord Archbishop of Canterbury, he enjoined me to examine some circumstances, and then rectify the bishop's mistakes, by giving the world a fuller and truer account of Mr. Hooker and his books than that bishop had done and I know I have done so. And let me tell the reader that till his grace had laid this injunction upon me, I could not admit a thought of any fitness in me to undertake it. But when he twice had enjoined me to it, I then declined my own and trusted his judgment, and submitted to his commands, concluding that if I did not, I could not forbear accusing myself of disobedience, and indeed of ingratitude for his many favours. Thus I became engaged into the third life. For the life of that great example of holiness, Mr. George Herbert, I profess it to be so far a free-will offering that it was writ chiefly to please myself, but yet not without some respect to posterity. For though he was not a man that the next age can forget, yet many of his particular acts and virtues might have been neglected or lost if I had not collected and presented them to the imitation of those that shall succeed us. For I humbly conceive writing to be both a safer and truer preserver of men's virtuous actions than tradition especially as it is managed in this age. And I am also to tell the reader that though this life of Mr. Herbert was not by me writ in haste, yet I intended it a review before it should be made public. But that was not allowed me by reason of my absence from London when it was printing, so that the reader may find in it some mistakes some double expressions, and some not very proper, and some that might have been contracted, and some faults that are not justly chargeable upon me but the printer, and yet I hope none so great as may not by this confession purchase pardon from a good-natured reader. And now I wish that, as that learned Jew Josephus and others, so these men had also writ their own lives. But since it is not the fashion of these times, I wish their relations or friends would do it for them, before delays make it too difficult. And I desire this the more, because it is an honour due to the dead, and a generous debt due to those that shall live and succeed us, and would to them prove both a content and satisfaction. For when the next age shall, as this does, admire the learning and clear reason which that excellent casuist Dr. Sanderson, the late Bishop of Lincoln, hath demonstrated in his sermons and other writings, who, if they love virtue, would not rejoice to know that this good man was as remarkable for the meekness and innocence of his life as for his great and useful learning, and indeed as remarkable for his fortitude in his long and patient suffering, under them that then called themselves the godly party, for that doctrine which he had preached and printed in the happy days of the nations and the church's peace. And who would not be content to have the like account of Dr. Field, that great schoolman, and others of noted learning? And though I cannot hope that my example or reason can persuade to this undertaking, 
yet I please myself that I shall conclude my preface with wishing that it were so. Isaac Walton End of Introductory Matter Chapter One of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Donne, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One John Donne, Part One Life of Dr. John Donne, Introduction, Prefixed to the First Collection of His Sermons. If that great master of language and art, Sir Henry Wotton, the late provost of Eton College, had lived to see the publication of these sermons, he had presented the world with the author's life exactly written. And twas pity he did not, for it was a work worthy his undertaking, and he was to undertake it. Betwixt whom and the author there was so mutual a knowledge, and such a friendship, contracted in their youth, as nothing but death could force a separation. And though their bodies were divided, their affections were not, for that learned knight's love followed his friend's fame beyond death and the forgetful grave, which he testified by entreating me, whom he acquainted with his design, to inquire of some particulars that concerned it, not doubting but my knowledge of the author and love to his memory, might make my diligence useful. I did most gladly undertake the employment, and continued it with great content, till I had made my collection ready to be augmented and completed by his matchless pen, but then death prevented his intentions. When I heard that sad news, and heard also that these sermons were to be printed, and want the author's life, which I thought to be very remarkable. Indignation or grief, indeed I know not which, transported me so far that I reviewed my forsaken collections and resolved the world should see the best plain picture of the author's life that my artless pencil, guided by the hand of truth, could present to it. And if I shall now be demanded, as once Pompey's poor bondman was, the grateful wretch had been left alone on the seashore with the forsaken dead body of his once glorious lord and master, and was then gathering the scattered pieces of an old broken boat to make a funeral pile to burn it, which was the custom of the Romans, who art thou that alone hast the honour to bury the body of Pompey the Great? So who am I that do thus officiously set the author's memory on fire? I hope the question will prove to have in it more of wonder than disdain, but wonder indeed the reader may, that I, who profess myself artless, should presume with my faint light to show forth his life, whose very name makes it illustrious. But be this to the disadvantage of the person represented, certain I am it is to the advantage of the beholder, who shall here see the author's picture in a natural dress, which ought to beget faith in what is spoken. For he who wants skill to deceive may safely be trusted. And if the author's glorious spirit, which now is in heaven, can have the leisure to look down and see me, the poorest, the meanest of all his friends, in the midst of this officious duty, confident I am that he will not disdain this well-meant sacrifice to his memory. For whilst his conversation made me and many others happy below, I know his humility and gentleness were then eminent, and I have heard divines say, those virtues that were but sparks upon earth become great and glorious flames in heaven. Before I proceed further, I am to entreat the reader to take notice that when Dr. Dunn's sermons were first printed, this was then my excuse for daring to write his life, and I dare not now appear without it. Master John Dunn was born in London in the year 1573, of good and virtuous parents, 
and though his own learning and other multiplied merits may justly appear sufficient to dignify both himself and his posterity yet the reader may be pleased to know that his father was masculinely and lineally descended from a very ancient family in wales where many of his name now live that deserve and have great reputation in that country by his mother he was descended of the family of the famous and learned sir thomas more sometimes lord chancellor of england as also from that worthy and laborious judge rastall who left posterity the vast statutes of the law of this nation most exactly abridged he had his first breeding in his father's house where a private tutor had the care of him until the tenth year of his age and in his eleventh year was sent to the university of oxford having at that time a good command both of the french and latin tongue this and some other of his remarkable abilities made one then give this censure of him that this age had brought forth another picus mirandula of which story says that he was rather born than made wise by study there he remained for some years at hart hall having for the advancement of his studies tutors of several sciences to attend and instruct him till time made him capable and his learning expressed in public exercises declared him worthy to receive his first degree in the schools which he forbore by advice from his friends who being for their religion of the romish persuasion were conscionably averse to some parts of the oath that is always tendered at those times and not to be refused by those that expect the titulary honour of their studies about the fourteenth year of his age he was transplanted from oxford to cambridge where that he might receive nourishment from both soils he stayed till his seventeenth year all which time he was a most laborious student often changing his studies but endeavouring to take no degree for the reasons formerly mentioned about the seventeenth year of his age he was removed to london and then admitted into lincoln's inn with an intent to study the law where he gave great testimonies of his wit his learning and of his improvement in that profession which never served him for other use than an ornament and self-satisfaction his father died before his admission to this society and being a merchant left him his portion in money it was three thousand pounds his mother and those to whose care he was committed were watchful to improve his knowledge and to that end appointed him tutors both in the mathematics and in all the other liberal sciences to attend him but with these arts they were advised to instil into him particular principles of the romish church of which those tutors professed though secretly themselves to be members they had almost obliged him to their faith having for their advantage besides many opportunities the example of his dear and pious parents which was a most powerful persuasion and did work much upon him as he professeth in his preface to his pseudo martyr a book of which the reader shall have some account in what follows he was now entered into the eighteenth year of his age and at that time had betrothed himself to no religion that might give him any other denomination than a christian and reason and piety had both persuaded him that there could be no such sin as schism if an adherence to some visible church were not necessary about the nineteenth year of his age he being then unresolved what religion to adhere to and considering how much it concerned his soul to choose the most orthodox did therefore though his youth and health promised him a long life to rectify all scruples that might concern that presently lay aside all study of the law and of all other sciences that might give him a denomination and began seriously to survey and consider the body of divinity 
as it was then controverted betwixt the reformed and the roman church and as god's blessed spirit did then awaken him to the search and in that industry did never forsake him they be his own words in his preface to the pseudo martyr so he calls the same holy spirit to witness this protestation that in that disquisition and search he proceeded with humility and diffidence in himself and by that which he took to be the safest way namely frequent prayers and an indifferent affection to both parties and indeed truth had too much light about her to be hid from so sharp an inquirer and he had too much ingenuity not to acknowledge he had found her being to undertake this search he believed the cardinal bellarmin to be the best defender of the roman cause and therefore betook himself to the examination of his reasons the cause was weighty and wilful delays had been inexcusable both towards god and his own conscience he therefore proceeded in this search with all moderate haste and about the twentieth year of his age did show the then dean of gloucester whose name my memory hath now lost all the cardinal's work marked with many weighty observations under his own hand which works were bequeathed by him at his death as a legacy to a most dear friend about a year following he resolved to travel and the earl of essex going first to calais and after the island voyages the first anno fifteen ninety six the second fifteen ninety seven he took the advantage of those opportunities waited upon his lordship and was an eye-witness of those happy and unhappy employments but he returned not back into england till he had stayed some years first in italy and then in spain where he made many useful observations of those countries their laws and manner of government and returned perfect in their languages the time that he spent in spain was at his first going into italy designed for travelling to the holy land and for viewing jerusalem and the sepulchre of our saviour but at his being in the furthest parts of italy the disappointment of company or of a safe convoy or the uncertainty of returns of money into those remote parts denied him that happiness which he did often occasionally mention with a deploration not long after his return into england that exemplary pattern of gravity and wisdom the lord ellesmere then keeper of the great seal the lord chancellor of england taking notice of his learning languages and other abilities and much affecting his person and behaviour took him to be his chief secretary supposing and intending it to be an introduction to some more weighty employment in the state for which his lordship did often protest he thought him very fit nor did his lordship in this time of master dunn's attendance upon him account him to be so much his servant as to forget he was his friend and to testify it did always use him with much courtesy appointing him a place at his own table to which he esteemed his company and discourse to be a great ornament he continued that employment for the space of five years being daily useful and not mercenary to his friend during which time he i dare not say unhappily fell into such a liking as with her approbation increased into a love with a young gentlewoman that lived in that family who was niece to the lady ellesmere and daughter to sir george moore then chancellor of the garter and lieutenant of the tower sir george had some intimation of it and knowing prevention to be a great part of wisdom did therefore remove her with much haste from that to his own house at Lothley, in the county of surrey but too late by reason of some faithful promises which were so interchangeably passed as never to be violated by either party these promises were only known to themselves and the friends of both parties used much diligence 
and many arguments to kill or cool their affections to each other but in vain for love is a flattering mischief that hath denied aged and wise men a foresight of those evils that too often prove to be the children of that blind father a passion that carries us to commit errors with as much ease as whirlwinds move feathers and begets in us an unwearied industry to the attainment of what we desire and such an industry did notwithstanding much watchfulness against it bring them secretly together i forbear to tell the manner how and at last to a marriage too without the allowance of those friends whose approbation always was and ever will be necessary to make even a virtuous love become lawful and that the knowledge of their marriage might not fall like an unexpected tempest on those that were unwilling to have it so and that pre-apprehensions might make it the less enormous when it was known it was purposely whispered into the ear of many that it was so yet by none that could affirm it but to put a period to the jealousies of sir george doubt often begetting more restless thoughts than the certain knowledge of what we fear the news was in favour to mr dunn and with his allowance made known to sir george by his honourable friend and neighbour henry earl of northumberland but it was to sir george so immeasurably unwelcome and so transported him that as though his passion of anger and inconsideration might exceed theirs of love and error he presently engaged his sister the lady ellesmere to join with him to procure her lord to discharge mr dunn of the place he held under his lordship this request was followed with violence and though sir george were remembered that errors might be overpunished and desired therefore to forbear till second consideration might clear some scruples yet he became restless until his suit was granted and the punishment executed and though the lord chancellor did not at mr dunn's dismission give him such a commendation as the great emperor charles v did of his secretary erasso when he parted with him to his son and successor philip the second saying that in his erasso he gave to him a greater gift than all his estate and all the kingdoms which he then resigned to him yet the lord chancellor said he parted with a friend and such a secretary as was fitter to serve a king than a subject immediately after his dismission from his service he sent a sad letter to his wife to acquaint her with it and after the subscription of his name writ john dunn and dunn undone and god knows it proved too true for this bitter physic of mr dunn's dismission was not enough to purge out all sir george's choler for he was not satisfied till mr dunn and his sometimes calm pupil in cambridge that married him namely samuel brooke who was after doctor in divinity and master of trinity college and his brother mr christopher brooke sometime mr dunn's chamber fellow at lincoln's inn who gave mr dunn his wife and witnessed the marriage were all committed to three several prisons mr dunn was first enlarged who neither gave rest to his body or brain nor to any friend in whom he might hope to have an interest until he had procured an enlargement for his two imprisoned friends he was now at liberty but his days were still cloudy and being past these troubles others did still multiply upon him for his wife was to her extreme sorrow detained from him and though with jacob he endured not a hard service for her yet he lost a good one and was forced to make good his title and to get possession of her by a long and restless suit in law which proved troublesome and sadly chargeable to him whose youth and travel and needless bounty had brought his estate into a narrow compass it is observed and most truly 
that silence and submission are charming qualities, and work most upon passionate men. And it proved so with Sir George. For these and a general report of Mr. Dunn's merits, together with his winning behavior, which, when it would entice, had a strange kind of elegant, irresistible art, these, and time, had so dispassionated Sir George, that as the world had approved his daughter's choice, so he also could not but see a more than ordinary merit in his new son, and this at last melted him into so much remorse, for love and anger are so like agues as to have hot and cold fits, and love in parents, though it may be quenched, yet it is easily rekindled, and expires not till death denies mankind a natural heat, that he labored his son's restoration to his place, using to that end both his own and his sister's powers to her lord, but with no success, for his answer was, that though he was unfeignedly sorry for what he had done, yet it was inconsistent with his place and credit to discharge and readmit servants at the request of passionate petitioners. Sir George's endeavour for Mr. Dunn's readmission was by all means to be kept secret, for men do more naturally reluct for errors than submit to put on those blemishes that attend their visible acknowledgment. But, however, it was not long before Sir George appeared to be so far reconciled as to wish their happiness, and not to deny them his paternal blessing, but yet refused to contribute any means that might conduce to their livelihood. Mr. Dunn's estate was the greatest part spent in many and chargeable travels, books, and dear-bought experiences. He, out of all employment that might yield a support for himself and wife, who had been curiously and plentifully educated, both their natures generous and accustomed to confer and not to receive courtesies, these and other considerations, but chiefly that his wife was to bear a part in his sufferings, surrounded him with many sad thoughts and some apparent apprehensions of want. But his sorrows were lessened and his wants prevented by the seasonable courtesy of their noble kinsman Sir Francis Wally, of Pyrford in Surrey, who entreated them to a cohabitation with him, where they remained with much freedom to themselves, and equal content to him, for some years, and as their charge increased, she had yearly a child, so did his love and bounty. It hath been observed by wise and considering men that wealth hath seldom been the portion and never the mark to discover good people, but that Almighty God, who disposeth all things wisely, hath of his abundant goodness denied it, he only knows why, to many whose minds he hath enriched with the greater blessings of knowledge and virtue, as the fairer testimonies of his love to mankind. And this was the present condition of this man of so excellent erudition and endowments, whose necessary and daily expenses were hardly reconcilable with his uncertain and narrow estate, which I mentioned, for that at this time there was a most generous offer made him for the moderating of his worldly cares, the declaration of which shall be the next employment of my pen. God hath been so good to his church as to afford it, in every age, some such men to serve at his altar as have been piously ambitious of doing good to mankind, a disposition that is so like to God himself that it owes itself only to him who takes a pleasure to behold it in his creatures. These times, 1648, he did bless with many such, some of which still live to be patterns of apostolical charity and of more than human patience. I have said this because I have occasion to mention one of them in my following discourse, namely Dr. Morton, the most laborious and learned bishop of Durham. 
one that God hath blessed with perfect intellectuals and a cheerful heart at the age of ninety-four years, and is yet living, one that in his days of plenty had so large a heart as to use his large revenue to the encouragement of learning and virtue, and is now, be it spoken with sorrow, reduced to a narrow estate, which he embraces without repining and still shows the beauty of his mind by so liberal a hand as if this were an age in which to-morrow were to care for itself i have taken a pleasure in giving the reader a short but true character of this good man my friend from whom i received the following relation he sent to mr dunn and entreated to borrow an hour of his time for a conference the next day after their meeting there was not many minutes passed before he spake to Mr. Dunn to this purpose. Mr. Dunn, the occasion of sending for you is to propose to you what I have often revolved in my own thought since I last saw you, which, nevertheless, I will not declare but upon this condition, that you shall not return me a present answer but forbear three days and bestow some part of that time in fasting and prayer and after a serious consideration of what i shall propose then return to me with your answer deny me not mr dunn for it is the effect of a true love which i would gladly pay as a debt due for yours to me this request being granted the doctor expressed himself thus Mr. Dunn, I know your education and abilities, I know your expectation of a state employment, and I know your fitness for it, and I know, too, the many delays and contingencies that attend court promises. And let me tell you that my love, begot by our long friendship and your merits, hath prompted me to such an inquisition after your present temporal estate as makes me no stranger to your necessities, which I know to be such as your generous spirit could not bear if it were not supported with a pious patience. You know I have formerly persuaded you to waive your court hopes and enter into holy orders, which I now again persuade you to embrace, with this reason added to my former request. The king hath yesterday made me dean of Gloucester, and I am also possessed of a benefice, the profits of which are equal to those of my deanery. I will think my deanery enough for my maintenance, who am, and resolve to die, a single man, and will quit my benefice, and estate you in it, which the patron is willing I shall do, if God shall incline your heart to embrace this motion. Remember, Mr. Dunn, no man's education or parts make him too good for this employment which is to be an ambassador for the god of glory that god who by a vile death opened the gates of life to mankind make me no present answer but remember your promise and return to me the third day with your resolution at the hearing of this mr dunn's faint breath and perplexed countenance gave a visible testimony of an inward conflict. But he performed his promise, and departed without returning an answer till the third day. And then his answer was to this effect. My most worthy and most dear friend, since I saw you I have been faithful to my promise, and have also meditated much of your great kindness, which hath been such as would exceed even my gratitude. But that it cannot do, and more I cannot return you, and I do that with a heart full of humility and thanks, though I may not accept of your offer. But, sir, my refusal is not for that I think myself too good for that calling, for which kings, if they think so, are not good enough nor for that my education and learning though not eminent may not being assisted with god's grace and humility render me in some measure fit for it 
but I dare make so dear a friend as you are my confessor. Some irregularities of my life have been so visible to some men, that though I have, I thank God, made my peace with him by penitential resolutions against them, and by the assistance of his grace, banished them my affections, yet this, which God knows to be so, is not so visible to man as to free me from their censures, and it may be that sacred calling from a dishonour. And besides, whereas it is determined by the best of casuists that God's glory should be the first end and a maintenance the second motive to embrace that calling, and though each man may propose to himself both together, yet the first may not be put last without a violation of conscience, which he that searches the heart will judge. And truly my present condition is such that if I ask my own conscience whether it be reconcilable to that rule, it is at this time so perplexed about it that I can neither give myself nor you an answer. You know, sir, who says, Happy is that man whose conscience doth not accuse him for that thing which he does. To these I might add other reasons that dissuade me, but I crave your favour that I may forbear to express them and thankfully decline your offer. This was his present resolution, but the heart of man is not in his own keeping, and he was destined to this sacred service by a higher hand, a hand so powerful as at last forced him to a compliance, of which I shall give the reader an account before I shall give a rest to my pen. Mr. Dunn and his wife continued with Sir Francis Wally till his death, a little before which time Sir Francis was so happy as to make a perfect reconciliation betwixt Sir George and his forsaken son and daughter, Sir George conditioning by bond to pay to Mr. Dunn eight hundred pounds at a certain date as a portion with his wife or twenty pounds quarterly for their maintenance, as the interest for it, till the said portion was paid. Most of those years that he lived with Sir Francis, he studied the civil and canon law, in which he acquired such a perfection as was judged to hold proportion with many who had made that study the employment of their whole life. Sir Francis being dead, and that happy family dissolved, Mr. Dunn took for himself a house in Mitcham, near to Croydon, in Surrey, a place noted for good air and choice company. There his wife and children remained, and for himself he took lodgings in London, near to Whitehall, whither his friends and occasions drew him very often, and where he was as often visited by many of the nobility and others of this nation, who used him in their counsels of greatest consideration, and with some rewards for his better subsistence. Nor did our own nobility only value and favour him, but his acquaintance and friendship was sought for by most ambassadors of foreign nations, and by many other strangers, whose learning or business occasioned their stay in this nation. He was much importuned by many friends to make his constant residence in London, but he still denied it, having settled his dear wife and children at Mitcham, and near some friends that were bountiful to them and him, for they, God knows, needed it, and that you may the better now judge of the then present condition of his mind and fortune, I shall present you with an extract collected out of some few of his many letters. And the reason why I did not send an answer to your last week's letter was because it then found me under too great a sadness, and at present tis thus with me. There is not one person but myself well of my family. I have already lost half a child, and with that mischance of hers my wife has fallen into such a discomposure as would afflict her too extremely, but that the sickness of all her other children stupefies her, of one of which, in good faith, I have not much hope. 
and these meet with a fortune so ill provided for physic and such relief that if God should ease us with burials, I know not how to perform even that. But I flatter myself with this hope, that I am dying too, for I cannot waste faster than by such griefs. As for, from my hospital at Mitcham, John Dunn, August 10. Thus he did bemoan himself, and thus in other letters, for we hardly discover a sin when it is but an omission of some good and no accusing act with this or the former i have often suspected myself to be overtaken which is with an over-earnest desire of the next life and though i know it is not merely a weariness of this because i had the same desire when i went with the tide and enjoyed fairer hopes than i do now yet i doubt worldly troubles have increased it tis now spring and all the pleasures of it displease me every other tree blossoms and i wither i grow older and not better my strength diminisheth and my load grows heavier and yet i would fain be or do something but that i cannot tell what is no wonder in this time of my sadness for to choose is to do but to be no part of any body is as to be nothing and so i am and shall so judge myself unless i could be so incorporated into a part of the world as by business to contribute some sustenation to the whole this i made account i began early when i understood the study of our laws but was diverted by leaving that and embracing the worst voluptuousness a hydroptic immoderate desire of human learning and languages beautiful ornaments indeed to men of great fortunes but mine was grown so low as to need an occupation which i thought i entered well into when i subjected myself to such a service as i thought might exercise my poor abilities and there i stumbled and fell too and now i am become so little or such a nothing that i am not a subject good enough for one of my own letters sir i i fear my present discontent does not proceed from a good root that i am so well content to be nothing that is dead but sir though my fortune hath made me such as that i am rather a sickness or a disease of the world than any part of it and therefore neither love it nor life yet i would gladly live to become some such thing as you should not repent loving me sir your own soul cannot be more zealous for your good than i am and god who loves that zeal in me will not suffer you to doubt it you would pity me now if you saw me right for my pain hath drawn my head so much awry and holds it so that my eye cannot follow my pen i therefore receive you into my prayers with mine own weary soul and commend myself to yours i doubt not but next week will bring you good news for i have either mending or dying on my side but if i do continue longer thus i shall have comfort in this that my blessed saviour in exercising his justice upon my two worldly parts my fortune and my body reserve all his mercy for that which most needs it my soul which is i doubt too like a porter that is very often near the gate and yet goes not out sir i profess to you truly that my loathness to give over writing now seems to myself a sign that i shall write no more your poor friend and god's poor patient john dunn september seven by this you have seen a part of the picture of his narrow fortune and the perplexities of his generous mind and thus it continued with him for about two years all which time his family remained constantly at mitcham and to which place he often retired himself 
and destined some days to a constant study of some points of controversy betwixt the English and Roman Church, and especially those of supremacy and allegiance. And to that place and such studies he could willingly have wedded himself during his life, but the earnest persuasion of friends became at last to be so powerful as to cause the removal of himself and family to london where sir robert drury a gentleman of a very noble estate and a more liberal mind assigned him and his wife a useful apartment in his own large house in drury lane and not only rent free but was also a cherisher of his studies and such a friend as sympathized with him and his in all their joy and sorrows. At this time of Mr. Dunn's and his wife living in Sir Robert's house, the Lord Hay was, by King James, sent upon a glorious embassy to the then French king, Henry the Fourth, and Sir Robert put on a sudden resolution to accompany him to the French court and to be present at his audience there. And Sir Robert put on a sudden resolution to solicit Mr. Dunn to be his companion in that journey. And this desire was suddenly made known to his wife, who was then with child, and otherwise under so dangerous a habit of body as to her health that she professed an unwillingness to allow him any absence from her, saying, her divining soul boded her some ill in his absence, and therefore desired him not to leave her. This made Mr. Dunn lay aside all thoughts of the journey, and really to resolve against it. But Sir Robert became restless in his persuasions for it, and Mr. Dunn was so generous as to think he had sold his liberty when he received so many charitable kindnesses from him, and told his wife so, who did therefore with an unwilling willingness give a faint consent to the journey which was proposed to be but for two months, for about that time they determined their return. Within a few days after this resolve, the ambassador, Sir Robert, and Mr. Dunn left London, and were the twelfth day got all safe to Paris. Two days after their arrival there, Mr. Dunn was left alone in that room in which Sir Robert and he and some other friends had dined together. To this place Sir Robert returned within half an hour, and as he left so he found Mr. Dunn alone, but in such an ecstasy and so altered as to his looks as amazed Sir Robert to behold him insomuch that he earnestly desired Mr. Dunn to declare what had befallen him in the short time of his absence, to which Mr. Dunn was not able to make a present answer. But after a long and perplexed pause, did at last say, I have seen a dreadful vision since I saw you. I have seen my dear wife pass twice by me through this room with her hair hanging about her shoulders, and a dead child in her arms. This I have seen since I saw you. To which Sir Robert replied, Sure, sir, you have slept since I saw you, and this is the result of some melancholy dream which I desire you to forget, for you are now awake. To which Mr. Dunn's reply was, I cannot be sure that I now live than that I have not slept since I saw you, and am as sure that at her second appearing she stopped and looked at me in the face and vanished. Rest and sleep had not altered Mr. Dunn's opinion the next day, for he then affirmed this vision with a more deliberate and so confirmed a confidence that he inclined Sir Robert to a faint belief that the vision was true. It is truly said that desire and doubt have no rest, and it proved so with Sir Robert, for he immediately sent a servant to Drury House, with a charge to hasten back and bring him word whether Mrs. Dunn was alive, and if alive, in what condition she was as to her health. 
The twelfth day the messenger returned with this account: that he found and left Mrs. Donne very sad and sick in her bed, and that, after a long and dangerous labour, she had been delivered of a dead child; and upon examination the abortion proved to be the same day and about the very hour that Mr. Donne affirmed he saw her pass by him in his chamber. This is a relation that will beget some wonder, and it may well, for most of our world are at present possessed with an opinion that visions and miracles are ceased. And though it is most certain that two lutes, being both strung and tuned to an equal pitch, and then one played upon, the other that is not touched being laid upon a table at a fit distance, will, like an echo to a trumpet, warble a faint audible harmony in answer to the same tune, yet many will not believe there is any such thing as a sympathy of souls, and I am well pleased that every reader do enjoy his own opinion. But if the unbelieving will not allow the believing reader of this story a liberty to believe that it may be true, then I wish him to consider many wise men have believed that the ghost of Julius Caesar did appear to Brutus, and that both St. Austin and Monica, his mother, had visions in order to his conversion. And though these and many others, too many to name, have but the authority of human story, yet the incredible reader may find in the sacred story, First Samuel, twenty-eight, fourteen, that Samuel did appear to Saul even after his death, whether really or not I undertake not to determine. And Bildad, in the book of Job, says these words, four, thirteen through sixteen, A spirit passed before my face, the hair of my head stood up, fear and trembling came upon me, and made all my bones to shake. Upon which words I will make no comment, but leave them to be considered by the incredulous reader, to whom I will also commend this following consideration, that there be many pious and learned men that believe our merciful God hath assigned to every man a particular guardian angel to be his constant monitor and to attend him in all his dangers, both of body and soul. And the opinion that every man hath his particular angel may gain some authority by the relation of St. Peter's miraculous deliverance out of prison, Acts chapter 12, 7 through 10, and 13 and 15, not by many, but by one angel. And this belief may yet gain more credit by the readers considering that when Peter, after his enlargement, knocked at the door of Mary, the mother of John, and Rhoda, the maidservant, being surprised with joy that Peter was there, did not let him in, but ran in haste and told the disciples, who were then and there met together, that Peter was at the door, and they, not believing it, said she was mad, yet when she again affirmed it, though they then believed it not, yet they concluded and said, It is his angel. End of chapter 1, part 1Chapter 1 of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Dunn, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 John Dunn, Part 2. More observations of this nature and inferences from them might be made to gain the relation of firmer belief. But I forbear, lest I, that intended to be but a relator, may be thought to be an engaged person for the proving what was related to me. And yet I think myself bound to declare that, though it was not told me by Mr. Dunn himself, it was told me, 
now long since, by a person of honour, and of such intimacy with him, that he knew more of the secrets of his soul than any person then living. And I think he told me the truth, for it was told with such circumstances and such asseveration that, to say nothing of my own thoughts, I verily believe he that told it me did himself believe it to be true. I forbear the reader's further trouble as to the relation and what concerns it, and will conclude mine with commending to his view a copy of verses given by Mr. Dunn to his wife at the time he then parted from her. And I beg leave to tell that I have heard some critics, learned both in languages and poetry, say that none of the Greek or Latin poets did ever equal them. A Valediction Forbidding to Mourn As virtuous men pass mildly away, and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, The breath goes now, and some say no. So let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. Twere profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears, men reckon what it did or meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. Dull, sublunary lovers love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit absence, because that doth remove those things which elemented it. But we, by a love so far refined, that ourselves know not what it is, enter assured of the mind, care not hands, eyes, or lips to miss. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion like gold to airy thinness beat. I, we be two, we are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but does if the other do. And though thine in the centre sit, yet when my other far does roam, thine leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as mine comes home. Such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just, and me to end where I begun. I return from my account of the vision to tell the reader that both before Mr. Dunn's going into France, at his being there, and after his return, many of the nobility and others that were powerful at court were watchful and solicitous to the king for some secular employment for him. The king had formerly both known and put a value upon his company, and had also given him some hopes of a state employment, being always much pleased when Mr. Dunn attended him, especially at his meals, where there were usually many deep discourses of general learning, and very often friendly disputes or debates of religion betwixt his majesty and those divines whose places required their attendance on him at those times, particularly the dean of the chapel, who then was Bishop Montague, the publisher of the learned and eloquent works of his majesty, and the most reverend Dr. Andrews, the late learned Bishop of Winchester, who was then the king's almoner. About this time there grew many disputes that concerned the oath of supremacy and allegiance, in which the king had appeared and engaged himself by his public writings now extant, and his majesty discoursing with Mr. Dunn concerning many of the reasons which are usually urged against the taking of these oaths, apprehended such a validity and clearness in his stating the questions and his answers to them, that his majesty commanded him to bestow some time in drawing the arguments into a method, and then to write his answers to them. And having done that, 
not to send, but be his own messenger and bring them to him. To this he presently and diligently applied himself, and within six weeks brought them to him under his own handwriting, as they be now printed, the book bearing the name of Pseudo-Martyr, printed anno 1610. When the king had read and considered that book, he persuaded Mr. Dunn to enter into the ministry, to which at that time he was, and appeared, very unwilling, apprehending it, such was his mistaken modesty, to be too weighty for his abilities. And though his majesty had promised him a favor, and many persons of worth mediated with his majesty for some secular employment for him, to which his education had apted him, and particularly the Earl of Somerset, when in his greatest height of favor, who being then at Theobald's with the king, where one of the clerks of the council died that night, the earl posted a messenger for Mr. Dunn to come to him immediately, and at Mr. Dunn's coming said, Mr. Dunn, to testify the reality of my affection and my purpose to prefer you, stay in this garden till I go up to the king, and bring you word that you are clerk of the council. Doubt not my doing this, for I know the king loves you, and know the king will not deny me. But the king gave a positive denial to all requests, and having a discerning spirit, replied, I know Mr. Dunn is a learned man, has the abilities of a learned divine, and will prove a powerful preacher, and my desire is to prefer him that way, and in that way I will deny you nothing for him. After that time, as he professeth in his book of devotions, the king descended to a persuasion, almost to a solicitation of him, to enter into sacred orders, which, though he then denied not, yet he deferred it for almost three years, all which time he applied himself to an incessant study of textual divinity, and to the attainment of a greater perfection in the learned languages Greek and Hebrew. In the first and most blessed times of Christianity, when the clergy were looked upon with reverence and deserved it, when they overcame their opposers by high examples of virtue, by a blessed patience and long-suffering, those only were then judged worthy the ministry whose quiet and meek spirits did make them look upon that sacred calling with a humble adoration and fear to undertake it, which indeed requires such great degrees of humility and labor and care that none but such were then thought worthy of that celestial dignity. And such only were then sought out and solicited to undertake it. This I have mentioned, because forwardness and inconsideration could not in Mr. Dunn, as in many others, be an argument of insufficiency or unfitness, for he had considered long, and had many strifes within himself concerning the strictness of life, and competency of learning required in such as enter into sacred orders and doubtless considering his own demerits, did humbly ask God with St. Paul, Lord, who is sufficient for these things? And with meek Moses, Lord, who am I? And sure, if he had consulted with flesh and blood, he had not for these reasons put his hand to that holy plough. But God, who is able to prevail, wrestled with him as the angel did with Jacob, and marked him, marked him for his own, marked him with a blessing, a blessing of obedience to the motions of his blessed spirit. And then, as he had formerly asked God with Moses, Who am I? So now, being inspired with an apprehension of God's particular mercy to him, in the king's and others' thankful solicitations of him, he came to ask King David's question, 
Lord, who am I that thou art so mindful of me? So mindful of me as to lead me for more than forty years through this wilderness of the many temptations and various turnings of a dangerous life so merciful to me as to move the learned dest of kings to descend to move me to serve at the altar so merciful to me as at last to move my heart to embrace this holy motion thy motion i will and do embrace and i now say with the blessed virgin be it with thy servant as seemeth best in thy sight and so blessed jesus I do take the cup of salvation, and will call upon thy name, and will preach thy gospel. Such strifes as these St. Austin had, when St. Ambrose endeavoured his conversion to Christianity, with which he confesseth he acquainted his friend Alypius. Our learned author, a man fit to write after no mean copy, did the like and declaring his intention to his dear friend, Dr. King, then Bishop of London, a man famous in his generation and no stranger to Mr. Dunn's abilities, for he had been chaplain to the Lord Chancellor at the time of Mr. Dunn's being his lordship's secretary, that reverend man did receive the news with much gladness, and after some expressions of joy and a persuasion to be constant in his pious purpose, he proceeded with all convenient speed to ordain him first deacon and then priest not long after. Now the English church had gained a second St. Austin, for I think none was so like him before his conversion none so like St. Ambrose after it. And if his youth had the infirmities of the one, his age had the excellences of the other, the learning and holiness of both. And now all his studies, which had been occasionally diffused, were all concentred in divinity. Now he had a new calling, new thoughts, and a new employment for his wit and eloquence. Now all his earthly affections were changed into divine love, and all the faculties of his own soul were engaged in the conversion of others, in preaching the glad tidings of remission to repenting sinners, and peace to each troubled soul. To these he applied himself with all care and diligence, and now such a change was wrought in him that he could say with David, Oh, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord God of hosts! Now he declared openly that when he required a temporal, God gave him a spiritual blessing, and that he was now gladder to be a doorkeeper in the house of God than he could be to enjoy the noblest of all temporal employments. Presently, after he entered into his holy profession, the king sent for him, and made him his chaplain in ordinary, and promised to take a particular care for his preferment. And though his long familiarity with scholars and persons of greatest quality was such as might have given some men boldness enough to have preached to any eminent auditory, yet his modesty in this employment was such that he could not be persuaded to it, but went usually accompanied with some one friend, to preach privately in some village not far from London, his first sermon being preached at Paddington. This he did till His Majesty sent and appointed him a day to preach to him at Whitehall. And though much were expected from him, both by His Majesty and others, yet he was so happy, which few are, as to satisfy and exceed their expectations, preaching the word so as showed his own heart was possessed with those very thoughts and joys that he labored to distil into others. A preacher in earnest, weeping sometimes for his auditory, sometimes with them, always preaching to himself like an angel from a cloud, but in none. 
carrying some, as St. Paul was, to heaven in holy raptures, and enticing others by a sacred art and courtship to amend their lives, here picturing a vice so as to make it ugly to those that practised it, and a virtue so as to make it beloved, even by those that loved it not, and all this with a most particular grace and an unexpressible addition of comeliness. There may be some that may incline to think, such indeed as have not heard him, that my affection to my friend hath transported me to an immoderate commendation of his preaching. If this meets with any such, let me entreat, though I will omit many, yet that they will receive a double witness for what I say, it being attested by a gentleman of worth, Mr. Chidley, a frequent hearer of his sermons, in part of a funeral elegy writ by him on Mr. Dunn, and is a known truth, though it be in verse. Each altar had his fire. He kept his love, but not his object. Wit he did not banish, but transplanted it, taught it both time and place, and brought it home to piety, which it doth best become. For say, had ever pleasure such a dress? Have you seen crimes so shaped, or loveliness such as his lips did clothe religion in? Had not reproof a beauty passing sin? Corrupted nature sorrowed that she stood so near the danger of becoming good. And when he preached, she wished her ears exempt from piety that had such power to tempt. How did his sacred flattery beguile men to amend? More of this and more witnesses might be brought, but I forbear and return. That summer, in the very same month in which he entered into sacred orders, and was made the king's chaplain, his majesty, then going his progress, was entreated to receive an entertainment in the University of Cambridge, and Mr. Dunn attending his majesty at that time, his majesty was pleased to recommend him to the university to be made doctor in divinity. Dr. Harsnett, after Archbishop of York, was then vice-chancellor, who, knowing him to be the author of that learned book, The Pseudo-Martyr, required no other proof of his abilities, but proposed it to the university, who presently assented, and expressed a gladness that they had such an occasion to entitle him to be theirs. His abilities and industry in his profession were so eminent, and he so known and so beloved by persons of quality, that within the first year of his entering into sacred orders he had fourteen advowsons of several benefices presented to him. But they were in the country, and he could not leave his beloved London, to which place he had a natural inclination, having received both his birth and education in it, and there contracted a friendship with many, whose conversation multiplied the joys of his life. But an employment that might affix him to that place would be welcome, for he needed it. Immediately after his return from Cambridge, his wife died, leaving him a man of a narrow, unsettled estate, and, having buried five, the careful father of seven children then living, to whom he gave a voluntary assurance never to bring them under the subjection of a stepmother, which promise he kept most faithfully, burying with his tears all his earthly joys in his most dear and deserving wife's grave, and betook himself to a most retired and solitary life. In this retiredness, which was often from the sight of his dearest friends, he became crucified to the world, and all those vanities, those imaginary pleasures that are daily acted on that restless stage, and they were as perfectly crucified to him. Nor is it hard to think, being 
passions may be both charged and heightened by accidents but that that abundant affection which once was betwixt him and her who had long been the delight of his eyes and the companion of his youth her with whom he had divided so many pleasant sorrows and contented fears as common folk are not capable of not hard to think but that she being now removed by death a commensurable grief took as full a possession of him as joy had done and so indeed it did for now his very soul was elemented of nothing but sadness now grief took so full a possession of his heart as to leave no place for joy if it did it was a joy to be alone where like a pelican in the wilderness he might bemoan himself without witness or restraint and pour forth his passions like job in the days of his affliction oh that i might have the desire of my heart oh that god would grant the thing that i long for for then as the grave is become her house so i would hasten to make it mine also that we two might there make our beds together in the dark thus as the israelites sat mourning by the rivers of babylon when they remembered zion so he gave some ease to his oppressed heart by thus venting his sorrows thus he began the day and ended the night ended the restless night and began the weary day in lamentations and thus he continued till a consideration of his new engagements to god and st paul's woe is me if i preach not the gospel dispersed those sad clouds that had then benighted his hopes and now forced him to behold the light his first motion from his house was to preach where his beloved wife lay buried in st clement's church near temple bar london and his text was a part of the prophet jeremy's lamentation lo i am the man that have seen affliction and indeed his very words and looks testified him to be truly such a man and they with the addition of his sighs and tears expressed in his sermon did so work upon the affections of his hearers as melted and moulded them into a companionable sadness and so they left the congregation but then their houses presented them with objects of diversion and his presented him with nothing but fresh objects of sorrow in beholding many helpless children a narrow fortune and a consideration of the many cares and casualties that attend their education in this time of sadness he was importuned by the grave benchers of lincoln's inn who were once the companions and friends of his youth to accept of their lecture which by reason of dr gadiker's removal from thence was then void of which he accepted being most glad to renew his intermitted friendship with those whom he so much loved and where he had been a saul though not to persecute christianity or to deride it yet in his irregular youth to neglect the visible practices of it there to become a paul and preach salvation to his beloved brethren and now his life was a shining light among his old friends now he gave an ocular testimony of the strictness and regularity of it now he might say as st paul adviseth his corinthians be ye followers of me as i follow christ and walk as ye have me for an example not the example of a busybody but of a contemplative a harmless a humble and a holy life and conversation the love of that noble society was expressed to him many ways for besides fair lodgings that were set apart and newly furnished for him with all necessaries other courtesies were also daily added indeed so many and so freely as if they meant their gratitude should exceed his merits 
and in this love strife of desert and liberality they continued for the space of two years he preaching faithfully and constantly to them and they liberally requiting him about which time the emperor of germany died and the palgrave who had lately married the lady elizabeth the king's only daughter was elected and crowned king of bohemia the unhappy beginning of many miseries in that nation king james whose motto beate pacifici did truly speak the very thoughts of his heart endeavoured first to prevent and after to compose the discords of that discomposed state and amongst other his endeavours did then send the lord hay earl of doncaster his ambassador to those unsettled princes and by a special command from his majesty dr dunn was appointed to assist and attend that employment to the princes of the union for which the earl was most glad who had always put a great value on him and taken a great pleasure in his conversation and discourse and his friends at lincoln's inn were as glad for they feared that his immoderate study and sadness for his wife's death would as jacob said make his days few and respecting his bodily health evil too and of this there were many visible signs at his going he left his friends of lincoln's inn and they him with many reluctations for though he could not say as st paul to his ephesians behold you to whom i have preached the kingdom of god shall from henceforth see my face no more yet he believing himself to be in a consumption questioned and they feared it all concluding that his troubled mind with the help of his unintermitted studies hastened the decays of his weak body but god who is the god of all wisdom and goodness turned it to the best for this employment to say nothing of the event of it did not only divert him from those too serious studies and sad thoughts but seemed to give him a new life by a true occasion of joy to be an eye-witness of the health of his most dear and most honoured mistress the queen of bohemia in a foreign nation and to be a witness of that gladness which she expressed to see him who having formerly known him a courtier was much joyed to see him in a canonical habit and more glad to be an ear-witness of his excellent and powerful preaching about fourteen months after his departure out of england he returned to his friends of lincoln's inn with his sorrows moderated and his health improved and there betook himself to his constant course of preaching about a year after his return out of germany dr carey was made bishop of exeter and by his removal the deanery of st paul's being vacant the king sent to dr dunn and appointed him to attend him at dinner the next day when his majesty was sat down before he had eat any meat he said after his pleasant manner dr dunn i have invited you to dinner and though you sit not down with me yet i will carve to you of a dish that i know you love well for knowing you love london i do therefore make you dean of st paul's and when i have dined then do you take your beloved dish home to your study say grace there to yourself and much good may it do you immediately after he came to his deanery he employed workmen to repair and to beautify the chapel suffering as holy david once vowed his eyes and temples to take no rest till he had first beautified the house of god the next quarter following when his father-in-law sir george moore whom time had made a lover and admirer of him came to pay to him the conditioned sum of twenty pounds he refused to receive it and said as good jacob did 
when he heard his beloved son Joseph was alive, it is enough. You have been kind to me and mine. I know your present condition is such as not to abound, and I hope mine is, or will be such as not to need it. I will therefore receive no more from you upon that contract, and in testimony of it freely gave him up his bond. Immediately after his admission into his deanery, the vicarage of St. Dunstan in the West, London, fell to him by the death of Dr. White, the advowson of it having been given to him long before by his honourable friend Richard, Earl of Dorset, then the patron, and confirmed by his brother, the late deceased Edward, both of them men of much honour. By these and other ecclesiastical endowment which fell to him about the same time, given to him formerly by the Earl of Kent, he was enabled to become charitable to the poor and kind to his friends, and to make such provision for his children that they were not left scandalous as relating to their or his profession and quality. The next Parliament, which was within that present year, he was chosen prolocutor to the convocation, and about that time was appointed by his majesty, his most gracious master, to preach very many occasional sermons, as at St. Paul's Cross and other places all which employments he performed to the admiration of the representative body of the whole clergy of this nation. He was once, and but once, clouded with the king's displeasure, and it was about this time, which was occasioned by some malicious whisperer, who had told his majesty that Dr. Dunn had put on the general humour of the pulpits, and was become busy in insinuating a fear of the king's inclining to popery, and a dislike of his government, and particularly for the king's then turning the evening lectures into catechizing and expounding the prayer of our Lord, and of the belief and commandments. His majesty was the more inclinable to believe this, for that a person of nobility and great note, betwixt whom and Dr. Dunn there had been a great friendship, was at this very time discarded the court. I shall forbear his name, unless I had a fair occasion, and justly committed to prison, which begot many rumours in the common people, who in this nation think they are not wise, unless they be busy about what they understand not, and especially about religion. The king received this news with so much discontent and restlessness that he would not suffer the sun to set and leave him under this doubt, but sent for Dr. Dunn and required his answer to the accusation, which was so clear and satisfactory that the king said he was right glad he rested no longer under the suspicion. When the king had said this, Dr. Dunn kneeled down and thanked his majesty and protested his answer was faithful and free from all collusion, and therefore desired that he might not rise till, as in like cases, he always had from God, so he might have from his majesty some assurance that he stood clear and fair in his opinion. At which the king raised him from his knees with his own hands, and protested he believed him, and that he knew he was an honest man, and doubted not but that he loved him truly. And having thus dismissed him, he called some lords of his council into his chamber, and said with much earnestness, My doctor is an honest man, and my lords, I was never better satisfied with an answer than he hath now made me, and I always rejoice when I think that by my means he became a divine. He was made dean in the fiftieth year of his age, and in his fifty-fourth year a dangerous sickness seized him, which inclined him to a consumption. But God, as Job thankfully acknowledged, 
preserved his spirit, and kept his intellectuals as clear and perfect as when that sickness first seized his body, but it continued long, and threatened him with death, which he dreaded not. In this distemper of body, his dear friend, Dr. Henry King, then chief residentiary of that church, and late Bishop of Chichester, a man generally known by the clergy of this nation, and as generally noted for his obliging nature, visited him daily, and observing that his sickness rendered his recovery doubtful, he chose a seasonable time to speak to him to this purpose. Mr. Dean, I am, by your favor, no stranger to your temporal estate, and you are no stranger to the offer lately made us for the renewing a lease of the best Preben's corps belonging to our church, and you know twas denied, for that our tenant, being very rich, offered to fine at so low a rate as held not proportion with his advantages. But I will either raise him to an higher sum, or procure that the other residentiaries shall join to accept of what was offered. One of these I can and will, by your favor, do without delay, and without any trouble either to your body or mind. I beseech you to accept of my offer, for I know it will be a considerable addition to your present estate, which I know needs it. To this, after a short pause, and raising himself upon his bed, he made this reply. My most dear friend, I most humbly thank you for your many favors, and this in particular. But in my present condition I shall not accept of your proposal, for doubtless there is such a sin as sacrilege. If there were not, it could not have a name in Scripture and the primitive clergy were watchful against all appearances of that evil, and indeed then all Christians looked upon it with horror and detestation, judging it to be even an open defiance of the power and providence of Almighty God, and a sad presage of a declining religion. But instead of such Christians, who had selected times set apart to fast and pray to God for a pious clergy, which they then did obey, our times abound with men that are busy and litigious about trifles and church ceremonies, and yet so far from scrupling sacrilege that they make not so much as a queer what it is. But I thank God I have, and dare not now upon my sick bed, when Almighty God hath made me useless to the service of the church, make any advantage out of it. But if he shall again restore me to such a degree of health as again to serve at his altar, I shall then gladly take the reward which the bountiful benefactors of this church have designed me, for God knows my children and relations will need it. In which number my mother whose credulity and charity has contracted a very plentiful to a very narrow estate, must not be forgotten. But, Dr. King, if I recover not, that little worldly estate that I shall leave behind me, that very little when divided into eight parts, must, if you deny me not so charitable a favor, fall into your hands as my most faithful friend and executor of whose care and justice I make no more doubt than of God's blessing on that which I have conscientiously collected for them. But it shall not be augmented on my sick-bed, and this I declare to be my unalterable resolution. The reply to this was only a promise to observe his request. Within a few days his distempers abated, and as his strength increased, so did his thankfulness to Almighty God, testified in his most excellent book of devotions, which he published at his recovery, in which the reader may see the most secret thoughts that then possessed his soul, paraphrased and made public, a book that may not unfitly be called 
a sacred picture of spiritual ecstasies, occasioned and applicable to the emergencies of that sickness, which book, being a composition of meditations, disquisitions, and prayers, he writ on his sick-bed, herein imitating the holy patriarchs, who were wont to build their altars in that place where they had received their blessing. This sickness brought him so near to the gates of death, and he saw the grave so ready to devour him, that he would often say his recovery was supernatural, but that God, that then restored his health, continued it to him till the fifty-ninth year of his life, and then in August 1630, being with his eldest daughter, Mrs. Harvey, at Avery Hatch in Essex, he there fell into a fever, which, with the help of his constant infirmity, vapours from the spleen, hastened him into so visible a consumption that his beholders might say, as St. Paul of himself, he dies daily. And he might say with Job, My welfare passeth away as a cloud, the days of my affliction have taken hold of me, and weary nights are appointed for me. Reader, this sickness continued long, not only weakening but wearying him so much that my desire is he may now take some rest and that therefore I speak of his death, thou wilt not think it an impertinent digression to look back with me upon some observations of his life, which, whilst a gentle slumber gives rest to his spirits, may, I hope, not unfitly exercise thy consideration. His marriage was the remarkable error of his life an error which, though he had a wit able and very apt to maintain paradoxes, yet he was very far from justifying it, and though his wife's competent years and other reasons might be justly urged to moderate severe censures, yet he would occasionally condemn himself for it, and doubtless it had been attended with a heavy repentance, if God had not blessed them with so mutual and cordial affections, as in the midst of their sufferings made their bread of sorrow taste more pleasantly than the banquets of dull and low-spirited people. The recreations of his youth were poetry, in which he was so happy as if nature and all her varieties had been made only to exercise his sharp wit and high fancy and in those pieces which were facetiously composed and carelessly scattered, most of them being written before the twentieth year of his age, it may appear by his choice metaphors that both nature and all the arts joined to assist him with their utmost skill. It is a truth that in his penitential years, viewing some of those pieces that had been loosely, God knows too loosely, scattered in his youth, he wished they had been abortive, or so short-lived that his own eyes had witnessed their funerals. But though he was no friend to them, he was not so fallen out with heavenly poetry as to forsake that. No, not in his declining age, witnessed then by many divine sonnets and other high, holy, and harmonious composures. Yea, even on his former sick-bed, he wrote this heavenly hymn, expressing the great joy that then possessed his soul in the assurance of God's favor to him when he composed it. A Hymn to God the Father Wilt thou forgive that sin where I begun, which was my sin, though it were done before? Wilt thou forgive that sin through which I run, and do run still, though still I do deplore? When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I have won others to sin, and made my sin their door? Wilt thou forgive that sin which I did shun a year or two, but wallowed in a score? When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. 
I have a sin of fear that when I ve spun my last thread I shall perish on the shore ; but swear by thyself that at my death thy sun shall shine as he shines now and heretofore ; and having done that, thou hast done I fear no more." I have the rather mentioned this hymn for that he caused it to be set to a most grave and solemn tune, and to be often sung to the organ by the choristers of St. Paul's Church in his own hearing, especially at the evening service, and at his return from his customary devotions in that place, did occasionally say to a friend, the words of this hymn have restored to me the same thoughts of joy that possessed my soul in my sickness when I composed it. And, oh, the power of church music, that harmony added to this hymn has raised the affections of my heart and quickened my graces of zeal and gratitude. And I observe that I always return from paying this public duty of prayer and praise to God with an unexpressible tranquillity of mind and a willingness to leave the world. After this manner did the disciples of our Saviour and the best of Christians in those ages of the church nearest to his time offer their praises to Almighty God. And the reader of St. Augustine's life may there find that towards his dissolution he wept abundantly that the enemies of Christianity had broke in upon them and profaned and ruined their sanctuaries, and because their public hymns and lauds were lost out of their churches. And after this manner have many devout souls lifted up their hands and offered acceptable sacrifices unto Almighty God, where Dr. Dunn offered his, and now lies buried. But now, 1656, O Lord, how is that place become desolate? Before I proceed further, I think fit to inform the reader that not long before his death he caused to be drawn a figure of the body of Christ extended upon an anchor, like those which painters draw when they would present us with the picture of Christ crucified on the cross his varying no otherwise than to affix him not to a cross but to an anchor, the emblem of hope. This he caused to be drawn in little, and then many of those figures thus drawn to be engraven very small in heliotropum stones and set in gold, and of these he sent to many of his dearest friends to be used as seals or rings and kept as memorials of him and his affection to them. His dear friends and benefactors, Sir Henry Gourdier and Sir Robert Drury, could not be of that number, nor could the Lady Maudlin Herbert, the mother of George Herbert, for they had put off mortality and taken possession of the grave before him. But Sir Henry Wotton and Dr. Hall, the then late deceased, Bishop of Norwich, were, and so were Dr. Duppa, Bishop of Salisbury, and Dr. Henry King, Bishop of Chichester, lately deceased, men in whom there was such a commixture of general learning, of natural eloquence, and Christian humility, that they deserve a commemoration by a pen equal to their own, which none have exceeded. And in this enumeration of his friends, though many must be omitted, yet that man of primitive piety, Mr. George Herbert, may not. I mean that George Herbert, who was the author of the Temple, or Sacred Poems and Ejaculations, a book in which by declaring his own spiritual conflicts he hath comforted and raised many a dejected and discomposed soul, and charmed them into sweet and quiet thoughts, a book by the frequent reading whereof, and the assistance of that spirit that seemed to inspire the author, the reader may attain habits of peace and piety 
and all the gifts of the Holy Ghost and heaven, and may, by still reading, still keep those sacred fires burning upon the altar of so pure a heart as shall free it from the anxieties of this world, and keep it fixed upon things that are above. Betwixt this George Herbert and Dr. Dunn there was a long and dear friendship, made up by such a sympathy of inclinations that they coveted and joyed to be in each other's company, and this happy friendship was still maintained by many sacred endearments, of which that which followeth may be some testimony. End of chapter 1, part 2「Isaac Walton's Lives of John Donne, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert」by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. John Donne. Part 3. To Mr. George Herbert. Sent him with one of my seals of the Anchor and Christ. A sheaf of snakes used heretofore to be my seal, which is the crest of our poor family. Qui prius asuetu serpentum falce tabellas, signare hec nostra symbola parva domus, ad situs domui domini. Adopted in God's family, and so my old coat lost, into new arms I go. The cross, my seal in baptism, spread below, does by that form into an anchor grow. Crosses grow anchors, bear as thou shouldst do thy cross, and that cross grows an anchor too. But he that makes our crosses anchors thus is Christ, who there is crucified for us. Yet with this I may my first serpents hold, God gives new blessings, and yet leaves the old. The serpent may as wise my pattern be, My poison as he feeds on dust, that's me, And as he rounds the earth to murder, Sure he is my death, but on the cross my cure. Crucify nature then, and then implore All grace from him, crucified there before when all is cross and that cross anchor grown this seals a catechism not a seal alone under that little seal great gifts i send both works and prayers pawns and fruits of a friend oh may that saint that rides on our great seal to you that bear his name large bounty deal john donne in sacrum ancorum piscatoris george herbert quod crux nequebat fixa clavice adite tenere christum solicit ne ascendere tulip christum although the cross could not here christ detain when nailed unto it but he ascends again yet not thy eloquence here keep him still but only whilst thou speakest this anchor will nor canst thou be content unless thou to this certain anchor add a seal and so the water and the earth both unto thee do owe the symbol of their certainty let the world reel we and all ours stand sure this holy cables from all storms secure. George Herbert I return to tell the reader that, besides these verses to his dear Mr. Herbert, and that hymn that I mentioned to be sung in the choir of St. Paul's Church, he did also shorten and beguile many sad hours 
by composing other sacred ditties, and he writ a hymn on his deathbed, which bears this title. A Hymn to God, My God, In My Sickness March 23, 1630 Since I am coming to that holy room, where with thy choir of saints for evermore I shall be made thy music, as I come, I tune my instrument here at the door, and what I must do then, think here before. Since my physicians by their loves are grown cosmographers, and I their map, who lie flat on this bed, so in his purple, wrapped, receive my lord, by these his thorns give me his other crown, and as to other souls I preached thy word, be this my text, my sermon to mine own, that he may rise, therefore the Lord throws down. If these fall under the censure of a soul, whose too much mixture with earth makes it unfit to judge of these high raptures and illuminations, let him know that many holy and devout men have thought the soul of Prudentius to be most refined, when, not many days before his death, he charged it to present his God each morning and evening with a new and spiritual song, justified by the example of King David and the good King Hezekiah, who, upon the renovation of his years, paid his thankful vows to Almighty God in a royal hymn which he concludes in these words, the Lord was ready to save, therefore I will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of my life in the temple of my God. The latter part of his life may be said to be a continued study, for as he usually preached once a week, if not oftener, so after his sermons he never gave his eyes rest till he had chosen out a new text, and that night cast his sermon into a form and his text into divisions, and the next day betook himself to consult the fathers, and so commit his meditations to his memory, which was excellent. But upon Saturdays he usually gave himself and his mind a rest from the weary burden of his week's meditations, and usually spent that day in visitation of friends, or some other diversions of his thoughts, and would say that he gave both his body and mind that refreshment that he might be enabled to do the work of the day following, not faintly, but with courage and cheerfulness. Nor was his age only so industrious, but in the most unsettled days of his youth his bed was not able to detain him beyond the hour of four in the morning and it was no common business that drew him out of his chamber till past ten, all which time was employed in study, though he took great liberty after it. And if this seem strange, it may gain a belief by the visible fruits of his labors, some of which remain as testimonies of what is here written, for he left the resultants of fourteen hundred authors, most of them abridged and analyzed with his own hand. He left also six score of his sermons, all written with his own hand, also an exact and laborious treatise concerning self-murder, called by Athanatos, wherein all the laws violated by that act are diligently surveyed and judiciously censored a treatise written in his younger days, which alone might declare him then not only perfect in the civil and canon law, but in many other such studies and arguments as enter not into the consideration of many that labor to be thought great clerks, and pretend to know all things. Nor were these only found in his study, but all businesses that pass of any public consequence, either in this or any of our neighbor nations, he abbreviated either in Latin or in the language of that nation, and kept them by him for useful memorials. 
so he did the copies of diverse letters and cases of conscience that had concerned his friends with his observations and solutions of them and diverse other businesses of importance all particularly and methodically digested by himself he did prepare to leave the world before life left him making his will when no faculty of his soul was damped or made defective by pain or sickness or he surprised by a sudden apprehension of death but it was made with mature deliberation expressing himself an impartial father by making his children's portions equal and a lover of his friends whom he remembered with legacies fitly and discreetly chosen and bequeathed i cannot forbear a nomination of some of them for methinks they be persons that seem to challenge a recordation in this place as namely to his brother-in-law sir thomas grimes he gave that striking clock which he had long worn in his pocket to his dear friend and executor dr king late bishop of chichester that model of gold of the synod of dort with which the states presented him at his last being at the hague and the two pictures of padre paolo and fulgencio men of his acquaintance when he travelled italy and of great note in that nation for their remarkable learning to his ancient friend dr brooke that married him master of trinity college in cambridge he gave the picture of the blessed virgin and joseph to dr winniff who succeeded him in the deanery he gave a picture called the skeleton to the succeeding dean who was not then known he gave many necessaries of worth and useful for his house and also several pictures and ornaments for the chapel with a desire that they might be registered and remain as a legacy to his successors to the earls of dorset and carlisle he gave several pictures and so he did to many other friends legacies given rather to express his affection than to make any addition to their estates but unto the poor he was full of charity and unto many others who by his constant and long-continued bounty might entitle themselves to be his alms-people for all these he made provision and so largely as having then six children living might to some appear more than proportionable to his estate i forbear to mention any more lest the reader may think i trespass upon his patience but i will beg his favour to present him with the beginning and end of his will in the name of the blessed and glorious trinity amen i john donne by the mercy of christ jesus and by the calling of the church of england priest being at this time in good health and perfect understanding praised be god therefore to hereby make my last will and testament in manner and form following first i give my gracious god an entire sacrifice of body and soul with my most humble thanks for that assurance which his blessed spirit imprints in me now of the salvation of the one and the resurrection of the other and for that constant and cheerful resolution which the same spirit hath established in me to live and die in the religion now professed in the church of england in expectation of that resurrection i desire my body may be buried in the most private manner that may be in that place of st paul's church london that the now residentiaries have at my request designed for that purpose and so forth and this is my last will and testament made in the fear of god whose mercy i humbly beg and constantly rely upon in jesus christ and in perfect love and charity with all the world whose pardon i ask from the lowest of my servants to the highest of my superiors written all with my own hand and my name subscribed to every page of which there are five in number sealed december thirteen sixteen thirty nor was this blessed sacrifice of charity 
expressed only at his death, but in his life also, by a cheerful and frequent visitation of any friend whose mind was dejected or his fortune necessitous. He was inquisitive after the wants of prisoners, and redeemed many from prison that lay for their fees or small debts. He was a continual giver to poor scholars, both of this and foreign nations. Besides what he gave with his own hand, he usually sent a servant or a discreet and trusty friend to distribute his charity to all the prisons in London, at all the festival times of the year, especially at the birth and resurrection of our Saviour. He gave a hundred pounds at one time to an old friend, whom he had known live plentifully, and by a too liberal heart and carelessness became decayed in his estate. And when the receiving of it was denied by the gentleman's saying, he wanted not, for the reader may note that as there be some spirits so generous as to labor to conceal and endure a sad poverty, rather than expose themselves to those blushes that attend the confession of it, so there be others to whom nature and grace have afforded such sweet and compassionate souls as to pity and prevent the distresses of mankind, which I have mentioned because of Dr. Dunn's reply, whose answer was, I know you want not what will sustain nature, for a little will do that, but my desire is that you who in the days of your plenty have cheered and raised the hearts of so many of your dejected friends would now receive this from me and use it as a cordial for the cheering of your own and upon these terms it was received he was a happy reconciler of many differences in the families of his friends and kindred which he never undertook faintly for such undertakings have usually faint effects, and they had such a faith in his judgment and impartiality that he never advised them to anything in vain. He was, even to her death, a most dutiful son to his mother, careful to provide for her supportation, of which she had been destitute, but that God raised him up to prevent her necessities who having sucked in the religion of the roman church with the mother's milk spent her estate in foreign countries to enjoy a liberty in it and died in his house but three months before him and to the end it may appear how just a steward he was of his lord and master's revenue i have thought fit to let the reader know that after his entrance into his deanery as he numbered his years he at the foot of a private account to which God and his angels were only witnesses with him, computed first his revenue, then what was given to the poor and other pious uses, and lastly what rested for him and his. And having done that, he then blessed each year's poor remainder with a thankful prayer, which for that they discover a more than common devotion the reader shall partake some of them in his own words. So all is that remains this year, 1624 and 5, Deo opt max benigno lagatori ame et ab is quibus, hec ame reservantor gloria et gratia in eternum amen. Translated thus, To God all good, all great, the benevolent bestower, by me and by them, for whom by me these sums are laid up, be glory and grace ascribed for ever. Amen. So that this year, 1626, God hath blessed me and mine with multiplicatse sunt super nos misericordiae tue domine. Translated thus, Thy mercies, O Lord, are multiplied upon us. Da Domini, et quie ex immensa bonitate tua nobis elargiri dignatus sis in quorum cumque manus devenerent in tuam semper cedant gloriam. Amen. Translated thus. 
Grant, O Lord, that what out of thine infinite bounty thou hast vouchsafed to lavish upon us, into whosoever hands it may devolve, may always be improved to thy glory. Amen. In fine orum sex anorum manet, 1628-29, quid habeo quod non accepte a domino, largiter etiam et que largitus est sue iterum fiant, bono eorum esue, et cem ad modam nec officies huis munde nec losi a quo mi posuet dignitati, nec servis nec eginis in toto huis ane curriculo mihi concius sum me defrises ita et liberi quibus quae supersunt supersunt gratio animo ea accipiant et beneficum authorum reconoscant amen translated thus at the end of these six years remains what have i which i have not received from the lord he bestows also to the intent that what he hath bestowed may revert to him by the proper use of it that as i have not consciously been wanting to myself during the whole course of the past year either in discharging my secular duties in retaining the dignity of my station or in my conduct towards my servants and the poor so my children for whom remains whatever is remaining may receive it with gratitude and acknowledge the beneficent giver amen but i return from my long digression we left the author sick in essex where he was forced to spend much of that winter by reason of his disability to remove from that place and having never for almost twenty years omitted his personal attendance on his majesty in that month in which he was to attend and preach to him nor having ever been left out of the roll and number of lent preachers and there being then in january sixteen thirty a report brought to london or raised there that dr dunn was dead that report gave him occasion to write the following letter to a dear friend sir this advantage you and my other friends have by my frequent fevers that i am so much the oftener at the gates of heaven and this advantage by the solitude and close imprisonment that they reduce me to after that i am so much the oftener at my prayers in which i shall never leave out your happiness and i doubt not among his other blessings god will add some one to you for my prayers a man would almost be content to die if there were no other benefit in death to hear of so much sorrow and so much good testimony from good men as i god be blessed for it did upon the report of my death yet i perceive it went not through all for one writ to me that some and he said of my friends conceived i was not so ill as i pretended but withdrew myself to live at ease discharged of preaching it is an unfriendly and god knows an ill-grounded interpretation for i have always been sorrier when i could not preach than any could be they could not hear me it hath been my desire and god may be pleased to grant it that i might die in the pulpit if not that yet that i might take my death in the pulpit that is die the sooner by occasion of those labours sir i hope to see you presently after candlemas about which time will fall my lent sermon at court except my lord chamberlain believe me to be dead and so leave me out of the roll but as long as i live and am not speechless i would not willingly decline that service i have better leisure to write than you to read yet i would not willingly oppress you with too much letter god so bless you and your son as i wish to your poor friend and servant in christ jesus j dunn before that month ended he was appointed to preach upon his old constant day the first friday in lent 
he had notice of it, and had in his sickness so prepared for that employment, that as he had long thirsted for it, so he resolved his weakness should not hinder his journey. He came, therefore, to London some few days before his appointed day of preaching. At his coming thither, many of his friends, who with sorrow saw his sickness had left him but so much flesh as did only cover his bones, doubted his strength to perform that task, and did, therefore, dissuade him from undertaking it, assuring him, however, it was like to shorten his life. But he passionately denied their requests, saying, he would not doubt that that god who in so many weaknesses had assisted him with an unexpected strength would now withdraw it in his last employment professing a holy ambition to perform that sacred work and when to the amazement of some beholders he appeared in the pulpit many of them thought he presented himself not to preach mortification by a living voice but mortality by a decayed body and a dying face. And doubtless many did secretly ask that question in Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 3, Do these bones live, or can that soul organize that tongue to speak so long time as the sand in that glass will move towards its centre, and measure out an hour of this dying man's unspent life. Doubtless it cannot, and yet after some faint praises in his zealous prayer, his strong desires enabled his weak body to discharge his memory of his preconceived meditations, which were of dying, the text being, To God the Lord belong the issues from death many that then saw his tears and heard his faint and hollow voice professing they thought the text prophetically chosen and that dr dunn had preached his own funeral sermon being full of joy that god had enabled him to perform this desired duty he hastened to his house out of which he never moved till like st stephen he was carried by devout men to his grave the next day after his sermon, his strength being much wasted, and his spirits so spent as indisposed him to business or to talk, a friend that had often been a witness of his free and facetious discourse asked him, Why are you sad? To whom he replied with a countenance so full of cheerful gravity as gave testimony of an inward tranquillity of mind and of a soul willing to take a farewell of this world, and said, I am not sad, but most of the night past I have entertained myself with many thoughts of several friends that have left me here, and are gone to that place from which they shall not return, and that within a few days I also shall go hence, and be no more seen, and my preparation for this change has become my nightly meditation upon my bed, which my infirmities have now made restless to me. But at this present time I was in a serious contemplation of the providence and goodness of God to me, to me who am less than the least of his mercies, and looking back upon my life past, I now plainly see it was his hand that prevented me from all temporal employment and that it was his will that I should never settle nor thrive till I entered into the ministry, in which I have now lived almost twenty years, I hope to his glory, and by which I most humbly thank him. I have been enabled to requite most of those friends which showed me kindness when my fortune was very low, as God knows it was, and as it hath occasioned the expression of my gratitude, I thank God most of them have stood in need of my requital. I have lived to be useful and comfortable to my good father-in-law, Sir George Moore, whose patience God hath been pleased to exercise with many temporal crosses. I have maintained my own mother, whom it hath pleased God after a plentiful fortune in her younger days, to bring to great decay in her very old age. 
I have quieted the consciences of many that have groaned under the burden of a wounded spirit whose prayers I hope are available for me. I cannot plead innocency of life, especially of my youth, but I am to be judged by a merciful God who is not willing to see what I have done amiss, and though of myself I have nothing to present to him but sins and misery, yet I know he looks not upon me now as I am of myself, but as I am in my Saviour, and hath given me, even at this present time, some testimonies by his Holy Spirit that I am of the number of his elect. I am therefore full of inexpressible joy, and shall die in peace. I must here look so far back as to tell the reader that at his first return out of Essex to preach his last sermon, his old friend and physician Dr. Fox, a man of great worth, came to him to consult his health, and that after a sight of him and some queries concerning his distempers, he told him that by cordials and drinking milk twenty times together there was a probability of his restoration to health, but he passionately denied to drink it. Nevertheless, Dr. Fox, who loved him most entirely, wearied him with solicitations till he yielded to take it for ten days, at the end of which time he told Dr. Fox he had drunk it more to satisfy him than to recover his health, and that he would not drink it ten days longer upon the best moral assurance of having twenty years added to his life, for he loved it not, and was so far from fearing death, which to others is the king of terrors, that he longed for the day of his dissolution. It is observed that a desire of glory or commendation is rooted in the very nature of man, and that those of the severest and most mortified lives, though they may become so humble as to banish self-flattery and such weeds as naturally grow there, yet they have not been able to kill this desire of glory, but that, like our radical heat, it shall both live and die with us and many think it should do so, and we want not sacred examples to justify the desire of having our memory to outlive our lives, which I mention because Dr. Dunn, by the persuasion of Dr. Fox, easily yielded at this very time to have a monument made for him, but Dr. Fox undertook not to persuade him how or what monument it should be. That was left to Dr. Dunn himself. A monument being resolved upon, Dr. Dunn sent for a carver to make for him in wood the figure of an urn, giving him directions for the compass and height of it, and to bring with it a board of the just height of his body. These being got, then without delay a choice painter was got to be in readiness to draw his picture, which was taken as followeth several charcoal fires being first made in his large study he brought with him into that place his winding sheet in his hand and having put off all his clothes had this sheet put on him and so tied with knots at his head and feet and his hands so placed as dead bodies are usually fitted to be shrouded and put into their coffin or grave upon this urn he thus stood with his eyes shut and with so much of the sheet turned aside as might show his lean pale and death-like face which was purposely turned towards the east from whence he expected the second coming of his and our saviour jesus in this posture he was drawn at his just height and when the picture was fully finished he caused it to be set by his bedside where it continued and became his hourly object till his death, and was then given to his dearest friend and executor, Dr. Henry King, then chief residentiary of St. Paul's, who caused him to be thus carved in one entire piece of white marble, as it now stands in that church, and by Dr. Dunn's own appointment these words were to be affixed to it as an epitaph. 
Reader's note. Here follow several lines of abbreviated Latin. And now, having brought him through the many labyrinths and perplexities of a various life, even to the gates of death and the grave, my desire is he may rest till I have told my reader that I have seen many pictures of him in several habits and at several ages and in several postures, and I now mention this because I have seen one picture of him drawn by a curious hand at his age of eighteen with his sword and what other adornments might then suit with the present fashions of youth and the giddy gaieties of that age, and his motto then was, How much shall I be changed before I am changed? And if that young and his now dying picture were at this time set together, every beholder might say, Lord, how much is Dr. Dunn already changed before he is changed? And the view of them might give my reader occasion to ask himself, with some amazement, Lord, how much may I also, that I am now in health, be changed before I am changed, before this vile, this changeable body shall put off mortality, and therefore to prepare for it. But this is not writ so much for my reader's memento as to tell him that Dr. Dunn would often in his private discourses, and often publicly in his sermons, mention the many changes both of his body and mind, especially of his mind, from a vertiginous giddiness, and would as often say his great and most blessed change was from a temporal to a spiritual employment in which he was so happy that he accounted the former part of his life to be lost, and the beginning of it to be from his first entering into sacred orders and serving his most merciful God at his altar. Upon Monday, after the drawing of this picture, he took his last leave of his beloved study, and being sensible of his hourly decay, retired himself to his bedchamber and that week sent at several times for many of his most considerable friends with whom he took a solemn and deliberate farewell commending to their consideration some sentences useful for the regulation of their lives and then dismissed them as good jacob did his sons with a spiritual benediction the sunday following he appointed his servants that if there were any business yet undone that concerned him or themselves, it should be prepared against Saturday next, for after that day he would not mix his thoughts with anything that concerned this world, nor ever did, but as Job, so he, waited for the appointed day of his dissolution. And now he was so happy as to have nothing to do but to die, to do which he stood in need of no longer time, for he had studied it long, and to so happy a perfection, that in a former sickness he called God to witness, in his book of devotions written then, he was that minute ready to deliver his soul into his hands, if that minute God would determine his dissolution. In that sickness he begged of God the constancy to be preserved in that estate for ever, and his patient expectation to have his immortal soul disrobed from her garment of mortality makes me confident that he now had a modest assurance that his prayers were then heard and his petition granted. He lay fifteen days earnestly expecting his hourly change and in the last hour of his last day, as his body melted away and vapoured into spirit, his soul having, I verily believe, some revelation of the beatifical vision, he said, I were miserable if I might not die. And after these words closed many periods of his faint breath by saying often, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. His speech, which had long been his ready and faithful servant, left him not till the last minute of his life, and then forsook him not to serve another master, for who speaks like him, 
but died before him, for that it was then become useless to him that now conversed with God on earth as angels are said to do in heaven, only by thoughts and looks. Being speechless, and seeing heaven by that illumination by which he saw it, he did, as St. Stephen, look steadfastly into it, till he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God his Father, and being satisfied with this blessed sight, as his soul ascended and his last breath departed from him, he closed his own eyes, and then disposed his hands and body into such a posture as required not the least alteration by those that came to shroud him. Thus variable, thus virtuous, was the life, thus excellent, thus exemplary, was the death of this memorable man. He was buried in that place of St. Paul's Church, which he had appointed for that use some years before his death, and by which he passed daily to pay his public devotions to Almighty God, who was then served twice a day by a public form of prayer and praises in that place. But he was not buried privately, though he desired it, for beside an unnumbered number of others, many persons of nobility and of eminence for learning, who did love and honour him in his life, did show it at his death by a voluntary and sad attendance of his body to the grave, where nothing was so remarkable as a public sorrow. To which place of his burial some mournful friends repaired, and, as Alexander the Great did to the grave of the famous Achilles, so they strewed his with an abundance of curious and costly flowers, which course they, who were never yet known, continued morning and evening for many days, not ceasing till the stones that were taken up in that church to give his body admission into the cold earth, now his bed of rest, were again by the mason's art so levelled and firmed as they had been formerly, and his place of burial indistinguishable to common view. The next day after his burial some unknown friend, some one of the many lovers and admirers of his virtue and learning, writ this epitaph with a coal on the wall over his grave. Reader, I am to let thee know, Dunn's body only lies below, for could the grave his soul comprise, earth would be richer than the skies. Nor was this all the honour done to his reverend ashes, for as there be some persons that will not receive a reward for that for which God accounts himself a debtor, persons that dare trust God with their charity, and without a witness, so there was by some grateful unknown friend that thought Dr. Dunn's memory ought to be perpetuated, a hundred marks sent to his faithful friends and executors, Dr. King and Dr. Montford, towards the making of his monument. It was not for many years known by whom, but after the death of Dr. Fox it was known that it was he that sent it, and he lived to see as lively a representation of his dead friend as marble can express, a statue indeed so like Dr. Dunn that, as his friend Sir Henry Wotton had expressed himself, it seems to breathe faintly, and posterity shall look upon it as a kind of artificial miracle. He was of stature, moderately tall, of a straight and equally proportioned body, to which all his words and actions gave an inexpressible addition of comeliness. The melancholy and pleasant humour were in him so contempered that each gave advantage to the other and made his company one of the delights of mankind. His fancy was unimitably high, equalled only by his great wit, both being made useful by a commanding judgment. His aspect was cheerful, and such as gave a silent testimony of a clear knowing soul, and of a conscience at peace with itself. His melting eye showed that he had a soft heart full of noble compassion, 
of too brave a soul to offer injuries, and too much a Christian not to pardon them in others. He did much contemplate, especially after he entered into his sacred calling, the mercies of Almighty God, the immortality of the soul, and the joys of heaven, and would often say in a kind of sacred ecstasy, Blessed be God that he is God, only and divinely like himself. He was by nature highly passionate, but more apt to reluct at the excesses of it. A great lover of the offices of humanity, and of so merciful a spirit, that he never beheld the miseries of mankind without pity and relief. He was earnest and unwearied in the search of knowledge with which his vigorous soul is now satisfied, and employed in a continual praise of that God that first breathed it into his active body, that body which once was a temple of the Holy Ghost, and is now become a small quantity of Christian dust. But I shall see it reanimated. Isaac Walton An Elegy on Dr. Dunn by Isaac Walton our dun is dead and we may sighing say we had that man where language chose to stay and show her utmost power i would not praise that and his great wit which in our vain days make others proud but as these served to unlock that cabinet his mind where such a stock of knowledge was reposed that I lament our just and general cause of discontent. And I rejoice I am not so severe, but as I write a line to weep a tear for his decease. Such sad extremities can make such men as I write elegies, and wonder not, for when so great a loss falls on a nation, and they slight the cross, God hath raised prophets to awaken them from their dull lethargy. Witness my pen, not used to upbraid the world, though now it must freely and boldly, for the cause is just. Dull age, O oh, I would spare thee, but thou art worse. Thou art not only dull, but hast a curse of black ingratitude. If not, couldst thou part with this matchless man, and make no vow for thee and thine successively to pay some sad remembrance to his dying day? Did his youth scatter poetry wherein lay love's philosophy? Was every sin pictured in his sharp satires made so foul that some have feared sin's shape, and kept their soul safer by reading verse? Did he give days past marble monuments to those whose praise he would perpetuate? Did he, I fear envy will doubt, these at his twentieth year? But more matured did his rich soul conceive, and in harmonious holy numbers weave a crown of sacred sonnets, fit to adorn a dying martyr's brow, or to be worn on that blessed head of Mary Madeline, after she wiped Christ's feet, but not till then? Did he, fit for such penitence as she and he to use, leave us a litany which all devout men love, and doubtless shall, as times grow better, grow more classical? Did he write hymns for piety and wit, equal to those great grave prudentious writ. Spake he all languages, knew he all laws, the grounds and use of physic, but because twas mercenary, waved it, went to see that happy place of Christ's nativity. Did he return and preach him? Preach him so, as since St. Paul none ever did. They know, those happy souls that heard him, know this truth did he confirm thy aged convert thy youth did he these wonders and is his dear loss mourned by so few few for so great a cross 
but sure the silent are ambitious all to be close mourners of his funeral if not in common pity they forbear by repetitions to renew our care or knowing grief conceived and hid consumes man's life insensibly as poison's fumes corrupt the brain take silence for the way to enlarge the soul from these walls mud and clay materials of this body to remain with him in heaven where no promiscuous pain lessens those joys we have for with him all are satisfied with joys essential dwell on these joys my thoughts oh do not call grief back by thinking on his funeral forget he loved me waste not my swift years which haste to david seventy filled with fears and sorrows for his death forget his parts they find a living grave in good men's hearts and for my first is daily paid for sin forget to pay my second sigh for him forget his powerful preaching and forget i am his convert o oh, my frailty let my flesh be no more heard it will obtrude this lethargy so should my gratitude my vows of gratitude should so be broke which can no more be than his virtues spoke by any but himself for which cause i write no encomiums but this elegy which as a free-will offering i here give fame and the world and parting with it grieve i want abilities fit to set forth a monument as matchless as his worth april seventh sixteen thirty one isaac walton Chapter Two of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Dunn, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Henry Wotton, Part One. Life of Sir Henry Wotton. Sir Henry Wotton, whose life I now intend to write, was born in the year of our redemption, fifteen sixty eight in Bockton Hall, commonly called Bockton, or Boughton Place, or Palace, in the parish of Bockton Mallerby, in the fruitful country of Kent. Bockton Hall, being an ancient and goodly structure, beautifying and being beautified by the parish church of Bockton Mallerby, adjoining unto it, and both seated within a fair park of the Wootons on the brow of such a hill as gives the advantage of a large prospect and of equal pleasure to all beholders. But this house and church are not remarkable for anything so much as for that the memorable family of the Wootons have so long inhabited the one and now lie buried in the other, as appears by their many monuments in that church the Wootons being a family that hath brought forth diverse persons eminent for wisdom and valour, whose heroic acts and noble employments, both in England and in foreign parts, have adorned themselves in this nation, which they have served abroad faithfully in the discharge of their great trust, and prudently in their negotiations with several princes, and also served at home with much honour and justice in their wise managing a great part of the public affairs thereof in the various times both of war and peace but lest i should be thought by any that may incline either to deny or doubt this truth not to have observed moderation in the commendation of this family and also for that i believe the merits and memory of such persons ought to be thankfully recorded, I shall offer to the consideration of every reader out of the testimony of their pedigree and our chronicles a part, and but a part, of that just commendation which might be from thence enlarged, and shall then leave the indifferent reader to judge whether my error be an excess or defect 
of commendation. Sir Robert Wotton of Bockton Mallerby, Knight, was born about the year of Christ 1460. He, living in the reign of King Edward the Fourth, was by him entrusted to be Lieutenant of Giesness, to be Knight Porter and Comptroller of Calais, where he died and lies honourably buried. Sir Edward Wotton of Bockton Mallerby, Knight, son and heir of the said Sir Robert, was born in the year of Christ 1489, in the reign of King Henry the Seventh. He was made treasurer of Calais and of the Privy Council to King Henry the Eighth, who offered him to be Lord Chancellor of England. But Seth Hollingshed, in his chronicle, out of a virtuous modesty, he refused it. Thomas Wotton of Bockton Mallerby, Esquire, son and heir of the said Sir Edward, and the father of our Sir Henry that occasions this relation, was born in the year of Christ 1521. He was a gentleman, excellently educated, and studious in all the liberal arts in the knowledge whereof he attained unto a great perfection, who, though he had, besides these abilities, a very noble and plentiful estate, and the ancient interest of his predecessors, many invitations from Queen Elizabeth to change his country recreations and retirement for a court offering him a knighthood she was then with him at his bockton hall and that to be but as an earnest of some more honourable and more profitable employment under her yet he humbly refused both being a man of great modesty of a most plain and single heart of an ancient freedom and integrity of mind a commendation which Sir Henry Wotton took occasion often to remember with great gladness, and thankfully to boast himself the son of such a father, from whom indeed he derived that noble ingenuity that was always practised by himself, and which he ever both commended and cherished in others. This Thomas was also remarkable for hospitality, a great lover and much beloved of his country to which may justly be added that he was a cherisher of learning, as appears by that excellent antiquary Mr. William Lombard, in his perambulation of Kent. This Thomas had four sons, Sir Edward, Sir James, Sir John, and Sir Henry. Sir Edward was knighted by Queen Elizabeth, and made comptroller of Her Majesty's household. He was, saith Camden, a man remarkable for many and great employments in the state during her reign, and sent several times ambassador into foreign nations. After her death he was by King James made comptroller of his household, and called to be of his privy council, and by him advanced to be Lord Wotton, Baron of Merley in Kent, and made Lord Lieutenant of that county. Sir James, the second son, may be numbered among the martial men of his age, who was in the thirty-eighth year of Queen Elizabeth's reign, with Robert, Earl of Sussex, Count Lodewick of Nassau, Don Cristoforo, son of Antonio, King of Portugal, and diverse other gentlemen of nobleness and valour, knighted in the field near Cadiz in Spain, after they had gotten great honour and riches, besides a notable retaliation of injuries by taking that town. Sir John, being a gentleman excellently accomplished, both by learning and travel, was knighted by Queen Elizabeth, and by her looked upon with more than ordinary favour, and with intentions of preferment. But death in his younger years put a period to his growing hopes. Of Sir Henry my following discourse shall give an account. The descent of these forenamed Wottons was all in a direct line, and most of them and their actions in the memory of those with whom we have conversed. But if I had looked so far back as to Sir Nicholas Wotton, who lived in the reign of King Richard the Second, or before him upon diverse others of great note in their several ages, I might by some be thought tedious, 
and yet others may more justly think me negligent if I omit to mention Nicholas Wotton, the fourth son of Sir Robert, whom I first named. This Nicholas Wotton was doctor of law, and sometime dean, both of York and Canterbury, a man whom God did not only bless with a long life, but with great abilities of mind and an inclination to employ them in the service of his country, as is testified by his several employments, having been sent nine times ambassador unto foreign princes, Camden in his Britannia, and by his being a privy counsellor to King Henry the Eighth, to Edward the Sixth, to Queen Mary, and Queen Elizabeth, who also, after he had been during the wars between England, Scotland, and France, three several times, and not unsuccessfully, employed in committees for settling of peace betwixt this and those kingdoms, died, saith learned Camden, full of commendations for wisdom and piety. He was also, by the will of King Henry the Eighth, made one of his executors, and chief secretary of state to his son, that pious prince Edward the Sixth. Concerning which Nicholas Wotton, I shall say but this little more, that he refused being offered it by Queen Elizabeth to be Archbishop of Canterbury, Hollingshead, and that he died not rich, though he lived in that time of the dissolution of abbeys. More might be added, but by this it may appear that Sir Henry Wotton was a branch of such a kindred as left a stock of reputation to their posterity, such reputation as might kindle a generous emulation in strangers, and preserve a noble ambition to those of his name and family to perform actions worthy of their ancestors and that Sir Henry Wotton did so, might appear more perfectly than my pen can express it, if of his many surviving friends some one of higher parts and employments had been pleased to have commended his to posterity, but since some years are now past, and they have all, I know not why, forborne to do it, my gratitude to the memory of my dead friend and the renewed request of some, Sir Edward Bush, Clarence Sir King of Arms, Mr. Charles Cotton, and Mr. Nicholas Odert, sometime Sir Henry Wotton's servant, that still live solicitous to see this duty performed. These have had a power to persuade me to undertake it, which truly I have not done but with distrust of mine own abilities, and yet so far from despair, that I am modestly confident my humble language shall be accepted, because I shall present all readers with a commixture of truth and Sir Henry Wotton's merits. This being premised, I proceed to tell the reader that the father of Sir Henry Wotton was twice married, first to Elizabeth, the daughter of Sir John Rudstone, knight, after whose death, though his inclination was averse to all contentions, yet necessitated he was to several suits in law in the persecution thereof, which took up much of his time and were the occasion of many discontents, he was by diverse of his friends earnestly persuaded to a remarriage, to whom he as often answered that if he ever did put on a resolution to marry, he was seriously resolved to avoid three sorts of persons, namely, those that had children, those that had lawsuits, and those that were of his kindred. And yet, following his own lawsuits, he met in Westminster Hall with Mrs. Eleonora Morton, widow to Robert Morton of Kent, Esquire, who was also engaged in several suits in law, and he, observing her comportment at the time of hearing one of her causes before the judges, could not but at the same time both compassionate her condition and affect her person. For the tears of lovers, or beauty dressed in sadness, are observed to have in them a charming eloquence, and to become very often too strong to be resisted 
which I mention because it proved so with this Thomas Wotton, for although there were in her a concurrence of all those accidents against which he had so seriously resolved, yet his affection to her grew then so strong that he resolved to solicit her for a wife, and did, and obtained her. By her, who was the daughter of Sir William Finch of Eastwell, in Kent, he had only Henry, his youngest son. His mother undertook to be tutorous unto him during much of his childhood, for whose care and pains he paid her each day with such visible signs of future perfection in learning as turned her employment into a pleasing trouble, which she was content to continue till his father took him into his own particular care and disposed of him to a tutor in his own house at Bockton. And when time and diligent instruction had made him fit for a removal to a higher form, which was very early, he was sent to Winchester School, a place of strict discipline and order, that so he might in his youth be moulded into a method of living by rule, which his wise father knew to be the most necessary way to make the future part of his life both happy to himself and useful for the discharge of all business, whether public or private. And that he might be confirmed in this regularity, he was, at a fit age, removed from that school to be a commoner of New College in Oxford, both being founded by William Wickham, Bishop of Winchester. There he continued till about the eighteenth year of his age, and was then transplanted into Queen's College, where within that year he was by the chief of that college persuasively enjoined to write a play for their private use. It was the tragedy of Tancredo, which was so interwoven with sentences, and for the method and exact personating those humours, passions, and dispositions which he proposed to represent, so performed that the gravest of that society declared he had, in a slight employment, given an early and a solid testimony of his future abilities and though there may be some sour dispositions which may think this not worth a memorial, yet that wise knight, Baptista Guarini, whom learned Italy accounts one of her ornaments, thought it neither an uncomely nor an unprofitable employment for his age. But I pass to what will be thought more serious. About the twentieth year of his age, he proceeded master of arts, and at that time read in Latin three lectures de oculo, wherein he, having described the form, the motion, the curious composure of the eye, and demonstrated how of those very many every humour and nerve performs its distinct office, so as the god of order hath appointed, without mixture or confusion, and all this to the advantage of man, to whom the eye is given, not only as the body's guide, but whereas all other of his senses require time to inform the soul, this in an instant apprehends and warns him of danger, teaching him in the very eyes of others to discover wit, folly, love, and hatred. After he had made these observations, he fell to dispute this optic question, whether we see by the emission of the beams from within, or reception of the species from without. And after that, and after many other like learned disquisitions, he, in the conclusion of his lectures, took a fair occasion to beautify his discourse with a commendation of the blessing and benefit of seeing by which we do not only discover nature's secrets, but with a continued content, for the eye is never weary of seeing, behold the great light of the world, and by it discover the fabric of the heavens, and both the order and motion of the celestial orbs. Nay, that if the eye look but downward, it may rejoice to behold the bosom of the earth, our common mother 
embroidered and adorned with numberless and various flowers which man sees daily grow up to perfection and then silently moralize his own condition who in a short time like those very flowers decays withers and quickly returns again to that earth from which both had their first being these were so exactly debated and so rhetorically heightened as among other admirers caused that learned italian albericus gentilis then professor of the civil law in oxford to call him henry c mi ocel which dear expression of his was also used by divers of sir henry's dearest friends and by many other persons of note during his stay in the university but his stay there was not long at least not so long as his friends once intended for the year after sir henry proceeded master of arts his father whom sir henry never did mention without this or some like reverential expression as that good man my father or my father the best of men about that time this good man changed this for a better life leaving to sir henry as to his other younger sons a rent charge of a hundred marks a year to be paid for ever out of some one of his manners of a much greater value and here though this good man be dead yet i wish a circumstance or two that concerns him may not be buried without a relation which i shall undertake to do for that i suppose they may so much concern the reader to know that i may promise myself a pardon for a short digression in the year of our redemption fifteen fifty three nicholas wotton dean of canterbury whom i formerly mentioned being then ambassador in france dreamed that his nephew this thomas wotton was inclined to be a party in such a project as if he were not suddenly prevented would turn both to the loss of his life and ruin of his family doubtless the good dean did well know that common dreams are but a senseless paraphrase on our waking thoughts or of the business of the day past or are the result of our over-engaged affections when we betake ourselves to rest and knew that the observation of them may turn to silly superstitions as they too often do but though he might know all this and might also believe that prophecies are ceased yet doubtless he could not but consider that all dreams are not to be neglected or cast away without all consideration and did therefore rather lay this dream aside than intend totally to lose it and dreaming the same again the night following when it became a double dream like that of pharaoh of which double dreams the learned have made many observations and considering that it had no dependence on his waking thoughts much less on the desires of his heart then he did more seriously consider it and remembered that almighty god was pleased in a dream to reveal and to assure monica the mother of st austin that he her son for whom she wept so bitterly and prayed so much should at last become a christian st austin's confessions this i believe the good dean considered and considering also that almighty god though the causes of dreams be often unknown hath even in these latter times also by a certain illumination of the soul in sleep discovered many things that human wisdom could not foresee upon these considerations he resolved to use so prudent a remedy by way of prevention as might introduce no great inconvenience either to himself or to his nephew and to that end he wrote to the queen twas queen mary and besought her that she would cause his nephew thomas wotton to be sent for out of kent and that the lords of her council might interrogate him in some such feigned question as might give a colour for his commitment into a favourable prison 
declaring that he would acquaint her majesty with the true reason of his request when he should next become so happy as to see and speak to her majesty it was done as the dean desired and in prison i must leave mr wotton till i have told the reader what followed at this time a marriage was concluded betwixt our queen mary and philip king of spain and though this was concluded with the advice if not by the persuasion of her privy council as having many probabilities of advantage to this nation yet diverse persons of a contrary persuasion did not only declare against it but also raised forces to oppose it believing as they said it would be a means to bring england to be under a subjection to spain and make those of this nation slaves to strangers and of this number sir thomas wyatt of boxley abbey in kent betwixt whose family and the family of the wottons there had been an ancient and entire friendship was the principal actor who having persuaded many of the nobility and gentry especially of kent to side with him and he being defeated and taken prisoner was legally arraigned and condemned and lost his life so did the duke of suffolk and diverse others especially many of the gentry of kent who were there in several places executed as wyatt's assistants and of this number in all probability had mr wotton been if he had not been confined for though he could not be ignorant that another man's treason makes it mine by concealing it yet he durst confess to his uncle when he returned to england and then came to visit him in prison that he had more than an intimation of wyatt's intentions and though he had not continued actually innocent if his uncle had not so happily dreamed him into prison out of which place when he was delivered by the same hand that caused his commitment they both considered the dream more seriously and then both joined in praising god for it that god who ties himself to no rules either in preventing of evil or in showing of mercy to those whom of good pleasure he hath chosen to love and this dream was the more considerable because that god who in the days of old did use to speak to his people in visions did seem to speak to many of this family in dreams of which i will also give the reader one short particular of this thomas wotton whose dreams did usually prove true both in foretelling things to come and discovering things past and the particular is this this thomas a little before his death dreamed that the university treasury was robbed by townsmen and poor scholars and that the number was five and being that day to write to his son henry at oxford he thought it worth so much pains as by a postscript in his letter to make a slight inquiry of it the letter which was writ out of kent and dated three days before came to his son's hands the very morning after the night in which the robbery was committed and when the city and university were both in a perplexed inquest of the thieves then did sir henry wotton show his father's letter and by it such light was given of this work of darkness that the five guilty persons were presently discovered and apprehended without putting the university to so much trouble as the casting of a figure and it may yet be more considerable that this nicholas and thomas wotton should both being men of holy lives of even tempers and much given to fasting and prayer foresee and foretell the very days of their own death nicholas did so being then seventy years of age and in perfect health thomas did the like in the sixty-fifth year of his age who being then in london where he died and foreseeing his death there gave direction in what manner his body should be carried to Bockton, and though he thought his uncle nicholas worthy of that noble monument which he built for him in the cathedral church of canterbury 
yet this humble man gave directions concerning himself to be buried privately and especially without any pomp at his funeral. This is some account of this family which seemed to be beloved of God. But it may now seem more than time that I return to Sir Henry Wotton at Oxford, where after his optic lecture he was taken into such a bosom friendship with the learned Albericus Gentilis, whom I formerly named, that, if it had been possible, Gentilis would have breathed all his excellent knowledge, both of the mathematics and law, into the breast of his dear Harry, for so Gentilis used to call him, and though he was not able to do that, yet there was in Sir Henry such a propensity and con naturalness to the Italian language, and those studies whereof Gentilis was a great master, that the friendship between them did daily increase, and proved daily advantageous to Sir Henry for the improvement of him in several sciences during his stay in the university. From which place, before I shall invite the reader to follow him into a foreign nation, though I must omit to mention diverse persons that were then in Oxford of memorable note for learning, and friends to Sir Henry Wotton, yet I must not omit the mention of a love that was there begun betwixt him and Dr. Dunn, sometime Dean of St. Paul's, a man of whose abilities I shall forbear to say anything, because he who is of this nation, and pretends to learning or ingenuity, and is ignorant of Dr. Dunn, deserves not to know him. The friendship of these two I must not omit to mention, being such a friendship as was generously elemented. And as it was begun in their youth and in a university, and there maintained by correspondent inclinations and studies, so it lasted till age and death forced a separation. In Oxford he stayed till about two years after his father's death, at which time he was about the twenty-second year of his age, and having to his great wit added the ballast of learning and knowledge of the arts, he then laid aside his books, and betook himself to the useful library of travel, and a more general conversation with mankind, employing the remaining part of his youth, his industry, and fortune, to adorn his mind, and to purchase the rich treasure of foreign knowledge, of which, both for the secrets of nature, the dispositions of many nations, their several laws and languages, he was the possessor in a very large measure, as I shall faithfully make to appear before I take my pen from the following narration of his life. In his travels, which was almost nine years before his return into England, he stayed but one year in France, and most of that in Geneva, where he became acquainted with Theodore Biza, then very aged, and with Isaac Casaubon, in whose house, if I be rightly informed, Sir Henry Wotton was lodged, and there contracted a most worthy friendship with that man of rare learning and ingenuity. Three of the remaining eight years were spent in Germany, the other five in Italy, the stage on which God appointed he should act a great part of his life, where both in Rome, Venice, and Florence he became acquainted with the most eminent men for learning and all manner of arts, as picture, sculpture, chemistry, architecture, and other manual arts, even arts of inferior nature of all which he was a most dear lover and a most excellent judge. He returned out of Italy into England about the thirtieth year of his age, being then noted by many both for his person and comportment. For indeed he was of a choice shape, tall of stature, and of a most persuasive behaviour, which was so mixed with sweet discourse and civilities as gained him much love from all persons with whom he entered into an acquaintance. And whereas he was noted in his youth to have a sharp wit and apt to jest, 
that by time, travel, and conversation was so polished and made so useful that his company seemed to be one of the delights of mankind, insomuch as Robert, Earl of Essex, then one of the darlings of fortune, and in greatest favor with Queen Elizabeth, invited him first into a friendship, and after a knowledge of his great abilities, to be one of his secretaries, the other being Mr. Henry Cuff, some time of Merton College in Oxford, and there also the acquaintance of Sir Henry Wotton in his youth, Mr. Cuff being then a man of no common note in the university for his learning. Nor after his removal from that place, for the great abilities of his mind, nor indeed for the fatalness of his end. Sir Henry Wotton, being now taken into a serviceable friendship with the Earl of Essex, did personally attend his counsels and employments in two voyages at sea against the Spaniards, and also in that, which was the Earl's last, into Ireland, that voyage wherein he did then so much provoke the Queen to anger, and worse, at his return into England, upon whose immovable favour the Earl had built such sandy hopes as encouraged him to those undertakings which, with the help of a contrary faction, suddenly caused his commitment to the tower. Sir Henry Wotton, observing this, though he was not of that faction, for the Earl's followers were also divided into their several interests, which encouraged the Earl to those undertakings, which proved so fatal to him and diverse of his confederation, yet knowing treason to be so comprehensive as to take in even circumstances, and out of them to much such positive conclusions as subtle statesmen shall project, either for their revenge or safety. Considering this, he thought prevention, by absence out of England, a better security than to stay in it and there plead his innocency in a prison. Therefore did he, so soon as the Earl was apprehended, very quickly and as privately, glide through Kent to Dover, without so much as looking toward his native and beloved Bockton, and was by the help of favorable winds and liberal payment of the mariners, within sixteen hours after his departure from London, set upon the French shore, where he heard shortly after that the earl was arraigned, condemned, and beheaded, and that his friend Mr. Cuff was hanged, and diverse other persons of eminent quality executed. The times did not look so favorably upon Sir Henry Wotton as to invite his return into England, having therefore procured of Sir Edward Wotton, his elder brother, an assurance that his annuity should be paid him in Italy, Thither he went, happily renewing his intermitted friendship and interest, and indeed his great content in a new conversation with his old acquaintance in that nation, and more particularly in Florence, which city is not more eminent for the great duke's court than for the great recourse of men of choicest note for learning and arts, in which number he there met with his old friend, Signor Vietta, a gentleman of Venice, and then taken to be secretary to the great Duke of Tuscany. After some stay in Florence, he went the fourth time to visit Rome, where, in the English college, he had very many friends. Their humanity made them really so, though they knew him to be a dissenter from many of their principles of religion and having enjoyed their company, and satisfied himself concerning some curiosities that did partly occasion his journey thither, he returned back to Florence, where a most notable accident befell him, an accident that did not only find new employment for his choice abilities, but did introduce him to a knowledge and interest with our King James, then King of Scotland, which I shall proceed to relate. But first I am to tell the reader that though Queen Elizabeth, or she and her council, were never willing to declare her successor, 
Yet James, then King of the Scots, was confidently believed by most to be the man upon whom the sweet trouble of kingly government would be imposed, and the Queen, declining very fast, both by age and visible infirmities, those that were of the Romish persuasion in point of religion, even Rome itself, and those of this nation, knowing that the death of the Queen and the establishing of her successor were taken to be critical days for destroying or establishing the Protestant religion in this nation, did therefore improve all opportunities for preventing a Protestant prince to succeed her. And as the Pope's excommunication of Queen Elizabeth had both by the judgment and practice of the Jesuited Papist exposed her to be warrantably destroyed, so, if we may believe an angry adversary, a secular priest, William Watson, against a Jesuit, you may believe that about that time there were many endeavors, first to excommunicate, and then to shorten the life of King James. Immediately after Sir Henry Wotton's return from Rome to Florence, which was about a year before the death of Queen Elizabeth, Ferdinand, the great Duke of Florence, had intercepted certain letters that discovered a design to take away the life of James, the then King of Scots. The Duke, abhorring this fact, and resolving to endeavour a prevention of it, advised with his secretary Vietta by what means a caution might be best given to that King and after some consideration it was resolved to be done by Sir Henry Wotton, whom Vietta first commended to the Duke, and the Duke had noted and approved of above all the English that frequented his court. Sir Henry was gladly called by his friend Vietta to the Duke, who after much profession of trust and friendship acquainted him with the secret, and being well instructed dispatched him into Scotland with letters to the king, and with those letters such Italian antidotes against poison as the Scots till then had been strangers to. Having parted from the duke, he took up the name and language of an Italian, and thinking it best to avoid the line of English intelligence and danger, he posted into Norway, and through that country towards Scotland, where he found the king at Stirling. Being there, he used means, by Bernard Lindsay, one of the king's bedchamber, to procure him a speedy and private conference with his majesty, assuring him that the business which he was to negotiate was of such consequence as had caused the great Duke of Tuscany to enjoin him suddenly to leave his native country of Italy to impart it to his king. This being by Bernard Lindsay made known to the king, the king, after a little wonder, mixed with jealousy, to hear of an Italian ambassador or messenger, required his name, which was said to be Octavio Baldi, and appointed him to be heard privately at a fixed hour that evening. When Octavio Baldi came to the presence chamber door, he was requested to lay aside his long rapier, which Italian-like he then wore, and being entered the chamber, he found there with the king three or four Scotch lords, standing distant in several corners of the chamber, at the sight of whom he made a stand, which the king observing, bade him be bold and deliver his message, for he would undertake for the secrecy of all that were present. Then did Octavio Baldi deliver his letters and his message to the king in Italian, which, when the king had graciously received, after a little pause, Octavio Baldi steps to the table and whispers to the king in his own language that he was an Englishman, beseeching him for a more private conference with his majesty, and that he might be concealed during his stay in that nation which was promised and really performed by the king during all his abode there, which was about three months, all which time was spent with much pleasantness to the king, and with as much to Octavio Baldi himself, 
as that country could afford, from which he departed as true an Italian as he came thither. To the Duke at Florence he returned with a fair and grateful account of his employment, and within some few months after his return there came certain news to Florence that Queen Elizabeth was dead, and James, King of the Scots, proclaimed King of England. The Duke, knowing travel and business to be the best school of wisdom, and that Sir Henry Wotton had been tutored in both, advised him to return presently to England, and there joy the King with his new and better title, and wait there upon fortune for a better employment. When King James came into England, he found amongst other of the late Queen's officers Sir Edward, who was after Lord Wotton, Comptroller of the House, of whom he demanded, if he knew one Henry Wotton that had spent much time in foreign travel. That Lord replied he knew him well, and that he was his brother. Then the King, asking where he then was, was answered at Venice or Florence, but by late letters from thence he understood he would suddenly be in Paris. "'Send for him,' said the king, "'and when he shall come into England, bid him repair privately to me.' The Lord Wotton, after a little wonder, asked the king if he knew him, to which the king answered, "'You must rest unsatisfied of that till you bring the gentleman to me.' Not many months after this discourse, the Lord Wotton brought his brother to attend the king, who took him in his arms and bade him welcome by the name of Octavio Baldi, saying he was the most honest and therefore the best dissembler that ever he met with, and said, Seeing I know you neither want learning, travel, nor experience, and that I have had so real a testimony of your faithfulness and abilities to manage an embassage, I have sent for you to declare my purpose, which is to make use of you in that kind hereafter. And, indeed, the king did so, most of those two and twenty years of his reign. But before he dismissed Octavio Baldi from his present attendance upon him, he restored him to his old name of Henry Wotton, by which he then knighted him. Not long after this, the king, having resolved, according to his motto, Beati Pacifici, to have a friendship with his neighbor kingdoms of France and Spain, and also, for diverse weighty reasons, to enter into an alliance with the state of Venice, and to that end to send ambassadors to those several places, did propose the choice of these employments to Sir Henry Wotton who, considering the smallness of his own estate, which he never took care to augment, and knowing the courts of great princes to be sumptuous and necessarily expensive, inclined most to that of Venice, as being a place of more retirement and best suiting with his genius, who did ever love to join with business, study, and a trial of natural experiments for both which fruitful Italy, that darling of nature and cherisher of all arts, is so justly famed in all parts of the Christian world. Sir Henry, having after some short time and consideration resolved upon Venice, and a large allowance being appointed by the king for his voyage thither, and a settled maintenance during his stay there, he left England, nobly accompanied through France to Venice by gentlemen of the best families and breeding that this nation afforded. They were too many to name, but these two, for the following reasons, may not be omitted. Sir Albertus Morton, his nephew, who went his secretary, and William Beadle, a man of choice learning and sanctified wisdom, who went his chaplain and though his dear friend Dr. Dunn, then a private gentleman, was not one of the number that did personally accompany him in this voyage, yet the reading of this following letter sent by him to Sir Henry Wotton the morning before he left England may testify he wanted not his friend's best wishes to attend him. Sir, 
After those reverend papers, whose soul is our good and great king s loved hand and feared name, by which to you he derives much of his, and how he may, makes you almost the same ; a taper of his torch, a copy writ from his original, and a fair beam of the same warm and dazzling sun, though it must in another sphere his virtue stream. After those learned papers, which your hand hath stored with notes of use and pleasure too, from which rich treasury you may command fit matter whether you will write or do. After those loving papers, which friends send with glad grief to your seaward steps farewell, and thicken on you now as prayers ascend to heaven on troops at a good man s passing bell. Admit this honest paper, and allow it such an audience as yourself would ask. What you would say at Venice, this says now, and has for nature what you have for task. To swear much love, nor to be changed before honour alone will to your fortune fit. Nor shall I then honour your fortune more than I have done your honour wanting wit. But tis an easier load, though both oppress, to want than govern greatness. For we are in that in our own and only business. In this we must for others' vices care. Tis therefore well your spirits now are placed in their last furnace, in activity, which fits them, schools and courts and wars or past, to touch and taste in any best degree. For me, if there be such a thing as I, fortune, if there be such a thing as she, finds that I bear so well her tyranny that she thinks nothing else so fit for me. But though she part us to hear my oft prayers for your increase, God is as near me here. And to send you what I shall beg, his stairs in length and ease are alike everywhere. J. Dunn End of chapter 2 Part 1Chapter 2 of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Donne, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Henry Wotton, Part 2 Sir Henry Wotton was received by the state of Venice with much honor and gladness both for that he delivered his embassage most elegantly in the Italian language, and came also in such a juncture of time as his master's friendship seemed useful for that republic. The time of his coming thither was about the year 1604, Leonardo Donato being then duke, a wise and resolved man, and to all purposes such, Sir Henry Wotton would often say it, as the state of Venice could not then have wanted, there having been formerly, in the time of Pope Clement the Eighth, some contests about the privileges of churchmen and the power of the civil magistrates, of which, for the information of common readers, I shall say a little, because it may give light to some passages that follow. About the year 1603, the Republic of Venice made several injunctions against lay persons giving lands or goods to the church without license from the civil magistrate and in that inhibition they expressed their reasons to be for that when any goods or land once came into the hands of the ecclesiastics it was not subject to alienation by reason thereof the lay people being at their death charitable even to excess the clergy grew every day more numerous, and pretended an exemption from all public service and taxes, and from all secular judgment, so that the burden grew thereby too heavy to be borne by the laity. Another occasion of difference was that about this time complaints were justly made by the Venetians 
against two clergymen, the abbot of Nervesa and a canon of Vicenza, for committing such sins as I think not fit to name nor are these mentioned with an intent to fix a scandal upon any calling, for holiness is not tied to ecclesiastical orders, and Italy is observed to breed the most virtuous and most vicious men of any nation. These two having been long complained of at Rome, in the name of the state of Venice, and no satisfaction being given to the Venetians, they seized the persons of this abbot and canon, and committed them to prison. The justice or injustice of such, or the like power, then used by the Venetians, had formerly had some calm debate betwixt the former Pope Clement the Eighth and that Republic. I say calm, for he did not excommunicate them, considering, as I conceive, that in the late Council of Trent it was at last, after many politic disturbances and delays and endeavours to preserve the Pope's present power, in order to a general reformation of those many errors which were in time crept into the Church, declared by that council that though disciplines and special excommunication be one of the chief sinews of Church government and intended to keep men in obedience to it, for which end it was declared to be very profitable. Yet it was also declared and advised to be used with great sobriety and care, because experience had informed them that when it was pronounced unadvisedly or rashly, it became more contemned than feared. And though this was the advice of that council at the conclusion of it, which was not many years before this quarrel with the Venetians, Yet this prudent, patient Pope Clement dying, Pope Paul V, who succeeded him, though not immediately, yet in the same year, being a man of a much hotter temper, brought this difference with the Venetians to a much higher contention, objecting those late acts of that state to be a diminution of his just power, and limited a time of twenty-four days for their revocation threatening, if he were not obeyed, to proceed to the excommunication of the Republic, who still offered to show both reason and ancient custom to warrant their actions. But this Pope, contrary to his predecessor's moderation, required absolute obedience without disputes. Thus it continued for about a year, the Pope still threatening excommunication, and the Venetians still answering him with fair speeches and no compliance, till at last the Pope's zeal to the apostolic see did make him to excommunicate the Duke, the whole Senate, and all their dominions, and that done, to shut up all their churches, charging the whole clergy to forbear all sacred offices to the Venetians, till their obedience should render them capable of absolution. But this act of the popes did but the more confirm the Venetians in their resolution not to obey him, and to that end, upon the hearing of the pope's interdict, they presently published by sound of trumpet a proclamation to this effect, that whosoever hath received from Rome any copy of a papal interdict published there, as well against the law of God as against the honour of this nation, shall presently render it to the Council of Ten, upon pain of death, and made it loss of estate and nobility but to speak in behalf of the Jesuits. Then was Duado, their ambassador, called home from Rome, and the Inquisition presently suspended by order of the state, and the floodgates being thus set open, any man that had a pleasant or scoffing wit might safely vent it against the Pope, either by free speaking or by libels in print, and both became very pleasant to the people. Matters thus heightened, the State advised with Father Paul, a holy and learned friar, the author of the History of the Council of Trent, whose advice was, 
neither to provoke the Pope nor lose their own right, he declaring publicly in print, in the name of the state, that the Pope was trusted to keep two keys, one of prudence and the other of power, and that if they were not both used together, power alone is not effectual in an excommunication. And thus these discontents and oppositions continued till a report was blown abroad that the Venetians were all turned Protestants, which was believed by many, for that it was observed that the English ambassador was so often in conference with the Senate, and his chaplain, Mr. Beadle, more often with Father Paul, whom the people did not take to be his friend and also for that the Republic of Venice was known to give commission to Gregory Justiniano, then their ambassador in England, to make all these proceedings known to the King of England, and to crave a promise of his assistance if need should require. And in the meantime they required the King's advice and judgment, which was the same that he gave to Pope Clement at his first coming to the crown of England, that Pope then moving him to a union with the Roman Church, namely, to endeavor the calling of a free council for the settlement of peace in Christendom, and that he doubted not, but that the French king and diverse other princes would join to assist in so good a work, and in the meantime the sin of this breach, both with his and the Venetian dominions, must of necessity lie at the Pope's door. In this contention, which lasted almost two years, the Pope grew still higher, and the Venetians more and more resolved and careless, still acquainting King James with their proceedings, which was done by the help of Sir Henry Wotton, Mr. Beadle, and Padre Paolo, whom the Venetians did then call to be one of their consulters of state, and with his pen to defend their just cause which was by him so performed that the Pope saw plainly he had weakened his power by exceeding it, and offered the Venetians absolution upon very easy terms, which the Venetians, still slighting, did at last obtain by that which was scarce so much as a show of acknowledging it. For they made an order that in that day in which they were absolved there should be no public rejoicing, nor any bonfires that night, lest the common people might judge that they desired an absolution, or were absolved for committing a fault. These contests were the occasion of Padre Paolo's knowledge and interest with King James, for whose sake principally Padre Paolo compiled that eminent history of the remarkable Council of Trent, which history was, as fast as it was written, sent in several sheets in letters by Sir Henry Wotton, Mr. Beadle, and others unto King James, and the then Bishop of Canterbury, into England, and there first made public, both in English and the universal language. For eight years after Sir Henry Wotton's going into Italy, he stood fair and highly valued in the King's opinion, but at last became much clouded by an accident which I shall proceed to relate. At his first going ambassador into Italy, as he passed through Germany, he stayed some days at Augusta, where having been in his former travels well known by many of the best note for learning and ingeniousness, those that are esteemed the virtuosi of that nation, with whom he, passing an evening in merriments, was requested by Christopher Fleckamore to write some sentence in his albo, a book of white paper, which for that purpose many of the German gentry usually carry about them. And Sir Henry Wotton, consenting to the motion, took an occasion, from some accidental discourse of the present company, to write a pleasant definition of an ambassador in these very words, Legatus est vir bonus, peregremisus ad mentindium republicae causa, which Sir Henry Wotton could have been content should have been thus Englished 
An ambassador is an honest man, sent to lie abroad for the good of his country. But the word for lie, being the hinge upon which the conceit was to turn, was not so expressed in Latin as would admit, in the hands of an enemy especially, so fair a construction as Sir Henry thought in English. Yet, as it was, it slept quietly among other sentences in this albo almost eight years, till by accident it fell into the hands of Jasper Siopius, a Romanist, a man of a restless spirit and a malicious pen, who, with books against King James, prints this as a principle of that religion professed by the king and his ambassador, Sir Henry Wotton, then at Venice and in Venice it was presently after written in several glass windows, and spitefully declared to be Sir Henry Wotton's. This coming to the knowledge of King James, he apprehended it to be such an oversight, such a weakness or worse, in Sir Henry Wotton, as caused the king to express much wrath against him. And this caused Sir Henry Wotton to write two apologies, one to Velsirus, one of the chiefs of augusta in the universal language which he caused to be printed and given and scattered in the most remarkable places both of germany and italy as an antidote against the venomous books of siopius and another apology to king james which were both so ingenious so clear and so choicely eloquent that his majesty who was a pure judge of it could not forbear, at the receipt thereof, to declare publicly that Sir Henry Wotton had commuted sufficiently for a greater offence. And now, as broken bones well set become stronger, so Henry Wotton did not only recover, but was much more confirmed in His Majesty's estimation and favour than formerly he had been and as that man of great wit and useful fancy, his friend Dr. Dunn, gave in a will of his, a will of conceits, his reputation to his friends and his industry to his foes, because from thence he received both, so those friends that in this time of trial laboured to excuse this facetious freedom of Sir Henry Wotton's, were to him more dear, and by him more highly valued and those acquaintance that urged this as an advantage against him caused him by this error to grow both more wise and which is the best fruit error can bring forth for the future to become more industriously watchful over his tongue and pen i have told you a part of his employment in italy where notwithstanding the death of his favourer the duke leonardo donato who had an undissembled affection for him, and the malicious accusation of Siopius, yet his interest, as though it had been an entailed love, was still found to live and increase in all the succeeding dukes during his employment to that state, which was almost twenty years, all which time he studied the dispositions of those dukes and the other consulters of state, well knowing that he who negotiates a continued business and neglects the study of dispositions usually fails in his proposed ends. But in this Sir Henry Wotton did not fail, for by a fine sorting of fit presents, curious and not costly entertainments, always sweetened by various and pleasant discourse, with which, and his choice application of stories, and his elegant delivery of all these, even in their Italian language, he first got, and still preserved, such interest in the state of Venice, that it was observed, such was either his merit or his modesty, they never denied him any request. But all this shows but his abilities and his fitness for that employment. It will therefore be needful to tell the reader what use he made of the interest which these procured him, and that indeed was rather to oblige others than to enrich himself, he still endeavouring that the reputation of the English might be maintained both in the German Empire and in Italy, where many gentlemen whom travel 
had invited into that nation, received from him cheerful entertainments, advice for their behavior, and by his interest, shelter, or deliverance from those accidental storms of adversity which usually attend upon travel. And because these things may appear to the reader to be but generals, I shall acquaint him with two particular examples, one of his merciful disposition, and one of the nobleness of his mind, which shall follow. There had been many English soldiers brought by commanders of their own country to serve the Venetians for pay against the Turk and those english having by irregularities or improvidence brought themselves into several galleys and prisons sir henry wotton became a petitioner to that state for their lives and enlargement and his request was granted so that those which were many hundreds and there made the sad examples of human misery by hard imprisonment and unpitied poverty in a strange nation were by his means released relieved and in a comfortable condition sent to thank god and him for their lives and liberty in their own country and this i have observed as one testimony of the compassionate nature of him who was during his stay in those parts as a city of refuge for the distressed of this and other nations and for that which i offer as a testimony of the nobleness of his mind I shall make way to the reader's clearer understanding of it by telling him that besides several other foreign employments Sir Henry Wotton was sent thrice ambassador to the Republic of Venice, and at his last going thither he was employed ambassador to several of the German princes, and more particularly to the Emperor Ferdinando the Second, and that his employment to him and those princes was to incline them to equitable conditions for the restoration of the queen of bohemia and her descendants to their patrimonial inheritance of the palatinate this was by his eight months constant endeavours and attendance upon the emperor his court and council brought to a probability of a successful conclusion without bloodshed but there were at that time two opposite armies in the field, and as they were treating there was a battle fought, in the managery whereof there were so many miserable errors on the one side, so Sir Henry Wotton expresses it in a dispatch to the king, and so advantageous events to the emperor, as put an end to all present hopes of a successful treaty, so that Sir Henry, seeing the face of peace altered by that victory, prepared for a removal from that court, and at his departure from the emperor was so bold as to remember him, that the events of every battle move on the unseen wheels of fortune, which are this moment up and down the next, and therefore humbly advised him to use his victory so soberly as still to put on the thoughts of peace. Which advice, though it seemed to be spoken with some passion his dear mistress the queen of bohemia being concerned in it was yet taken in good part by the emperor who replied that he would consider his advice and though he looked on the king his master as an abettor of his enemy the palgrave yet for sir henry himself his behaviour had been such during the manage of the treaty that he took him to be a person of much honour and merit, and did therefore desire him to accept of that jewel as a testimony of his good opinions of him, which was a jewel of diamonds of more value than a thousand pounds. The jewel was received with all outward circumstances and terms of honour by Sir Henry Wotton, but the next morning, at his departing from Vienna, he, at his taking leave of the Countess of Sabrina, an Italian lady in whose house the Emperor had appointed him to be lodged and honourably entertained, acknowledged her merits, and besought her to accept of that jewel as a testimony of his gratitude for her civilities, presenting her with the same that was given him by the Emperor. 
which being suddenly discovered and told to the emperor, was by him taken for a high affront, and Sir Henry Wotton told so by a messenger. To which he replied, that though he received it with thankfulness, yet he found in himself an indisposition to be the better for any gift that came from an enemy to his royal mistress, the Queen of Bohemia, for so she was pleased he should always call her. Many other of his services to his prince and this nation might be insisted upon, as namely his procurations of privileges and courtesies with the German princes and the Republic of Venice for the English merchants, and what he did by direction of King James with the Venetian state, concerning the Bishop of Spalato's return to the Church of Rome. But for the particulars of these, and many more that I meant to make known, I want a view of some papers that might inform me, his late Majesty's letter office having now suffered a strange alienation. And, indeed, I want time, too, for the printer's press stays for what is written, so that I must hasten to bring Sir Henry Wotton in an instant from Venice to London, leaving the reader to make up what is defective in this place by the small supplement of the inscription under his arms, which he left at all those houses where he rested or lodged when he returned from his last embassy into England. Reader's Note. Here follow thirteen lines in Latin. To London he came the year before King James died, who, having for the reward of his foreign service, promised him the reversion of an office which was fit to be turned into present money, which he wanted for a supply of his present necessities, and also granted him the reversion of the master of the rolls place if he outlived charitable Sir Julius Caesar, who then possessed it, and then grown so old that he was said to be kept alive beyond nature's course by the prayers of those many poor which he daily relieved. But these were but in hope, and his condition required a present support, for in the beginning of these employments he sold to his elder brother, the Lord Wotton, the rent charge left by his good father, and which is worse was now at his return indebted to several persons whom he was not able to satisfy but by the king's payment of his arrears due for his foreign employments he had brought into england many servants of which some were german and italian artists this was part of his condition who had many times hardly sufficient to supply the occasions of the day for it may by no means be said of his providence, as himself said of Sir Philip Sidney's wit, that it was the very measure of congruity, he being always so careless of money, as though our Saviour's words, care not for to-morrow, were to be literally understood. But it pleased the God of providence that in this juncture of time the provostship of his majesty's college of eton became void by the death of mr thomas murray for which there were as the place deserved many earnest and powerful suitors to the king and sir henry who had for many years like sisyphus rolled the restless stone of a state employment knowing experimentally that the great blessing of sweet content was not to be found in multitudes of men or business, and that a college was the fittest place to nourish holy thoughts, and to afford rest both to his body and mind, which his age, being now almost threescore years, seemed to require, did therefore use his own and the interest of all his friends to procure that place by which means, and quitting the king of his promised reversionary offices, and a piece of honest policy which I have not time to relate, he got a grant of it from his majesty. And this was a fair satisfaction to his mind, but money was wanting to furnish him with those necessaries which attend removes and a settlement in such a place, and to procure that, he wrote to his old friend Mr. Nicholas Pay for his assistance, 
of which nicholas pay i shall here say a little for the clearing of some passages that i shall mention hereafter he was in his youth a clerk or in some such way a servant to the lord wotton sir henry's brother and by him when he was comptroller of the king's household was made a great officer in his majesty's house this and other favours being conferred upon mr pay in whom there was a radical honesty were always thankfully acknowledged by him and his gratitude expressed by a willing and unwearied serviceableness to that family even till his death to him sir henry wotton wrote to use all his interest at court to procure five hundred pounds of his arrears for less would not settle him in the college and the want of such a sum wrinkled his face with care twas his own expression and that money being procured he should the next day after find him in his college and invidiae remedium writ over his study door this money being part of his arrears was by his own and the help of honest nicholas pay's interest in court quickly procured him and he as quickly in the college the place where indeed his happiness then seemed to have its beginning the college being to his mind as a quiet harbour to a seafaring man after a tempestuous voyage where by the bounty of the pious founder his very food and raiment were plentifully provided for him in kind and more money than enough where he was freed from all corroding cares and seated on such a rock as the waves of want could not probably shake where he might sit in a calm and looking down behold the busy multitude turmoiled and tossed in a tempestuous sea of trouble and dangers and as sir william davenant has happily expressed the like of another person laugh at the graver business of the state which speaks men rather wise than fortunate being thus settled according to the desires of his heart his first study was the statutes of the college by which he conceived himself bound to enter into holy orders which he did being made deacon with all convenient speed shortly after which time as he came in his surplus from the church service an old friend a person of quality met him so attired and joyed him of his new habit to whom sir henry wotton replied i thank god and the king by whose goodness i am now in this condition a condition which that emperor charles v seemed to approve who after so many remarkable victories when his victory was great in the eyes of all men freely gave up his crown and the many cares that attended it to philip his son making a holy retreat to a cloistral life where he might by devout meditations consult with god which the rich or busy men seldom do and have leisure both to examine the errors of his life past and prepare for that great day wherein all flesh must make an account of their actions and after a kind of tempestuous life i now have the like advantage from him that makes the outgoings of the morning to praise him even from my god whom I daily magnify for this particular mercy of an exemption from business, a quiet mind, and a liberal maintenance, even in this part of my life, when my age and infirmities seem to sound me a retreat from the pleasures of this world, and invite me to contemplation in which I have ever taken the greatest felicity. And now to speak a little of the employment of his time in the college after his customary public devotions his use was to retire into his study and there to spend some hours in reading the bible and authors in divinity closing up his meditations with private prayer this was for the most part his employment in the forenoon but when he was once set to dinner then nothing but cheerful thoughts possessed his mind and those still increased by constant company at his table of such persons as brought thither additions both of learning and pleasure 
but some part of most days was usually spent in philosophical conclusions. Nor did he forget his innate pleasure of angling, which he would usually call his idle time not idly spent, saying often he would rather live five May months than forty Decembers. He was a great lover of his neighbors, and a bountiful entertainer of them very often at his table, where his meat was choice and his discourse better. He was a constant cherisher of all those youths in that school in whom he found either a constant diligence or a genius that prompted them to learning, for whose encouragement he was beside many other things of necessity and beauty, at the charge of setting up in it two rows of pillars, on which he caused to be choicely drawn the pictures of diverse of the most famous Greek and Latin historians, poets, and orators, persuading them not to neglect rhetoric, because Almighty God has left mankind affections to be wrought upon. And he would often say, that none despised eloquence but such dull souls as were not capable of it. He would also often make choice of some observations out of these historians and poets, and would never leave the school without dropping some choice Greek or Latin apothem or sentence that might be worthy of a room in the memory of a growing scholar. He was pleased constantly to breed up one or more hopeful youths, which he picked out of the school and took into his own domestic care, and to attend him at his meals, out of whose discourse and behavior he gathered observations for the better completing of his intended work of education, of which, by his still striving to make the whole better, he lived to leave but part to posterity. He was a great enemy to wrangling disputes of religion, concerning which I shall say a little, both to testify that and to show the readiness of his wit. Having, at his being in Rome, made acquaintance with a pleasant priest who invited him one evening to hear their vesper music at church, the priest, seeing Sir Henry stand obscurely in a corner, sends to him by a boy of the choir this question writ on a small piece of paper where was your religion to be found before luther to which question sir henry presently underwrit my religion was to be found then where yours is not to be found now in the written word of god the next vesper sir henry went purposely to the same church and sent one of the choir-boys with this question to his honest, pleasant friend, the priest. Do you believe all those many thousands of poor Christians were damned that were excommunicated because the Pope and the Duke of Venice could not agree about their temporal power, even those poor Christians that knew not why they quarreled? Speak your conscience. To which he underwrit in French, Monsieur, excusez-moi. To one that asked him whether a papist may be saved, he replied, You may be saved without knowing that. Look to yourself. To another, whose earnestness exceeded his knowledge and was still railing against the papists, he gave this advice. Pray, sir, forbear till you have studied the points better, for the wise Italians have this proverb. He that understands amiss concludes worse. And take heed of thinking, the farther you go from the Church of Rome, the nearer you are to God. And to another that spake indiscreet and bitter words against Arminius, I heard him reply to this purpose. In my travel towards Venice, as I passed through Germany, I rested almost a year at Leiden, where I entered into an acquaintance with Arminius, then the professor of divinity in that university, a man much talked of in this age, which is made up of opposition and controversy. And, indeed, if I mistake not Arminius in his expressions, as so weak a brain as mine is may easily do, 
then I know I differ from him in some points. Yet I profess my judgment of him to be that he was a man of most rare learning, and I knew him to be of a most strict life and of a most meek spirit. And that he was so mild appears by his proposals to our master Perkins of Cambridge, from whose book of the Order and Causes of Salvation, which first was writ in Latin, Arminius took the occasion of writing some queries to him concerning the consequence of his doctrine, intending them, tis said, to come privately to Mr. Perkins' own hands, and to receive from him a like private and a like loving answer. But Mr. Perkins died before these queries came to him, and tis thought Arminius meant them to die with him, for though he lived long after, I have heard he forbore to publish them, but since his death his sons did not. And tis pity, if God had been so pleased that Mr. Perkins did not live to see, consider, and answer those proposals himself, for he was also of a most meek spirit, and of great and sanctified learning and though since their deaths many of high parts and piety have undertaken to clear the controversy yet for the most part they have rather satisfied themselves than convinced the dissenting party and doubtless many middle-witted men which yet may mean well many scholars that are in the highest form for learning which yet may preach well men that are but preachers and shall never know till they come to heaven where the questions stick betwixt arminius and the church of england if there be any will yet in this world be tampering with and thereby perplexing the controversy and do therefore justly fall under the rebuke of saint jude for being busybodies and for meddling with things they understand not and here it offers itself I think not unfitly, to tell the reader that a friend of Sir Henry Wotton's, being designed for the employment of an ambassador, came to Eton and requested from him some experimental rules for his prudent and safe carriage in his negotiations, to whom he smilingly gave this for an infallible aphorism, that to be in safety himself and serviceable to his country he should always and upon all occasions speak the truth. It seems a state paradox. For, says Sir Henry Wotton, you shall never be believed, and by this means your truth will secure yourself, if you shall ever be called to any account, and it will also put your adversaries, who will still hunt counter, to a loss in all their disquisitions and undertakings many more of this nature might be observed but they must be laid aside for i shall here make a little stop and invite the reader to look back with me whilst according to my promise i shall say a little of sir albertus morton and mr william beadle whom i formerly mentioned i have told you that are my reader that at sir henry wotton's first going ambassador into italy his cousin, Sir Albertus Morton, went his secretary. And I am next to tell you that Sir Albertus died secretary of state to our late king, but cannot, am not able to express the sorrow that possessed Sir Henry Wotton at his first hearing the news that Sir Albertus was by death lost to him and this world and yet the reader may partly guess by these following expressions the first in a letter to his nicholas pay of which this that followeth is a part and my dear nicholas when i had been there almost a fortnight in the midst of my great contentment i received notice of sir albertus morton his departure out of this world who was dearer to me than mine own being in it what a wound it is to my heart you that knew him and know me will easily believe but our creator's will must be done and unrepiningly received by his own creatures who is the lord of all nature and of all fortune when he taketh to himself now one and then another 
till that expected day wherein it shall please him to dissolve the whole, and wrap up even the heaven itself as a scroll of parchment. This is the last philosophy that we must study upon earth. Let us, therefore, that yet remain here, as our days and friends waste, reinforce our love to each other, which of all virtues, both spiritual and moral, hath the highest privilege, because death itself cannot end it. And my good Nicholas, and so forth. This is a part of his sorrow thus expressed to his Nicholas Pay. The other part is in this following elegy, of which the reader may safely conclude it was too hearty to be dissembled. Tears wept at the grave of Sir Albertus Morton by Henry Wotton. Silence in truth would speak my sorrow best, for deepest wounds can least their feeling tell. Yet let me borrow from mine own unrest a time to bid him whom I loved farewell. O oh, my unhappy lines, you that before have served my youth to vent some wanton cries, and now, congealed with grief, can scarce implore strength to accent, here my Albertus lies. This is that sable stone, this is the cave and womb of earth that doth his course embrace. While others sing his praise, let me engrave these bleeding numbers to adorn the place. Here will I paint the characters of woe, here will I pay my tribute to the dead, and here my faithful tears in showers shall flow to humanize the flints on which I tread. Where, though I mourn my matchless loss alone, and none between my weakness judge and me, yet even these pensive walls allow my moan, whose doleful echoes to my plaints agree. But is he gone, and live I rhyming here, as if some muse would listen to my lay, when all distuned sit waiting for their dear, and bathe the banks where he was wont to play? Dwell, then, in endless bliss, with happy souls, discharged from nature's and from fortune's trust. Whilst on this fluid globe my hour-glass rolls, and runs the rest of my remaining dust. Henry Wotton This Concerning His Sir Albertus Morton End of Chapter 2, Part 2 Chapter Two of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Dunn, Henry Walton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Henry Walton, Part Three. And for what I shall say concerning Mr. William Beadle, I must prepare the reader by telling him that when King James sent Sir Henry Wotton ambassador to the state of Venice, he sent also an ambassador to the King of France, and another to the King of Spain. With the ambassador of France went Joseph Hall, late Bishop of Norwich, whose many and useful works speak his great merit. With the ambassador to Spain went James Wadsworth, and with Sir Henry Wotton went William Beadle. These three chaplains to these three ambassadors were all bred in one university, all of one college, Emmanuel College in Cambridge, all beneficed in one diocese, and all most dear and entire friends. But in Spain Mr. Wadsworth met with temptations or reasons such as were so powerful as to persuade him who of the three was formerly observed to be the most averse to that religion that calls itself Catholic, to disclaim himself a member of the Church of England, and to declare himself for the Church of Rome, 
discharging himself of his attendance on the ambassador, and betaking himself to a monasterial life in which he lived very regularly, and so died. When Dr. Hall, the late Bishop of Norwich, came into England, he wrote to Mr. Wadsworth, it is the first epistle in his printed decades, to persuade his return, or to show the reason of his apostasy. The letter seemed to have in it many sweet expressions of love, and yet there was in it some expression that was so unpleasant to Mr. Wadsworth that he chose rather to acquaint his old friend Mr. Beadle with his motives, by which means there passed betwixt Mr. Beadle and Mr. Wadsworth diverse letters which be extant in print, and did well deserve it, for in them there seems to be a controversy, not of religion only, but who should answer each other with most love and meekness, which I mention the rather, because it too seldom falls out to be so in a book war. There is yet a little more to be said of Mr. Beadle, for the greater part of which the reader is referred to this following letter of Sir Henry Wotton's, written to our late King Charles I. May it please your most gracious majesty, having been informed that certain persons have, by the good wishes of the Archbishop of Armagh, been directed hither with a most humble petition unto your majesty, that you will be pleased to make Mr. William Beadle, now resident upon a small benefice in Suffolk, governor of your college at Dublin, for the good of that society, and myself being required to render unto your majesty some testimony of the said William Beadle, who was long my chaplain at Venice, in the time of my first employment there, I am bound in all conscience and truth, so far as your majesty will vouchsafe to accept my poor judgment, to affirm of him that I think hardly a fitter man for that charge could have been propounded unto your majesty, in your whole kingdom, for singular erudition and piety, conformity to the rites of the church, and zeal to advance the cause of God, wherein his travails abroad were not obscure in the time of the excommunication of the Venetians. For it may please your majesty to know that this is the man whom Padre Paolo took, I may say, into his very soul, with whom he did communicate the inwardest thoughts of his heart, from whom he professed to have received more knowledge in all divinity, both scholastical and positive, than from any that he ever practised in his days, of which all the passages were well known to the king your father of most blessed memory. And so, with your majesty's good favour, I will end this needless office, for the general fame of his learning, his life, and Christian temper, and those religious labours which himself hath dedicated to your majesty, do better describe him than I am able. Your majesty's most humble and faithful servant, H. Wotton. To this letter I shall add this, that he was, to the great joy of Sir Henry Wotton, made governor of the said college, August 1627, and that, after a fair discharge of his duty and trust there, he was thence removed to be Bishop of Kilmore, September 3, 1629. In both places his life was so holy as seemed to equal the primitive Christians, for as they, so he kept all the ember weeks observed, besides his private devotions, the canonical hours of prayer very strictly, and so he did all the feasts and fast days of his mother, the Church of England, to which I may add that his patience and charity were both such as showed his affections were set upon things that are above. For indeed his whole life brought forth the fruits of the Spirit, there being in him such a remarkable meekness, that as St. Paul advised his Timothy in the election of a bishop, that he have a good report of those that be without. First Timothy 3, 7. So had he 
for those that were without even those that in point of religion were of the roman persuasion of which there were very many in his diocese did yet such is the power of visible piety ever look upon him with respect and reverence and testified it by a concealing and safe protecting him from death in the late horrid rebellion in ireland when the fury of the wild irish knew no distinction of persons and yet there and then he was protected and cherished by those of a contrary persuasion and there and then he died not by violence or misusage but by grief in a quiet prison sixteen forty two and with him was lost many of his learned writings which were thought worthy of preservation and amongst the rest was lost the bible which by many years labour and conference and study he had translated into the irish tongue with an intent to have printed it for public use more might be said of mr beadle who, I told the reader, was Sir Henry Wotton's first chaplain. And much of his second chaplain, Isaac Bargrave, doctor in divinity, and the late learned and hospitable Dean of Canterbury, as also of the merits of many others that had the happiness to attend Sir Henry in his foreign employments, but the reader may think that in this digression I have already carried him too far from Eton College, and therefore I shall lead him back, as gently and as orderly as I may, to that place, for a further conference concerning Sir Henry Wotton. Sir Henry Wotton had proposed to himself, before he entered into his collegiate life, to write The Life of Martin Luther and in it the history of the Reformation, as it was carried on in Germany, for the doing of which he had many advantages by his several embassies into these parts, and his interest in the several princes of the empire, by whose means he had access to the records of all the Hans towns, and the knowledge of many secret passages that fell not under common view and in these he had made a happy progress, as was well known to his worthy friend Dr. Duppa, the late Reverend Bishop of Salisbury. But in the midst of this design, his late Majesty, King Charles I, that knew the value of Sir Henry Wotton's pen, did, by a persuasive loving violence, to which may be added a promise of five hundred pound a year, force him to lay luther aside and betake himself to write the history of england in which he proceeded to write some short characters of a few kings as a foundation upon which he meant to build but for the present meant to be more large in the story of henry the sixth the founder of that college in which he then enjoyed all the worldly happiness of his present being but Sir Henry died in the midst of this undertaking, and the footsteps of his labours are not recoverable by a more than common diligence. This is some account both of his inclination and the employment of his time in the college, where he seemed to have his youth renewed by a continual conversation with that learned society, and a daily recourse of other friends of choicest breeding, and parts by which that great blessing of a cheerful heart was still maintained he being always free even to the last of his days from that peevishness which usually attends age and yet his mirth was sometimes damped by the remembrance of diverse old debts partly contracted in his foreign employments for which his just arrears due from the king would have made satisfaction but being still delayed with court promises and finding some decays of health he did about two years before his death out of a christian desire that none should be a loser by him make his last will concerning which a doubt still remains namely whether it discovered more holy wit or conscionable policy but there is no doubt but that his chief design was a Christian endeavour that his debts might be satisfied. 
and that it may remain as such a testimony and a legacy to those that loved him i shall here impart it to the reader as it was found written with his own hand in the name of god almighty and all merciful i henry wotton provost of his majesty's college by eton being mindful of mine own mortality which the sin of our first parents did bring upon all flesh do by this last will and testament thus dispose of myself and the poor things i shall leave in this world my soul i bequeath to the immortal god my maker father of our lord jesus christ my blessed redeemer and mediator through his all soul sufficient satisfaction for the sins of the whole world and efficient for his elect in the number of whom i am one by his mere grace and therefore most unremovably assured by his holy spirit the true eternal comforter my body i bequeath to the earth if i should end my transitory days at or near eton to be buried in the chapel of the said college as the fellows shall dispose thereof with whom i have lived my god knows in all loving affection or if i shall die near bockton mallerby in the county of kent then i wish to be laid in that parish church as near as may be to the sepulchre of my good father expecting a joyful resurrection with him in the day of christ after this account of his faith and this surrender of his soul to that god that inspired it and this direction for the disposal of his body he proceeded to appoint that his executors should lay over his grave a marble stone plain and not costly and considering that time moulders even marble to dust for monuments themselves must die therefore did he waving the common way think it fit rather to preserve his name to which the son of sirach adviseth all men by a useful apothem than by a large enumeration of his descent or merits of both which he might justly have boasted but he was content to forget them and did choose only this prudent pious sentence to discover his disposition and preserve his memory it was directed by him to be thus inscribed hic jacet huius sententiae primus autor disputande puritis ecclesiarum scabies nomen alias quare which may be Englished thus, here lies the first author of this sentence, the itch of disputation will prove the scab of the church, inquire his name elsewhere. And if any shall object, as I think some have, that Sir Henry Wotton was not the first author of this sentence, but that this or a sentence like it was long before his time, to him I answer that Solomon says, Nothing can be spoken that hath not been spoken, for there is no new thing under the sun. But grant that in his various reading he had met with this or a like sentence, yet reason mixed with charity should persuade all readers to believe that Sir Henry Wotton's mind was then so fixed on that part of the communion of saints which is above, that a holy lethargy did surprise his memory. For doubtless, if he had not believed himself to be the first author of what he said, he was too prudent first to own and then expose it to public view and censor of every critic. And, questionless, it will be charity in all readers to think his mind was then so fixed on heaven that a holy zeal did transport him, and that in this sacred ecstasy his thoughts were then only of the church triumphant into which he daily expected his admission, and that Almighty God was then pleased to make him a prophet to tell the church militant, and particularly that part of it in this nation where the weeds of controversy grow to be daily both more numerous and more destructive to humble piety, 
and where men have consciences that boggle at ceremonies, and yet scruple not to speak and act such sins as the ancient humble Christians believed to be a sin to think, and where our reverend Hooker says, former simplicity and softness of spirit is not now to be found, because zeal hath drowned charity, skill, and meekness. It will be good to think that these sad changes have proved this epitaph to be a useful caution unto us of this nation, and the sad effects thereof in Germany have proved it to be a mournful truth. This by way of observation concerning his epitaph. The rest of his will follows in his own words. Further, I, the said Henry Wotton, do constitute and ordain to be joint executors of this my last will and testament my two grand-nephews, Albert Morton, second son of Sir Robert Morton, knight, late deceased, and Thomas Bargrave, eldest son to Dr. Bargrave, dean of Canterbury, husband to my right virtuous and only niece. And I do pray the foresaid Dr. Bargrave and Mr. Nicholas Pay, my most faithful and chosen friends, together with Mr. John Harrison, one of the fellows of Eton College, best acquainted with my books and pictures and other utensils, to be supervisors of this my last will and testament. And I do pray the foresaid Dr. Bargrave and Mr. Nicholas Pay, to be solicitors for such arrearages as shall appear due unto me from His Majesty's Exchequer at the time of my death, and to assist my forenamed executors in some reasonable and conscientious satisfaction of my creditors, and discharge of my legacies now specified, or that shall be hereafter added unto this my testament by any codicil or schedule, or left in the hands, or in any memorial with the aforesaid Mr. John Harrison. And first to my most dear sovereign and master of incomparable goodness, in whose gracious opinion I have ever had some portion, as far as the interest of a plain, honest man, I leave four pictures at large of those Dukes of Venice, in whose time I was there employed, with their names written on the back side, which hang in my great ordinary dining-room, done after the life by Eduardo Fialetto. Otherwise a table of the Venetian College, where ambassadors had their audience, hanging over the mantel of the chimney in the said room, done by the same hand, which containeth a draught in little well resembling the famous Duke Leonardo Donato, in a time which needed a wise and constant man. Item, the picture of a Duke of Venice hanging over against the door, done either by Tiziano or some other principal hand long before my time, most humbly beseeching His Majesty, that the said pieces may remain in some corner of any of his houses for a poor memorial of his most humble vassal. Item. I leave his said majesty all the papers and negotiations of Sir Nicholas Throckmorton, knight, during his famous employment under Queen Elizabeth in Scotland and in France, which contain diverse secrets of state, that perchance his majesty will think fit to be preserved in his paper office, after they have been perused and sorted by Mr. Secretary Windebank, with whom I have heretofore, as I remember, conferred about them. They were committed to my disposal by Sir Arthur Throckmorton, his son, to whose worthy memory I cannot better discharge my faith than by assigning them to the highest place of trust. Item, I leave to our most gracious and virtuous Queen Mary, Dioscorides, with the plants naturally coloured, and the text translated by Matiolo, in the best language of Tuscany, whence her said majesty is lineally descended for a poor token of my thankful devotion for the honour she was once pleased to do my private study with her presence, 
I leave to the most hopeful prince the picture of the elected and crowned Queen of Bohemia, his aunt, of clear and resplendent virtues through the clouds of her fortune. To my lord's grace of Canterbury now being, I leave my picture of divine love, rarely copied from one in the king's galleries, of my presentation to his majesty, beseeching him to receive it as a pledge of my humble reverence to his great wisdom, and to the most worthy Lord Bishop of London, Lord High Treasurer of England, in true admiration of his Christian simplicity and contempt of earthly pomp, I leave a picture of Heraclitus bewailing and Democritus laughing at the world, most humbly beseeching the said Lord Archbishop, His Grace, and the Lord Bishop of London, of both whose favours I have tasted in my lifetime, to intercede with our most gracious Sovereign after my death, in the bowels of Jesus Christ, that out of compassionate memory of my long services, wherein I more studied the public honour than mine own utility, some order may be taken out of my arrears due in the exchequer for such satisfaction of my creditors as those whom I have ordained supervisors of this my last will and testament shall present unto their lordships without their further trouble, hoping likewise in His Majesty's most indubitable goodness that he will keep me from all prejudice, which I may otherwise suffer by any defect of formality in the demand of my said arrears. To blank, for a poor addition to his cabinet, I leave as emblems of his attractive virtues and obliging nobleness my great lodestone and a piece of amber of both kinds naturally united and only differing in degree of concoction, which is thought somewhat rare. Item. A piece of crystal sexangular, as they grow all, grasping diverse several things within it, which I bought among the Reation Alps, in the very place where it grew, recommending most humbly unto his lordship the reputation of my poor name in the point of my debts, as I have done to the aforenamed spiritual lords, and am heartily sorry that I have no better token of my humble thankfulness to his honoured person. Item. I leave to Sir Francis Windebank, one of His Majesty's principal secretaries of state, whom I found my great friend in point of necessity, the four seasons of old Bassanio, to hang near the eye in his parlour, being in little form, which I bought in Venice, where I first entered into his most worthy acquaintance. To the above-named Dr. Bargrave, Dean of Canterbury, I leave all my Italian books not disposed in this will. I leave to him likewise my Vio de Gamba, which hath been twice with me in Italy, in which country I first contracted with him an unremovable affection. To my other supervisor, Mr. Nicholas Pay, I leave my chest or cabinet of instruments and engines of all kinds of uses, in the lower box whereof are some fit to be bequeathed to none but so entire an honest man as he is. In it were Italian locks, picklocks, screws to force open doors, and many things of worth and rarity that he had gathered in his foreign travel. I leave him likewise forty pounds for his pains in the solicitation of my arrears, and am sorry that my ragged estate can reach no further to one that hath taken such care for me in the same kind during all my foreign employments. To the library of Eton College I leave all my manuscripts not before disposed, and to each of the fellows a plain ring of gold, enameled black, all save the verge, with this motto within, Amor unit omnia. This is my last will and testament, save what shall be added by a schedule thereunto annexed, written on the 1st of October, in the present year of our redemption, 1637, and subscribed by myself, with the testimony of these witnesses, 
Henry Wotton George Lash Nicholas Udert And now, because the mind of man is best satisfied by the knowledge of events, I think fit to declare that every one that was named in his will did gladly receive their legacies, by which, and his most just and passionate desires for the payment of his debts, they joined in assisting the overseers of his will, and by their joint endeavours to the king, than whom none was more willing, conscionable satisfaction was given for his just debts. The next thing wherewith I shall acquaint the reader is, that he went usually once a year, if not oftener, to the beloved Bockton Hall, where he would say, he found a cure for all cares by the cheerful company which he called the living furniture of that place, and a restoration of his strength by the connaturalness of that which he called his genial air. He yearly went also to Oxford, but the summer before his death he changed that for a journey to Winchester College, to which school he was first removed from Bockton and as he returned from Winchester towards Eton College, said to a friend, his companion in that journey, how useful was that advice of a holy monk who persuaded his friend to perform his customary devotions in a constant place, because in that place we usually meet with those very thoughts which possessed us at our last being there. And I find it thus far experimentally true that at my now being in that school, and seeing that very place where I sat when I was a boy, occasioned me to remember those very thoughts of my youth which then possessed me, sweet thoughts indeed, that promised my growing years numerous pleasures without mixtures of cares, and those to be enjoyed when time, which I therefore thought slow-paced, had changed my youth into manhood but age and experience have taught me that those were but empty hopes, for I have always found it true, as my Saviour did foretell, sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. Nevertheless, I saw there a succession of boys using the same recreations, and questionless, possessed with the same thoughts that then possessed me. Thus one generation succeeds another, both in their lives, recreations, hopes, fears, and death. After his return from Winchester to Eton, which was about five months before his death, he became much more retired and contemplative, in which time he was often visited by Mr. John Hales, learned Mr. John Hales, then a fellow of that college, to whom upon an occasion he spake to this purpose. I have in my passage to my grave met with most of those joys of which a discursive soul is capable, and been entertained with more inferior pleasures than the sons of men are usually made partakers of. Nevertheless, in this voyage I have not always floated on the calm sea of content, but have often met with cross-winds and storms, and with many troubles of mind and temptations to evil. And yet, though I have been and am a man compassed about with human frailties, Almighty God hath by His grace prevented me from making shipwreck of faith and a good conscience, the thought of which is now the joy of my heart, and I most humbly praise Him for it and I humbly acknowledge that it was not myself, but he that hath kept me to this great age, and let him take the glory of his great mercy. And, my dear friend, I now see that I draw near my harbour of death, that harbour that will secure me from all the future storms and waves of this restless world, and I praise God I am willing to leave it, and expect a better, that world, wherein dwelleth righteousness, and I long for it. These and the like expressions were then uttered by him at the beginning of a feverish distemper, at which time he was also troubled with an asthma or short-spitting, but after less than twenty fits, 
by the help of familiar physic and a spare diet this fever abated, yet so as to leave him much weaker than it found him, and his asthma seemed also to be overcome in a good degree by his forbearing tobacco, which, as many thoughtful men do, he also had taken somewhat immoderately. This was his then present condition, and thus he continued till about the end of October, 1639, which was about a month before his death, at which time he again fell into a fever, which, though he seemed to recover, yet these still left him so weak that they and those other common infirmities that accompany age were wont to visit him like civil friends, and after some short time to leave him, came now both oftener and with more violence, and at last took up their constant habitation with him, still weakening his body and abating his cheerfulness, of both which he grew more sensible, and did the oftener retire into his study, and there made many papers that had passed his pen, both in the days of his youth and in the busy part of his life, useless by a fire made there to that purpose. These and several unusual expressions to his servants and friends seemed to foretell that the day of his death drew near, for which he seemed, to those many friends that observed him, to be well prepared, and to be both patient and free from all fear, as several of his letters writ on this his last sick-bed may testify. And thus he continued till about the beginning of December following, at which time he was seized more violently with a quotidian fever, in the tenth fit of which fever his better part, that part of Sir Henry Wotton which could not die, put off mortality with as much content and cheerfulness as human frailty is capable of, being then in great tranquillity of mind, and in perfect peace with God and man. And thus the circle of Sir Henry Wotton's life, that circle which began at Bockton, and in the circumference thereof, did first touch at Winchester School, then at Oxford, and after upon so many remarkable parts and passages in Christendom, that circle of his life was by death thus closed up and completed in the seventy and second year of his age at Eton College, where, according to his will, he now lies buried with his motto on a plain gravestone over him, dying worthy of his name and family, worthy of the love and favor of so many princes and persons of eminent wisdom and learning, worthy of the trust committed unto him for the service of his prince and country. And all readers are requested to believe that he was worthy of a more worthy pen to have preserved his memory and commended his merits to the imitation of posterity. Isaac Walton End of chapter 2, part 3Chapter 3 of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Dunn, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Richard Hooker, Part 1 Life of Mr. Richard Hooker Introduction I have been persuaded by a friend whom I reverence and ought to obey to write the life of Richard Hooker, the happy author of five, if not more, of the eight learned books of The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. And though I have undertaken it, yet it hath been with some unwillingness, because I foresee that it must prove to me, and especially at this time of my age, a work of much labor to inquire, consider, research, and determine what is needful to be known concerning him for I knew him not in his life, and must therefore not only look back to his death, now sixty-four years past, 
but almost fifty years beyond that, even to his childhood and youth, and gather thence some observations and prognostics as may at least adorn, if not prove necessary, for the completing of what I have undertaken. This trouble I foresee, and foresee also that it is impossible to escape censures against which I will not hope my well-meaning and diligence can protect me. For I consider the age in which I live, and shall therefore but entreat of my reader a suspension of his censures till I have made known unto him some reasons which I myself would now gladly believe do make me in some measure fit for this undertaking, and if these reasons shall not acquit me from all censures, they may at least abate of their severity, and this is all I can probably hope for. My reasons follow. About forty years past, for I am now past the seventieth of my age, I began a happy affinity with William Cramner, now with God, grand-nephew unto the great archbishop of that name, a family of noted prudence and resolution. With him and two of his sisters I had an entire and free friendship. One of them was the wife of Dr. Spencer, a bosom friend and sometime calm pupil with Mr. Hooker, in Corpus Christi College in Oxford, and after president of the same. I name them here, for that I shall have occasion to mention them in the following discourse, as also George Cramner, their brother, of whose useful abilities my reader may have a more authentic testimony than my pen can purchase for him, by that of our learned Camden and others. This William Cramner and his two forenamed sisters had some affinity and a most familiar friendship with Mr. Hooker, and had had some part of their education with him in his house when he was a parson of bishops born, near Canterbury, in which city their good father then lived. They had, I say, a part of their education with him, as myself since that time, a happy cohabitation with them. And having some years before read part of Mr. Hooker's works, with great liking and satisfaction, my affection to them made me a diligent inquisitor into many things that concerned him. Inquiry hath given me much advantage in the knowledge of what is now under my consideration, and intended for the satisfaction of my reader. I had also a friendship with the Rev. Dr. Usher, the late learned Archbishop of Armagh, and with Dr. Morton, the late learned and charitable Bishop of Durham, as also with the learned John Hales of Eton College, and with them also, who loved the very name of Mr. Hooker, I have had many discourses concerning him and from them and many others that have now put off mortality, I might have had more informations if I could then have admitted a thought of any fitness for what by persuasion I have now undertaken. But though that full harvest be irrecoverably lost, yet my memory hath preserved some gleanings, and my diligence made such additions to them as I hope will prove useful to the completing of what I intend, in the discovery of which I shall be faithful, and with this assurance put a period to my introduction. It is not to be doubted, but that Richard Hooker was born at Heavy Tree, near or within the precincts, or in the city of Exeter a city which may justly boast that it was the birthplace of him and Sir Thomas Bodley, as indeed the county may, in which it stands, that it hath furnished this nation with Bishop Jewell, Sir Francis Drake, Sir Walter Raleigh, and many others, memorable for their valour and learning. He was born about the year of our redemption, 1553, and of parents that were not so remarkable for their extraction or riches as for their virtue and industry, and God's blessing upon both, by which they were enabled to educate their children in some degree of learning, 
of which our Richard Hooker may appear to be one fair testimony, and that nature is not so partial as always to give the great blessings of wisdom and learning, and with them the greater blessings of virtue and government, to those only that are of a more high and honourable birth. His complexion, if we may guess by him at the age of forty, was sanguine with a mixture of choler, and yet his motion was slow even in his youth, and so was his speech, never expressing an earnestness in either of them, but a humble gravity suitable to the aged. And it is observed, so far as inquiry is able to look back at this distance of time, that at his being a schoolboy he was an early questionist, quietly inquisitive why this was and that was not to be remembered, why this was granted and that denied. This being mixed with a remarkable modesty and a sweet serene quietness of nature, and with them a quick apprehension of many perplexed parts of learning, imposed then upon him as a scholar, made his master and others to believe him to have an inward blessed divine light, and therefore to consider him to be a little wonder. For in that children were less pregnant, less confident, and more malleable than in this wiser but not better age. This meekness and conjuncture of knowledge, with modesty in his conversation, being observed by his schoolmaster, caused him to persuade his parents, who intended him for an apprentice, to continue him at school till he could find out some means by persuading his rich uncle, or some other charitable person, to ease them of a part of their care and charge assuring them that their son was so enriched with the blessings of nature and grace that God seemed to single him out as a special instrument of his glory. And the good man told them also that he would double his diligence in instructing him, and would neither expect nor receive any other reward than the content of so hopeful and happy an employment. This was not unwelcome news, and especially to his mother, to whom he was a dutiful and dear child, and all parties were so pleased with this proposal that it was resolved so it should be. And in the meantime his parents and master laid a foundation for his future happiness by instilling into his soul the seeds of piety, those conscientious principles of loving and fearing God of an early belief that he knows the very secrets of our souls, that he punishes our vices and rewards our innocence, that we should be free from hypocrisy, and appear to man what we are to God, because first or last the crafty man is catched in his own snare. These seeds of piety were so seasonably planted and so continually watered with the daily dew of God's blessed Spirit, that his infant virtues grew into such holy habits as did make him grow daily into more and more favour, both with God and man, which, with the great learning that he did after attain to, hath made Richard Hooker honoured in this, and will continue him to be so to succeeding generations. This good schoolmaster, whose name I am not able to recover, and am sorry, for that I would have given him a better memorial in this humble monument, dedicated to the memory of his scholar, was very solicitous with John Hooker, then Chamberlain of Exeter, and uncle to our Richard, to take his nephew into his care, and to maintain him for one year at the university and in the meantime to use his endeavours to procure an admission for him into some college, though it were but in a mean degree, still urging and assuring him that his charge would not continue long, for the lad's learning and manners were both so remarkable that they must of necessity be taken notice of, 
and that doubtless God would provide him some second patron that would free him and his parents from their future care and charge. These reasons, with the affectionate rhetoric of his good master, and God's blessing upon both, procured from his uncle a faithful promise that he would take him into his care and charge before the expiration of the year following, which was performed by him, and with the assistance of the learned Mr. John Jewell, of whom this may be noted, that he left, or was about the first, of Queen Mary's reign expelled out of Corpus Christi College in Oxford, of which he was a fellow, for adhering to the truth of those principles of religion to which he had assented and given testimony in the days of her brother and predecessor, Edward the Sixth, And this John Jewell, having within a short time after a just cause to fear a more heavy punishment than expulsion, was forced, by forsaking this, to seek safety in another nation, and with that safety the enjoyment of that doctrine and worship for which he suffered. But the cloud of that persecution and fear, ending with the life of Queen Mary, the affairs of the church and state did then look more clear and comfortable, so that he, and with him many others of the same judgment, made a happy return to England about the first of Queen Elizabeth, in which year this John Jewell was sent a commissioner or visitor of the churches of the western parts of this kingdom, and especially of those in Devonshire, in which county he was born and then and there he contracted friendship with john hooker the uncle of our richard about the second or third year of her reign this john jewell was made bishop of salisbury and there being always observed in him a willingness to do good and to oblige his friends and now a power added to his willingness this john hooker gave him a visit in salisbury and besought him for charity's sake to look favourably upon a poor nephew of his whom nature had fitted for a scholar but the estate of his parents was so narrow that they were unable to give him the advantage of learning and that the bishop would therefore become his patron and prevent him from being a tradesman for he was a boy of remarkable hopes and though the bishop new men do not usually look with an indifferent eye upon their own children and relations yet he assented so far to john hooker that he appointed the boy and his schoolmaster should attend him about easter next following at that place which was done accordingly and then after some questions and observations of the boy's learning and gravity and behaviour the bishop gave his schoolmaster a reward, and took order for an annual pension for the boy's parents, promising also to take him into his care for a future preferment which he performed. For about the fifteenth year of his age, which was anno 1567, he was by the bishop appointed to remove to Oxford, and there to attend Dr. Cole, then president of Corpus Christi College. Which he did, and Dr. Cole had, according to a promise made to the bishop, provided for him both a tutor, which was said to be the learned Dr. John Reynolds, and a clerk's place in that college, which place, though it were not of full maintenance, yet with the contribution of his uncle, and the continued pension of his patron, the good bishop gave him a comfortable subsistence. And in this condition he continued unto the eighteenth year of his age, still increasing in learning and prudence, and so much in humility and piety, that he seemed to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and even, like St. John Baptist, to be sanctified from his mother's womb, who did often bless the day in which she bare him. About this time of his age he fell into a dangerous sickness, which lasted two months, all which time his mother, having notice of it, did in her hourly prayers as earnestly beg his life of God 
as Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, did that he might become a true Christian, and their prayers were both so heard as to be granted, which Mr. Hooker would often mention with much joy, and as often pray that he might never live to occasion any sorrow to so good a mother, of whom he would often say he loved her so dearly that he would endeavor to be good even as much for hers as for his own sake. As soon as he was perfectly recovered from this sickness, he took a journey from Oxford to Exeter to satisfy and see his good mother, being accompanied with a countryman and companion of his own college, and both on foot, which was then either more in fashion, or want of money, or their humility made it so. But on foot they went, and took Salisbury in their way, purposely to see the good bishop who made Mr. Hooker and his companion dine with him at his own table, which Mr. Hooker boasted of with much joy and gratitude when he saw his mother and friends. And at the bishop's parting with him, the bishop gave him good counsel and his benediction, but forgot to give him money, which when the bishop had considered, he sent a servant in all haste to call Richard back to him and at Richard's return the bishop said to him, Richard, I sent for you back to lend you a horse which hath carried me many a mile, and I thank God with much ease, and presently delivered into his hand a walking-staff with which he professed he had travelled through many parts of Germany. And he said, Richard, I do not give but lend you my horse. Be sure you be honest, and bring my horse back to me at your return this way to Oxford, and I do now give you ten groats to bear your charges to Exeter, and here is ten groats more which I charge you to deliver to your mother, and tell her I send her a bishop's benediction with it, and beg the continuance of her prayers for me. And if you bring my horse back to me, I will give you ten groats more to carry you on foot to the college, and so God bless you, good Richard." And this, you may believe, was performed by both parties. But alas, the next news that followed Mr. Hooker to Oxford was that his learned and charitable patron had changed this for a better life, which happy change may be believed for that as he lived so he died, in devout meditation and prayer, and in both so zealously that it became a religious question whether his last ejaculations or his soul did first enter into heaven. And now Mr. Hooker became a man of sorrow and fear, of sorrow for the loss of so dear and comfortable a patron and of fear for his future subsistence. But Dr. Cole raised his spirits from this dejection by bidding him go cheerfully to his studies, and assuring him he should neither want food nor raiment, which was the utmost of his hopes, for he would become his patron. And so he was for about nine months, and not longer, for about that time this following accident did befall Mr. Hooker. Edwin Sandys, sometimes Bishop of London and after Archbishop of York, had also been, in the days of Queen Mary, forced by forsaking this to seek safety in another nation, where for some years Bishop Jewell and he were companions at bed and board in Germany, and where, in this their exile, they did often eat the bread of sorrow, and by that means they there began such a friendship as lasted till the death of Bishop Jewell, which was in September 1571. A little before which time the two bishops meeting, Jewell had an occasion to begin a story of his Richard Hooker, and in it gave such a character of his learning and manners that though Bishop Sandys was educated in Cambridge, where he had obliged, and had many friends, yet his resolution was that his son Edwin 
should be sent to Corpus Christi College in Oxford, and by all means be pupil to Mr. Hooker, though his son Edwin was not much younger than Mr. Hooker then was. For the bishop said, I will have a tutor for my son that shall teach him learning by instruction and virtue by example, and my greatest care shall be of the last, and God willing, this Richard Hooker shall be the man into whose hands I will commit my Edwin. And the bishop did so about twelve months, or not much longer, after this resolution. And doubtless, as to these two, a better choice could not be made. For Mr. Hooker was now in the nineteenth year of his age, had spent five in the university, and had, by a constant unwearied diligence, attained unto a perfection in all the learned languages, by the help of which an excellent tutor and his unintermitted studies, he had made the subtlety of all the arts easy and familiar to him, and useful for the discovery of such learning as lay hid from common searchers so that by these, added to his great reason, and his restless industry, added to both, he did not only know more of causes and effects, but what he knew, he knew better than other men. And with this knowledge he had a most blessed and clear method of demonstrating what he knew, to the great advantage of all his pupils, which in time were many, but especially to his two first, his dear Edwin Sandys, and his dear George Cramner, of which there will be a fair testimony in the ensuing relation. This for Mr. Hooker's learning, and for his behavior, amongst other testimonies, this still remains of him, that in four years he was but twice absent from the chapel prayers, and that his behavior there was such as showed an awful reverence of that God, which he then worshipped and prayed to, giving all outward testimonies that his affections were set on heavenly things. This was his behavior towards God, and for that to man it is observable that he was never known to be angry, or passionate, or extreme in any of his desires, never heard to repine or dispute with providence, but by a quiet, gentle submission and resignation of his will to the wisdom of his Creator, bore the burden of the day with patience, never heard to utter an uncomely word, and by this, and a great behavior which is a divine charm, he begot an early reverence unto his person, even from those that at other times, and in other companies, took a liberty to cast off that strictness of behavior and discourse that is required in a collegiate life. And when he took any liberty to be pleasant, his wit was never blemished with scoffing, or the utterance of any conceit that bordered upon, or might beget, a thought of looseness in his hearers. Thus mild, thus innocent and exemplary, was his behavior in his college and thus this good man continued till his death, still increasing in learning, in patience, and piety. In this nineteenth year of his age, he was, December 24, 1573, admitted to be one of the twenty scholars of the foundation, being elected and so admitted as born in Devon or Hampshire, out of which counties a certain number are to be elected in vacancies by the founder's statutes. And now, as he was much encouraged, so now he was perfectly incorporated into this beloved college, which was then noted for an eminent library, strict students, and remarkable scholars. And indeed it may glory that it had Cardinal Poole, but more that it had Bishop Jewell, Dr. John Reynolds, and Dr. Thomas Jackson, of that foundation. The first famous for his learned Apology for the Church of England, and his defense of it against Harding. 
the second for the learned and wise manage of a public dispute with john hart of the romish persuasion about the head and faith of the church and after printed by consent of both parties and the third for his most excellent exposition of the creed and other treatises all such as have given great satisfaction to men of the greatest learning nor was dr jackson more noteworthy for his learning than for his strict and pious life testified by his abundant love and meekness and charity to all men and in the year fifteen seventy six february twenty three mr hooker's grace was given him for inceptor of arts dr herbert westphaling a man of note for learning being then vice-chancellor and the act following he was completed master which was anno 1577 his patron dr cole being vice-chancellor that year and his dear friend henry savile of merton college being then one of the proctors twas that harry savile that after was sir henry savile warden of merton college and provost of eton he which founded in oxford two famous lectures and endowed them with liberal maintenance it was that sir henry savile that translated and enlightened the history of cornelius tacitus with a most excellent comment and enriched the world by his laborious and chargeable collecting the scattered pieces of st chrysostom and the publication of them in one entire body in greek in which language he was a most judicious critic it was this sir henry savile that had the happiness to be a contemporary and familiar friend to mr hooker and let posterity know it and in this year of fifteen seventy seven he was so happy as to be admitted fellow of the college happy also in being the contemporary and friend of that dr john reynolds of whom i have lately spoken and of dr spencer both which were after and successively made presidents of corpus christi college men of great learning and merit and famous in their generations nor was mr hooker more happy in his contemporaries of his time and college than in the pupilage and friendship of his edwin sandys and george cramner of whom my reader may note that this edwin sandys was after sir edwin sandys and as famous for his speculum europae as his brother george for making posterity beholden to his pen by a learned relation and comment on his dangerous and remarkable travels and for his harmonious translation of the psalms of david the book of job and other poetical parts of holy writ into most high and elegant verse and for cramner his other pupil i shall refer my reader to the printed testimonies of our learned mr camden of fines morrison and others this cramner says mr camden in his annals of queen elizabeth whose christian name was george was a gentleman of singular hopes the eldest son of thomas cramner son of edmund cramner the archbishop's brother he spent much of his youth in corpus christi college in oxford where he continued master of arts for some time before he removed and then betook himself to travel accompanying that worthy gentleman sir edwin sandys into france germany and italy for the space of three years and after their happy return he betook himself to an employment under secretary davison a privy councillor of note who for an unhappy undertaking became clouded and pitied after whose fall he went in place of secretary with sir henry killigrew in his embassage into france and after his death he was sought after by the most noble lord mountjoy with whom he went into ireland where he remained until in a battle against the rebels near collingford an unfortunate wound put an end both to his life 
and the great hopes that were conceived of him, he being then but in the thirty-sixth year of his age. Betwixt Mr. Hooker and these his two pupils there was a sacred friendship, a friendship made up of religious principles, which increased daily by a similitude of inclinations to the same recreations and studies, a friendship elemented in youth and in a university, free from self-ends, which friendships of age usually are not and in this sweet this blessed this spiritual amity they went on for many years and as the holy prophet saith so they took sweet counsel together and walked in the house of god as friends by which means they improved this friendship to such a degree of holy amity as bordered upon heaven a friendship so sacred that when it ended in this world it began in the next where it shall have no end. And though this world cannot give any degree of pleasure equal to such a friendship, yet obedience to parents and a desire to know the affairs, manners, laws, and learning of other nations, that they might thereby become the more serviceable unto their own, made them put off their gowns and leave the college and Mr. Hooker to his studies, in which he was daily more assiduous, still enriching his quiet and capacious soul with the precious learning of the philosophers, casuists, and schoolmen, and with them the foundation and reason of all laws, both sacred and civil, and indeed with such other learning as lay most remote from the track of common studies. And as he was diligent in these, so he seemed restless in searching the scope and intention of God's Spirit revealed to mankind in the sacred scripture, for the understanding of which he seemed to be assisted by the same Spirit with which they were written. He that regardeth truth in the inward parts, making him to understand wisdom secretly. And the good man would often say that God abhors confusion as contrary to his nature, and as often say that the scripture was not writ to beget disputation and pride and opposition to government, but charity and humility, moderation, obedience to authority, and peace to mankind. Of which virtues he would as often say, no man did ever repent himself on his deathbed and that this was really his judgment did appear in his future writings and in all the actions of his life. Nor was this excellent man a stranger to the more light and airy parts of learning, as music and poetry, all which he had digested and made useful, and of all which the reader will have a fair testimony in what will follow. In the year 1579, the Chancellor of the University was given to understand that the public Hebrew lecture was not read according to the statutes, nor could be by reason of a distemper that had then seized the brain of Mr. Kingsmill, who was to read it, so that it lay long unread to the great detriment of those that were studious of that language. Therefore the Chancellor writ to his Vice-Chancellor, and the university that he had heard such commendations of the excellent knowledge of mr richard hooker in that tongue that he desired he might be procured to read it and he did and continued to do so till he left oxford within three months after his undertaking this lecture namely in october fifteen seventy nine he was with dr reynolds and others expelled his college, and this letter, transcribed from Dr. Reynolds, his own hand, may give some account of it. To Sir Francis Knowles, I am sorry, right honourable, that I am enforced to make unto you such a suit which I cannot move, but I must complain of the unrighteous dealing of one of our college, who hath taken upon him against all law and reason, to expel out of our house both me and Mr. Hooker, and three other of our fellows, 
for doing that which by oath we were bound to do. Our matter must be heard before the Bishop of Winchester, with whom I do not doubt, but we shall find equity. Howbeit, forasmuch as some of our adversaries have said that the bishop is already forestalled, and will not give us such audience as we look for, therefore I am humbly to beseech your honour that you will desire the bishop, by your letters, to let us have justice, though it be with rigour, so it be justice. Our cause is so good that I am sure we shall prevail by it. Thus much I am bold to request of your honour for Corpus Christi College's sake, or rather for Christ's sake, whom I beseech to bless you with daily increase of his manifold gifts and the blessed graces of his Holy Spirit. Your honours in Christ to command, John Reynolds, London, October ninth, 1579. This expulsion was by Dr. John Barfoot then vice-president of the college and chaplain to ambrose earl of warwick i cannot learn the pretended cause but that they were restored the same month is most certain i returned to mr hooker in his college where he continued his studies with all quietness for the space of three years about which time he entered into sacred orders being then made deacon and priest and not long after was appointed to preach at St. Paul's Cross. In order to which sermon, to London he came, and immediately to the Shunammite's house, which is a house so called for that, besides the stipend paid the preacher, there is provision made also for his lodging and diet for two days before and one day after his sermon. This house was then kept by John Churchman, sometime a draper of good note in Watling Street, upon whom poverty had at last come like an armed man, and brought him into a necessitous condition, which, though it be a punishment, is not always an argument of God's disfavour, for he was a virtuous man. I shall not yet give the like testimony of his wife, but leave the reader to judge by what follows. But to this house Mr. Hooker came so wet, so weary, and weather-beaten, that he was never known to express more passion than against a friend that dissuaded him from footing it to London, and for finding him no easier a horse, supposing the horse trotted when he did not, and at this time also such a faintness and fear possessed him that he would not be persuaded two days rest and quietness or any other means could be used to make him able to preach his sunday sermon but a warm bed and rest and drink proper for a cold given him by mrs churchman and her diligent attendance added unto it enabled him to perform the office of the day which was in or about the year fifteen eighty one and in this first public appearance to the world he was not so happy as to be free from exceptions against a point of doctrine delivered in his sermon which was that in god there were two wills an antecedent and a consequent will his first will that all mankind should be saved but his second will was that those only should be saved that did live answerable to that degree of grace which he had offered or afforded them. This seemed to cross a late opinion of Mr. Calvin's, and then taken for granted by many that had not a capacity to examine it, as it had been by him before, and hath been since, by Master Henry Mason, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Hammond, and others of great learning, who believe that a contrary opinion entrenches upon the honour and justice of our merciful God. How he justified this I will not undertake to declare, but it was not accepted against, as Mr. Hooker declares in his rational answer to Mr. Travers, by John Elmore, then Bishop of London, at this time one of his auditors, 
and at last one of his advocates too, when Mr. Hooker was accused for it. But the justifying of this doctrine did not prove of so bad consequence as the kindness of Mrs. Churchman's curing him of his late distemper and cold, for that was so gratefully apprehended by Mr. Hooker, that he thought himself bound in conscience to believe all that she said, so that the good man came to be persuaded by her that he was a man of tender constitution, and that it was best for him to have a wife that might prove a nurse to him, such a one as might both prolong his life and make it more comfortable, and such a one she could and would provide for him, if he thought fit to marry. And he, not considering that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light, but, like a true Nathaniel, fearing no guile, because he meant none, did give her such a power as Eleazar was trusted with. You may read it in the book of Genesis when he was sent to choose a wife for Isaac. For even so he trusted her to choose for him, promising upon a fair summons to return to London and accept of her choice, and he did so in that or about the year following. Now the wife provided for him was her daughter, Joan, who brought him neither beauty nor portion and for her conditions they were too like that wife's which is by Solomon compared to a dripping house, so that the good man had no reason to rejoice in the wife of his youth, but too just cause to say with the holy prophet, Woe is me that I am constrained to have my habitation in the tents of Kedar. This choice of Mr. Hooker's, if it were his choice, may be wondered at. But let us consider that the prophet Ezekiel says, There is a wheel within a wheel, a secret, sacred wheel of providence, most visible in marriages, guided by his hand, that allows not the race to the swift, nor bread to the wise, nor good wives to good men. And he that can bring good out of evil, for mortals are blind to this reason, only knows why this blessing was denied to patient Job, to meek Moses, and to our meek and patient Mr. Hooker. But so it was, and let the reader cease to wonder, for affliction is a divine diet, which, though it be not pleasing to mankind, yet Almighty God hath often, very often, imposed it as good though bitter physic to those children whose souls are dearest to him. And by this marriage the good man was drawn from the tranquillity of his college, from that garden of piety, of pleasure, of peace, and a sweet conversation, into the thorny wilderness of a busy world, into those corroding cares that attend a married priest and a country parsonage, which was Drayton Beecham in Buckinghamshire not far from Aylesbury, and in the diocese of Lincoln, to which he was presented by John Cheney, Esquire, then patron of it, the ninth of December, 1584, where he behaved himself so as to give no occasion of evil, but as St. Paul adviseth a minister of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in anguishes, in necessities, in poverty, and no doubt in long-suffering, yet troubling no man with his discontents and wants. And in this condition he continued about a year, in which time his two pupils, Edwin Sandys and George Cramner, took a journey to see their tutor, where they found him with a book in his hand, it was the Odes of Horace, he being then, like humble and innocent Abel, tending his small allotment of sheep in a common field, which he told his pupils he was forced to do then, for that his servant was gone home to dine and assist his wife to do some necessary household business. But when his servant returned and released him, then his two pupils attended him unto his house, 
where their best entertainment was his quiet company, which was presently denied them, for Richard was called to rock the cradle, and the rest of their welcome was so like this that they stayed but till next morning, which was time enough to discover and pity their tutor's condition. And they, having in that time rejoiced in the remembrance, and then paraphrased on many of the innocent recreations of their younger days, and other like diversions, and thereby given him as much present comfort as they were able, they were forced to leave him to the company of his wife Joan, and seek themselves a quieter lodging for next night. But at their parting from him, Mr. Cramner said, Good tutor, I am sorry your lot is fallen in no better ground as to your parsonage, and more sorry that your wife proves not a more comfortable companion after you have wearied yourself in your restless studies. To whom the good man replied, My dear George, if saints have usually a double share in the miseries of this life, I, that am none, ought not to repine in what my wise Creator hath appointed for me, but labour, as indeed I do daily, to submit mine to His will, and possess my soul in patience and peace. At their return to London, Edwin Sandys acquaints his father, who was then Archbishop of York, with his tutor's sad condition, and solicits for his removal to some benefice that might give him a more quiet and a more comfortable subsistence, which his father did most willingly grant him when it should next fall into his power. And not long after this time, which was in the year 1585, Mr. Alvey, master of the temple, died, who was a man of a strict life, of great learning, and of so venerable behaviour, as to gain so high a degree of love and reverence from all men, that he was generally known by the name of Father Alvey. And at the temple reading, next after the death of this Father Alvey, he, the said Archbishop of York, being then at dinner with the judges, the reader and the benchers of that society, met with a general condolement for the death of Father Alvey, and with a high commendation of his saint-like life, and of his great merit both towards God and man. And as they bewailed his death, so they wished for a like pattern of virtue and learning to succeed him. And here came in a fair occasion for the bishop to commend Mr. Hooker to Father Alvey's place, which he did with so effectual an earnestness, and that seconded with so many other testimonies of his worth, that Mr. Hooker was sent for from Drayton Beecham to London, and there the mastership of the temple proposed unto him by the bishop as a greater freedom from his country cares, the advantages of a better society, and a more liberal pension than his country parsonage did afford him. But these reasons were not powerful enough to incline him to a willing acceptance of it. His wish was rather to gain a better country living, where he might see God's blessing spring out of the earth, and be free from noise, so he expressed the desire of his heart, and eat that bread which he might more properly call his own in privacy and quietness. But notwithstanding this averseness, he was at last persuaded to accept of the bishop's proposal, and was by patent for life, this you may find in the temple records, made master of the temple, the 17th of March, 1585 he being then in the thirty-fourth year of his age. And here I shall make a stop, and that the reader may the better judge of what follows, give him a character of the times, and temper of the people of this nation, when Mr. Hooker had his admission into this place, a place which he accepted rather than desired, and yet here he promised himself a virtuous quietness, that blessed tranquillity 
which he always prayed and labored for, that so he might in peace bring forth the fruits of peace, and glorify God by uninterrupted prayers and praises. For this he always thirsted and prayed. But Almighty God did not grant it, for his admission into this place was the very beginning of those oppositions and anxieties which till then this good man was a stranger to, and of which the reader may guess by what follows. In this character of the times I shall, by the reader's favor and for his information, look so far back as to the beginning of the reign of Queen Elizabeth a time in which the many pretended titles to the crown, the frequent treasons, the doubts of her successor, the late civil war, and the sharp persecution for religion that raged to the effusion of so much blood in the reign of Queen Mary, were fresh in the memory of all men, and begot fears in the most pious and wisest of this nation, lest the like day should return again to them or their present posterity. And the apprehension of these dangers begot a hearty desire of a settlement in the church and state, believing there was no other probable way left to make them sit quietly under their own vines and fig-trees, and enjoy the desired fruit of their labors. But time and peace and plenty begot self-ends, and these begot animosities, envy, opposition, and unthankfulness for those very blessings for which they lately thirsted, being then the very utmost of their desires, and even beyond their hopes. This was the temper of the times in the beginning of her reign, and thus it continued too long, for those very people that had enjoyed the desires of their hearts in a reformation from the church of rome became at last so like the grave as never to be satisfied but were still thirsting for more and more neglecting to pay that obedience and perform those vows which they made in their days of adversities and fear so that in short time there appeared three several interests each of them fearless and restless in the prosecution of their designs. They may for distinction be called the active Romanists, the restless nonconformists, of which there were many sorts, and the passive peaceable Protestants. The councils of the first considered and resolved on in Rome, the second, both in Scotland, in Geneva, and in diverse selected secret dangerous conventicles, both there and within the bosom of our own nation. The third pleaded and defended their cause by established laws, both ecclesiastical and civil. And if they were active, it was to prevent the other two from destroying what was by those known laws happily established to them and their posterity. I shall forbear to mention the very many and dangerous plots of the Romanists against the church and state, because what is principally intended in this digression is an account of the opinions and activity of the nonconformists, against whose judgment and practice Mr. Hooker became at last but most unwillingly, to be engaged in a book war, a war which he maintained not as against an enemy, but with the spirit of meekness and reason. In which number of nonconformists, though some might be sincere well-meaning men, whose indiscreet zeal might be so like charity as thereby to cover a multitude of their errors, yet of this party there were many that were possessed with a high degree of spiritual wickedness, I mean with an innate restless pride and malice. I do not mean the visible carnal sins of gluttony and drunkenness and the like, from which, good Lord, deliver us, but sins of a higher nature, because they are more unlike God, who is the God of love and mercy and order and peace, and more like the devil, who is not a glutton, nor can be drunk, and yet is a devil. 
But I mean those spiritual wickednesses of malice and revenge, and an opposition to government ; men that joyed to be the authors of misery, which is properly his work, that is the enemy and disturber of mankind, and thereby greater sinners than the glutton or drunkard, though some will not believe it. And of this party there were also many whom prejudice and a furious zeal had so blinded as to make them neither to hear reason nor adhere to the ways of peace, men that were the very dregs and pest of mankind, men whom pride and a self-conceit had made to overvalue their own pitiful, crooked wisdom so much as not to be ashamed to hold foolish and unmannerly disputes against those men whom they ought to reverence, and those laws which they ought to obey, men that labored and joyed first to find out the faults and then speak evil of government, and to be the authors of confusion, men whom company and conversation and custom had at last so blinded and made so insensible that these were sins, that like those that perished in the gainsaying of Korah, so these died without repenting of these spiritual wickednesses, of which the practices of Coppinger and Hackett in their lives, and the death of them and their adherents are, God knows, two sad examples, and ought to be cautions to those men that are inclined to the like spiritual wickednesses. And in these times, which tended thus to confusion, there were also many of these scruple-mongers that pretended a tenderness of conscience, refusing to take an oath before a lawful magistrate, and yet these very men in their secret conventicles did covenant and swear to each other to be assiduous and faithful in using their best endeavours to set up the Presbyterian doctrine and discipline, and both in such a manner as they themselves had not yet agreed on, but up that government must. To which end there were many that wandered up and down, and were active in sowing discontents and sedition, by venomous and secret murmurings, and a dispersion of scurrilous pamphlets and libels against the church and state, but especially against the bishops, by which means, together with venomous and indiscreet sermons, the common people became so fanatic as to believe the bishops to be antichrist, and the only obstructors of God's discipline. And at last some of them were given over to so bloody a zeal and such other desperate delusions as to find out a text in the revelation of st john that antichrist was to be overcome by the sword so that those very men that began with tender and meek petitions proceeded to admonitions then to satirical remonstrances and at last having like absalom numbered who was not and who was for their cause, they got a supposed certainty of so great a party that they durst threaten first the bishops and then the queen and parliament, to all which they were secretly encouraged by the Earl of Leicester, then in great favour with her majesty, and the reputed cherisher and patron-general of these pretenders to tenderness of conscience his design being by their means to bring such an odium upon the bishops as to procure an alienation of their lands and a large proportion of them for himself which avaricious desire had at last so blinded his reason that his ambitious and greedy hopes seemed to put him into a present possession of lambeth house and to these undertakings the nonconformists of this nation were much encouraged and heightened by a correspondence and confederacy with that brotherhood in Scotland, so that here they became so bold that one, Mr. Daring, told the Queen openly in a sermon, 
She was like an untamed heifer that would not be ruled by God's people, but obstructed his discipline. And in Scotland they were more confident, for there, vide Bishop Spotwood's History of the Church of Scotland, they declared her an atheist, and grew to such a height as not to be accountable for anything spoken against her, nor for treason against their own king, if it were but spoken in the pulpit, showing at last such a disobedience to him, that his mother, being in England, and then in distress and in prison, and in danger of death, the church denied the king their prayers for her, and at another time, when he had appointed a day of feasting, the church declared for a general fast, in opposition to his authority. To this height they were grown in both nations, and by these means there was distilled into the minds of the common people such other venomous and turbulent principles as were inconsistent with the safety of the church and state. And these opinions vented so daringly that, beside the loss of life and limbs, the governors of the church and state were forced to use such other severities as will not admit of an excuse if it had not been to prevent the gangrene of confusion and the perilous consequences of it, which, without such prevention, would have been first confusion and then ruin and misery to this numerous nation. These errors and animosities were so remarkable that they begot wonder in an ingenious Italian, who being about this time come newly into this nation, and considering them, writ scoffingly to a friend in his own country to this purpose, that the common people of England were wiser than the wisest of his nation, for here the very women and shopkeepers were able to judge of predestination, and to determine what laws were fit to be made concerning church government, and then what were fit to be obeyed or abolished, that they were more able, or at least thought so, to raise and determine perplexed cases of conscience than the wisest of the most learned colleges in Italy that men of the slightest learning and the most ignorant of the common people were mad for a new or super or re-reformation of religion, and that in this they appeared like that man who would never cease to whet and whet his knife till there was no steel left to make it useful. And he concluded his letter with this observation that those very men that were most busy in oppositions and disputations and controversies and finding out of the faults of their governors had usually the least of humility and mortification or of the power of godliness and to heighten all these discontents and dangers there was also sprung up a generation of godless men men that had so long given way to their own lusts and delusions, and so highly opposed the blessed motions of his spirit and the inward light of their own consciences, that they became the very slaves of vice, and had thereby sinned themselves into a belief of that which they would but could not believe, into a belief which is repugnant even to human nature. For the heathens believe that there are many gods, but these had sinned themselves into a belief that there was no god, and so, finding nothing in themselves but what was worse than nothing, began to wish that they were not able to hope for, namely, that they might be like the beasts that perish, and in wicked company, which is the atheist sanctuary, were so bold as to say so, though the worst of mankind, when he is left alone at midnight, may wish, but is not then able, to think it. Into this wretched, this reprobate condition, many had then sinned themselves. And now, when the church was pestered with them, and with all those other forenamed irregularities, when her lands were in danger of alienation, her power at least neglected, 
and her peace torn to pieces by several schisms and such heresies as do usually attend that sin for heresies do usually outlive their first authors when the common people seemed ambitious of doing those very things that were forbidden and attended with most dangers that thereby they might be punished and then applauded and pitied when they called the spirit of opposition a tender conscience and complained of persecution because they wanted power to persecute others when the giddy multitude raged and became restless to find out misery for themselves and others and the rabble would herd themselves together and endeavor to govern and act in spite of authority in this extremity of fear and danger of the church and state when to suppress the growing evils of both they needed a man of prudence and piety and of a high and fearless fortitude they were blessed in all by john whitgift his being made archbishop of canterbury of whom sir henry wotton that knew him well in his youth and had studied him in his age gives this true character that he was a man of reverend and sacred memory and of the primitive temper such a temper as when the church by lowliness of spirit did flourish in highest examples of virtue and indeed this man proved so and though i dare not undertake to add to this excellent and true character of sir henry wotton yet i shall neither do right in this discourse nor to my reader if i forbear to give him a further and short account of the life and manners of this excellent man and it shall be short for i long to end this digression that i may lead my reader back to mr hooker where we left him at the temple john whitgift was born in the county of lincoln of a family that was ancient and noted to be both prudent and affable and gentle by nature he was educated in cambridge much of his learning was acquired in pembroke hall where mr bradford the martyr was his tutor from thence he was removed to peter house from thence to be master of pembroke hall and from there to the mastership of trinity college about which time the queen made him her chaplain and not long after prebend of ely and then dean of lincoln and having for many years past looked upon him with much reverence and favour gave him a fair testimony of both by giving him the bishopric of worcester and which was not with her a usual favour for giving him his first fruits then by constituting him vice-president of the principality of wales and having experimented his wisdom his justice and moderation in the manage of her affairs in both these places she in the twenty-sixth of her reign 1583 made him archbishop of canterbury and not long after of her privy council and trusted him to manage all her ecclesiastical affairs and preferments in all which removes he was like the ark which left a blessing on the place where it rested and in all his employments was like jehoiada that did good unto israel these were the steps of this bishop's ascension to this place of dignity and cares in which place to speak mr camden's very words in his annals of queen elizabeth he devoutly consecrated both his own life to god and his painful labours to the good of his church and yet in this place he met with many oppositions in the regulation of church affairs which were much disordered at his entrance by reason of the age and remissness of bishop grinda his immediate predecessor the activity of the nonconformists and their chief assistant the earl of leicester and indeed by too many others of the like sacrilegious principles with these he was to encounter and though he wanted neither courage nor a good cause 
yet he foresaw that without a great measure of the queen s favour it was impossible to stand in the breach that had been lately made into the lands and immunities of the church or indeed to maintain the remaining lands and rights of it and therefore by justifiable sacred insinuations such as st paul to agrippa agrippa believest thou i know thou believest he wrought himself into so great a degree of favour with her as by his pious use of it hath got both of them a great degree of fame in this world and of glory in that into which they are now both entered end of chapter three part one Chapter Three of Isaac Walton's Lives of John Donne, Henry Wotton, Richard Hooker, and George Herbert by Isaac Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Richard Hooker, Part Two. His merits to the Queen and her favors to him were such that she called him her little black husband and called his servants her servants and she saw so visible and blessed a sincerity shine in all his cares and endeavours for the churches and for her good that she was supposed to trust him with the very secrets of her soul and to make him her confessor of which she gave many fair testimonies and of which one was that she would never eat flesh in lent without obtaining a license from her little black husband and would often say she pitied him because she trusted him and had thereby eased herself by laying the burden of all her clergy cares upon his shoulders which he managed with prudence and piety i shall not keep myself within the promised rules of brevity in this account of his interest with her majesty and his care of the church's rites if in this digression i should enlarge to particulars and therefore my desire is that one example may serve for a testimony of both and that the reader may the better understand it he may take notice that not many years before his being made archbishop there passed an act or acts of parliament intending the better preservation of the church lands by recalling a power which was vested in others to sell or lease them by lodging and trusting the future care and protection of them only in the crown and amongst many that made a bad use of this power or trust of the queen's the earl of leicester was one and the bishop having by his interest with her majesty put a stop to the earl's sacrilegious designs they too fell to an open opposition before her after which they both quitted the room not friends in appearance but the bishop made a sudden and seasonable return to her majesty for he found her alone and spoke to her with great humility and reverence to this purpose i beseech your majesty to hear me with patience and to believe that yours and the church's safety are dearer to me than my life but my conscience dearer than both and therefore give me leave to do my duty and tell you that princes are deputed nursing fathers of the church and owe it a protection and therefore god forbid that you should be so much as passive in her ruin when you may prevent it or that i should behold it without horror and detestation or should forbear to tell your majesty of the sin and danger of sacrilege and though you and myself are born in an age of frailties when the primitive piety and care of the church's lands and immunities are much decayed yet madam let me beg that you would first consider that there are such sins as profaneness and sacrilege and that if there were not they could not have names in holy writ and particularly in the new testament and i beseech you to consider 
that though our Saviour said he judged no man, and to testify it, would not judge nor divide the inheritance betwixt the two brethren, nor would judge the woman taken in adultery. Yet in this point of the church's rights he was so zealous that he made himself both the accuser and the judge, and the executioner too, to punish these sins, witnessed in that he himself made the whip to drive the profaners out of the temple, overthrew the tables of the money-changers, and drove them out of it. And I beseech you to consider that it was St. Paul that said to those Christians of his time that were offended with idolatry, and yet committed sacrilege, Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Supposing, I think, sacrilege the greater sin. This may occasion your majesty to consider that there is such a sin as sacrilege, and to incline you to prevent the curse that will follow it, I beseech you also to consider that Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and Helena, his mother, that King Edward, and Edward the Confessor, and indeed many others of your predecessors, and many private Christians, have also given to God and to his church much land and many immunities which they might have given to those of their own families and did not, but gave them forever as an absolute right and sacrifice to God. And with these immunities and lands they have entailed a curse upon the alienators of them. God prevent your majesty and your successors from being liable to that curse which will cleave unto church lands as the leprosy to the Jews. And to make you that are trusted with their preservation the better to understand the danger of it, I beseech you forget not that, to prevent these curses, the church's land and power have been also endeavoured to be preserved, as far as human reason and the law of this nation have been able to preserve them by an immediate and most sacred obligation on the consciences of the princes of this realm. For they that consult Magna Carta shall find that, as all your predecessors were at their coronation, so you also were sworn before all the nobility and bishops then present, and in the presence of God, and in his stead, to him that anointed you to maintain the church lands and the rights belonging to it. And this you yourself have testified openly to God at the holy altar, by laying your hands on the Bible, then lying upon it. And not only Magna Carta, but many modern statutes have denounced a curse upon those that break Magna Carta, a curse like the leprosy that was entailed on the Jews, for as that so these curses have and will cleave to the very stones of those buildings that have been consecrated to god and the father's sin of sacrilege hath and will prove to be entailed on his son and family and now madam what account can be given for the breach of this oath at the last great day either by your majesty or by me if it be wilfully or but negligently violated I know not. And therefore, good madam, let not the late Lord's exceptions against the failings of some few clergymen prevail with you to punish posterity for the errors of the present age. Let particular men suffer for their particular errors, but let God and his church have their inheritance, and though I pretend not to prophecy, yet I beg posterity to take notice of what is already become visible in many families, that church land, added to an ancient and just inheritance, hath proved like a moth fretting a garment, and secretly consumed both, or like the eagle that stole a coal from the altar, and thereby set her nest on fire, which consumed both her young eagles and herself that stole it and though I shall forbear to speak reproachfully of your father, yet I beg you to take notice that a part of the church's rights, added to the vast treasures left him by his father, hath been conceived to bring an unavoidable consumption 
upon both, notwithstanding all his diligency to preserve them. And consider that after the violation of those laws, to which he had sworn in Magna Carta, God did so far deny him his restraining grace, that, as King Saul, after he was forsaken of God, fell from one sin to another, so he, till at last, he fell into greater sin than I am willing to mention. Madam, religion is the foundation and cement of human societies, and when they that serve at God's altar shall be exposed to poverty, then religion itself will be exposed to scorn and become contemptible, as you may already observe it to be in too many poor vicarages in this nation. And therefore, as you are by a late act or acts of Parliament entrusted with a great power to preserve or waste the church lands, yet dispose of them for Jesus' sake, as you have promised to men and vowed to God that is, as the donors intended. Let neither falsehood nor flattery beguile you to do otherwise, but put a stop to God's and the Levite's portion, I beseech you, and to the approaching ruins of his church, as you expect comfort at the last great day, for kings must be judged. Pardon this affectionate plainness, my most dear sovereign, and let me beg to be still continued in your favour, and the Lord still continue you in his. The Queen's patient hearing this affectionate speech, and her future care to preserve the Church's rights, which till then had been neglected, may appear a fair testimony that he made hers and the Church's good the chiefest of his cares, and that she also thought so. And of this there were such daily testimonies given as begot betwixt them so mutual a joy and confidence, that they seemed born to believe and do good to each other. She, not doubting his piety, to be more than all his opposers, which were many, nor doubting his prudence to be equal to the chiefest of her council, who were then as remarkable for active wisdom as those dangerous times did require, or this nation did ever enjoy and in this condition he continued twenty years, in which time he saw some flowings, but many more ebbings, of her favour towards all men that had opposed him, especially the Earl of Leicester, so that God seemed still to keep him in her favour, that he might preserve the remaining church lands and immunities from sacrilegious alienations. And this good man deserved all the honour and power with which she gratified and trusted him, for he was a pious man, and naturally of noble and grateful principles. He eased her of all her church cares by his wise manage of them. He gave her faithful and prudent counsels in all the extremities and dangers of her temporal affairs, which were very many. He lived to be the chief comfort of her life in her declining age, and to be then most frequently with her and her assistant at her private devotions. He lived to be the greatest comfort of her soul upon her deathbed, to be present at the expiration of her last breath, and to behold the closing of those eyes that had long looked upon him with reverence and affection. And let this also be added, that he was the chief mourner at her sad funeral. Nor let this be forgotten, that within a few hours after her death he was the happy proclaimer that King James, her peaceful successor, was heir to the crown. Let me beg of my reader to allow me to say a little, and but a little, more of this good bishop, and I shall then presently lead him back to Mr. Hooker, and because I would hasten, I will mention but one part of the bishop's charity and humility but this of both. He built a large almshouse near to his own palace at Croydon in Surrey, and endowed it with maintenance for a master and twenty-eight poor men and women, which he visited so often that he knew their names and dispositions, and was so truly humble 
that he called them brothers and sisters and whensoever the queen descended to that lowliness to dine with him at his palace in lambeth which was very often he would usually the next day show the like lowliness to his poor brothers and sisters at croydon and dine with them at his hospital at which time you may believe there was joy at the table and at this place he built also a fair free school with a good accommodation and maintenance for the master and scholars which gave just occasion for boise sisi then ambassador for the french king and resident here at the bishop's death to say the bishop had published many learned books but a free school to train up youth and an hospital to lodge and maintain aged and poor people were the best evidences of christian learning that a bishop could leave to posterity this good bishop lived to see king james settled in peace and then fell into an extreme sickness at his palace in lambeth of which when the king had notice he went presently to visit him and found him in his bed in a declining condition and very weak and after some short discourse betwixt them the king at his departure assured him he had a great affection for him and a very high value for his prudence and virtues and would endeavour to beg his life of god for the good of his church to which the good bishop replied pro ecclesia dei pro ecclesia dei which were the last words he ever spake therein testifying that as in his life so at his death his chiefest care was of god's church this john whitgift was made archbishop in the year fifteen eighty three in which busy place he continued twenty years and some months and in which time you may believe he had many trials of his courage and patience but his motto was vincit qui patitur and he made it good many of his trials were occasioned by the then powerful earl of leicester who did still but secretly raise and cherish a faction of nonconformists to oppose him especially one thomas cartwright a man of noted learning some time contemporary with the bishop in cambridge and of the same college of which the bishop had been master in which place there began some emulations the particulars i forbear and at last open and high oppositions betwixt them and in which you may believe mr cartwright was most faulty if his expulsion out of the university can incline you to it and in this discontent after the earl's death which was fifteen eighty eight mr cartwright appeared a chief cherisher of a party that were for the geneva church government and to effect it he ran himself into many dangers both of liberty and life appearing at the last to justify himself and his party in many remonstrances which he caused to be printed and to which the bishop made a first answer and cartwright replied upon him and then the bishop having rejoined to his first reply mr cartwright either was or was persuaded to be satisfied for he wrote no more but left the reader to be judge which had maintained their cause with most charity and reason after some silence mr cartwright received from the bishop many personal favours and betook himself to a more private living which was at warwick where he was made master of an hospital and lived quietly and grew rich and where the bishop gave him a license to preach upon promises not to meddle with controversies but incline his hearers to piety and moderation and this promise he kept during his life which ended sixteen o two the bishop surviving him but some few months each ending his days in perfect charity with the other and now after this long digression made for the information of my reader concerning what follows i bring him back to venerable mr hooker where we left him in the temple and where we shall find him as deeply engaged in the controversy with walter travers a friend and favourite of mr cartwright's 
as the bishop had ever been with Mr. Cartwright himself, and of which I shall proceed to give this following account. And first this, that though the pens of Mr. Cartwright and the bishop were now at rest, yet there was sprung up a new generation of restless men, that by company and clamours became possessed of a faith which they ought to have kept to themselves, but could not men that were become positive in asserting that a papist cannot be saved insomuch that about this time at the execution of the queen of scots the bishop that preached her funeral sermon which was dr howland then bishop of peterborough was reviled for not being positive for her damnation and besides this boldness of their becoming gods so far as to set limits to his mercies there was not only one Martin Mar Prelate, but other venomous books daily printed and dispersed, books that were so absurd and scurrilous that the graver divines disdained them an answer. And yet these were grown into high esteem with the common people, till Tom Nash appeared against them all, who was a man of sharp wit and the master of a scoffing, satirical merry pen which he employed to discover the absurdities of those blind, malicious, senseless pamphlets and sermons as senseless as they, Nash's answer being like his books, which bore these or like titles, an almond for a parrot, a fig for my godson, come crack me this nut, and the like, so that this merry wit made some sport and such a discovery of their absurdities as which is strange he put a greater stop to these malicious pamphlets than a much wiser man had been able and now the reader is to take notice that at the death of father alvey who was master of the temple this walter travers was lecturer there for the evening sermons which he preached with great approbation especially of some citizens and the younger gentlemen of that society, and for the most part approved by Mr. Hooker himself, in the midst of their oppositions. For he continued lecturer a part of his time, Mr. Travers being indeed a man of competent learning, of a winning behavior, and of a blameless life. But he had taken orders by the presbytery in Antwerp, and with them some opinions that could never be eradicated, and if in anything he was transported, it was in an extreme desire to set up that government in this nation, for the promoting of which he had a correspondence with Theodore Beza at Geneva, and others in Scotland, and was one of the chiefest assistants to Mr. Cartwright in that design. Mr. Travers had also a particular hope to set up this government in the temple, and to that end used his most zealous endeavours to be master of it, and his being disappointed by Mr. Hooker's admittance proved the occasion of a public opposition betwixt them in their sermons, many of which were concerning the doctrine and ceremonies of this church, insomuch that, as St. Paul withstood St. Peter to his face, so did they withstand each other in their sermons, for, as one hath pleasantly expressed it, the forenoon sermon spake Canterbury, and the afternoon Geneva. In these sermons there was little of bitterness, but each party brought all the reasons he was able to prove his adversary's opinion erroneous, and thus it continued a long time, till the oppositions became so visible, and the consequences so dangerous, especially in that place, that the prudent archbishop put a stop to Mr. Travers, his preaching by a positive prohibition, against which Mr. Travers appealed, and petitioned Her Majesty's Privy Council to have it recalled, where, besides his patron, the Earl of Leicester, he met also with many assisting friends. But they were not able to prevail with or against the archbishop, whom the Queen had entrusted with all church power and he had received so fair a testimony of Mr. Hooker's principles, and of his learning and moderation, that he withstood all solicitations. But 
The denying this position of Mr. Travers was unpleasant to divers of his party, and the reasonableness of it became at last to be so publicly magnified by them and many others of that party as never to be answered, so that, intending the bishops and Mr. Hooker's disgrace, they procured it to be privately printed and scattered abroad. And then Mr. Hooker was forced to appear and make as public an answer, which he did, and dedicated it to the archbishop, and it proved so full an answer, an answer that had in it so much of clear reason, and writ with so much meekness and majesty of style, that the bishop began to have him in admiration, and to rejoice that he had appeared in his cause, and disdained not earnestly to beg his friendship, even a familiar friendship with a man of so much quiet learning and humility. To enumerate the many particular points in which Mr. Hooker and Mr. Travers dissented, all or most of which I have seen written, would prove at least tedious, and therefore I shall impose upon my reader no more than two which shall immediately follow, and by which he may judge of the rest. Mr. Travers accepted against Mr. Hooker, for that in one of his sermons he declared that the assurance of what we believe by the word of God is not to us so certain as that which we perceive by sense. And Mr. Hooker confesseth he said so, and endeavors to justify it by the reasons following. First, I taught that the things which God promises in his word are surer than what we touch, handle, or see. But are we so sure and certain of them? If we be, why doth God so often prove his promises to us, as he doth by arguments drawn from our sensible experience? For we must be surer of the proof than of the things proved. Otherwise it is no proof. For example, how is it that many men, looking on the moon at the same time, every one knoweth it to be the moon as certainly as the other doth? But many, believing one and the same promise, have not all one and the same fullness of persuasion. For how falleth it out, that men, being assured of anything by sense, can be no surer of it than they are, when, as the strongest in faith that liveth upon the earth, hath always need to labor, strive, and pray, that his assurance concerning heavenly and spiritual things may grow, increase, and be augmented. The sermon that gave him the cause of this his justification makes the case more plain, by declaring that there is, besides this certainty of evidence, a certainty of adherence in which, having most excellently demonstrated what the certainty of adherence is, he makes this comfortable use of it. Comfortable, he says, as to weak believers, who suppose themselves to be faithless, not to believe, when notwithstanding they have their adherence. The Holy Spirit hath his private operations, and worketh secretly in them, and effectually, too, though they want the inward testimony of it. Tell this, saith he, to a man that hath a mind too much dejected by a sad sense of his sin, to one that by a too severe judging of himself concludes that he wants faith because he wants the comfortable assurance of it. And his answer will be, Do not persuade me against my knowledge, against what I find and feel in myself. I do not, I know I do not believe. Mr. Hooker's own words follow. Well, then, to favor such men a little in their weakness, let that be granted which they do imagine. Be it that they adhere not to God's promises, but are faithless and without belief, but are they not grieved for their unbelief? They confess they are. Do they not wish it might, and also strive that it may be otherwise? We know they do. Whence cometh this, but from a secret love and liking that they have of those things believed? For no man can love those things which in his own opinion are not, 
and if they think those things to be, which they show they love, when they desire to believe them, then must it be that by desiring to believe they prove themselves true believers. For without faith no man thinketh that things believed are, which argument all the subtleties of infernal powers will never be able to dissolve. Uh, this is an abridgment of part of the reasons Mr. Hooker gives for his justification of this his opinion, for which he was accepted against by Mr. Travers. Mr. Hooker was also accused by Mr. Travers, for that he in one of his sermons had declared that he doubted not but that God was merciful to many of our forefathers living in popish superstition, forasmuch as they sinned ignorantly and Mr. Hooker in his answer professes it to be his judgment, and declares his reasons for this charitable opinion to be as followeth. But first he states the question about justification and works, and how the foundation of faith without works is overthrown, and then he proceeds to discover that way which natural men and some others have mistaken to be the way by which they hope to attain true and everlasting happiness. And having discovered the mistake, he proceeds to direct to that true way, by which, and no other, everlasting life and blessedness is attainable. And these two ways he demonstrates thus, they be his own words that follow, that the way of nature, this the way of grace, the end of that way, salvation merited, presupposing the righteousness of men's works, their righteousness, a natural ability to do them, that ability, the goodness of God, which created them in such perfection. But the end of this way, salvation bestowed upon men as a gift, presupposing not their righteousness, but the forgiveness of their unrighteousness, justification. Their justification, not their natural ability to do good, but their hearty sorrow for not doing, and unfeigned belief in him, for whose sake not doers are accepted, which is their vocation. Their vocation, the election of God, taking them out of the number of lost children. Their election, a mediator in whom to be elected. This mediation, inexplicable mercy. This mercy, supposing their misery, for whom he vouchsafed to die, and make himself a mediator. And he also declareth, There is no meritorious cause for our justification, but Christ, no effectual, but his mercy, and says also, We deny the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we abuse, disannul, and annihilate the benefit of his passion, if by a proud imagination we believe we can merit everlasting life, or can be worthy of it. This belief, he declareth, is to destroy the very essence of our justification, and he makes all opinions that border upon this to be very dangerous. Yet, nevertheless, and for this he was accused, considering how many virtuous and just men, how many saints and martyrs, have had their dangerous opinions, amongst which this was one, that they hoped to make God some part of amends by voluntary punishments which they laid upon themselves, because by this, or the like erroneous opinions, which do by consequence overthrow the merits of Christ, shall man be so bold as to write on their graves, Such men are damned, there is for them no salvation. St. Austin says, Errare possum hereticus esse nolo, and except we put a difference betwixt them that err ignorantly, and them that obstinately persist in it, how is it possible that any man should hope to be saved? Give me a pope or cardinal whom great afflictions have made to know himself, whose heart God hath touched with true sorrow for all his sins, and filled with the love of Christ and his gospel, whose eyes are willingly opened to see the truth, and his mouth ready to renounce all error, this one opinion of merit accepted, which he thinketh God will require at his hands, and because he wanteth, trembleth, and is discouraged, 
and yet can say, Lord, cleanse me from all my secret sins. Shall I think because of this, or a like error, such men touch not so much as the hem of Christ's garment? If they do, wherefore should I doubt, but that virtue may proceed from Christ to save them? No, I will not be afraid to say to such a one, You err in your opinion, but be of good comfort, you have to do with a merciful God, who will make the best of that little which you hold well, and not with a captious sophister, who gathereth the worst out of everything in which you are mistaken. But it will be said, says Mr. Hooker, the admittance of merit in any degree overthroweth the foundation excludeth from the hope of mercy from all possibility of salvation and now mr hooker's own words follow what though they hold the truth sincerely in all other parts of christian faith although they have in some measure all the virtues and graces of the spirit although they have all other tokens of god's children in them although they be far from having any proud opinion that they shall be saved by the worthiness of their deeds, although the only thing that troubleth and molesteth them be a little too much dejection, somewhat too great a fear arising from an erroneous conceit that God will require a worthiness in them, which they are grieved to find wanting in themselves. Although they be not obstinate in this opinion, although they be willing and would be glad to forsake it, if any one reason were brought sufficient to disprove it, although the only cause why they do not forsake it ere they die be their ignorance of that means by which it might be disproved, although the cause why the ignorance in this point is not removed be the want of knowledge in such as should be able, and are not to remove it, let me die, says Mr. Hooker, if it be ever proved that simply an error doth exclude a pope or cardinal in such a case, utterly from hope of life. Surely I must confess that if it be an error to think that God may be merciful to save men even when they err, my greatest comfort is my error. Were it not for the love I bear to this error, I would never wish to speak or to live. I was willing to take notice of these two points, as supposing them to be very material, and that, as they are thus contracted, they may prove useful to my reader, as also for that the answers be arguments of Mr. Hooker's great and clear reason and equal charity. Other exceptions were also made against him by Mr. Travers, as that he prayed before and not after his sermons, that in his prayers he named bishops, that he kneeled both when he prayed and when he received the sacrament. And, says Mr. Hooker, in his defense, other exceptions so like these, as but to name I should have thought a greater fault than to commit them. And it is not unworthy the noting, that in the manage of so great a controversy, a sharper reproof than this, and one like it, did never fall from the happy pen of this humble man. That like it was upon a like occasion of exceptions, to which his answer was, Your next argument consists of railing and of reasons. To your railing I say nothing, to your reasons I say what follows. And I am glad of this fair occasion to testify the dove-like temper of this meek, this matchless man and doubtless if almighty god had blessed the dissenters from the ceremonies and discipline of this church with a like measure of wisdom and humility instead of their pertinacious zeal then obedience and truth had kissed each other then peace and piety had flourished in our nation and this church and state had been blessed like jerusalem that is at unity with itself but this can never be expected till god shall bless the common people of this nation with a belief that schism is a sin and they not fit to judge what is schism and bless them also with a belief that there may be offences taken which are not given and that laws are not made for private men to dispute 
but to obey. And this also may be worthy of noting, that these exceptions of Mr. Travers against Mr. Hooker proved to be Felix Error, for they were the cause of his transcribing those few of his sermons which we now see printed with his books, and of his answer to Mr. Travers his supplication, and of his most learned and useful discourse of justification, of faith, and works. And by their transcription they fell into such hands as have preserved them from being lost, as too many of his other matchless writings were, and from these I have gathered many observations in this discourse of his life. After the publication of his answer to the petition of Mr. Travers, Mr. Hooker grew daily into greater repute with the most learned and wise of the nation, but it had a contrary effect in very many of the temple that were zealous for Mr. Travers and for his church discipline insomuch that though Mr. Travers left the place, yet the seeds of discontent could not be rooted out of that society by the great reason, and as great meekness, of this humble man. For though the chief ventures gave him much reverence and encouragement, yet he there met with many neglects and oppositions by those of Master Travers' judgment, insomuch that it turned to his extreme grief and that he might unbeguile and win them, he designed to write a deliberate, sober treatise of the Church's power to make canons for the use of ceremonies, and by law to impose an obedience to them as upon her children. And this he proposed to do in eight books of the law of ecclesiastical polity, intending therein to show such arguments as should force an assent from all men if reason, delivered in sweet language, and void of any provocation, were able to do it. And, that he might prevent all prejudice, he wrote before it a large preface, or epistle, to the dissenting brethren, wherein there were such bowels of love, and such a commixture of that love with reason, as was never exceeded but in holy writ, and particularly by that of St. Paul, to his dear brother and fellow labourer Philemon, than which none ever was more like this epistle of Mr. Hooker's, so that his dear friend and companion in his studies, Dr. Spencer, might after his death justly say, what admirable height of learning and depth of judgment dwelt in the lowly mind of this truly humble man, great in all wise men's eyes except his own and with what gravity and majesty of speech his tongue and pen uttered heavenly mysteries, whose eyes, in the humility of his heart, were always cast down to the ground, how all things that proceeded from him were breathed as from the spirit of love, as if he, like the bird of the Holy Ghost, the dove, had wanted gall. Let those that knew him not in his person judge by these living images of his soul his writings the foundation of these books was laid in the temple but he found it no fit place to finish what he had there designed he therefore earnestly solicited the archbishop for a remove from that place to whom he spake to this purpose my lord when i lost the freedom of my cell which was my college yet I found some degree of it in my quiet country parsonage. But I am weary of the noise and opposition of this place, and indeed God and nature did not intend me for contentions, but for study and quietness. My lord, my particular contest with Mr. Travers here have proved the more unpleasant to me, because I believe him to be a good man, and that belief hath occasioned me to examine mine own conscience concerning his opinions, and to satisfy that, I have consulted the scripture and other laws, both human and divine, whether the conscience of him and others of his judgment ought to be so far complied with as to alter our frame of church government, our manner of God's worship, our praising and praying to him, 
and our established ceremonies as often as his and other tender consciences shall require us and in this examination i have not only satisfied myself but have begun a treatise in which i intend a justification of the laws of our ecclesiastical polity in which design god and his holy angels shall at the last great day bear me that witness which my conscience now does that my meaning is not to provoke any but rather to satisfy all tender consciences and i shall never be able to do this but where i may study and pray for god's blessing upon my endeavours and keep myself in peace and privacy and behold god's blessings spring out of my mother earth and eat my own bread without oppositions and therefore if your grace can judge me worthy of such a favour let me beg it that i may perfect what i have begun about this time the parsonage or rectory of boscombe in the diocese of sarum and six miles from that city became void the bishop of sarum is patron of it but in the vacancy of that see which was three years betwixt the translation of bishop pierce to the see of york and bishop caldwell's admission into it the disposal of that and all benefices belonging to that see during this said vacancy came to be disposed of by the archbishop of canterbury and he presented richard hooker to it in the year fifteen ninety one and richard hooker was also in this said year instituted july seventeen to be a minor prebend of salisbury the core to it being netherhaven about ten miles from that city which prebend was of no great value but intended chiefly to make him capable of a better preferment in that church in this boscombe he continued till he had finished four of his eight proposed books of the laws of ecclesiastical polity and these were entered into the register book in stationers hall the ninth of march fifteen ninety two but not published till the year fifteen ninety four and then were with the before mentioned large and affectionate preface which he directs to them that seek as they term it the reformation of the laws and orders ecclesiastical in the church of england of which books i shall yet say nothing more but that he continued his laborious diligence to finish the remaining four during his life of all which more properly hereafter but at boscombe he finished and published but only the first four being then in the thirty-ninth year of his age he left boscombe in the year fifteen ninety five by a surrender of it into the hands of bishop caldwell and he presented benjamin russell who was instituted into it the twenty third of june in the same year the parsonage of bishops born in kent three miles from canterbury is in that archbishop's gift but in that latter end of the year fifteen ninety four dr william redman the rector of it was made bishop of norwich by which means the power of presenting to it was pro ea vice in the queen and she presented richard hooker whom she loved well to this good living of bourne the seventh july fifteen ninety five in which living he continued till his death without any addition of dignity or profit and now having brought our richard hooker from his birthplace to this where he found a grave i shall only give some account of his books and of his behaviour in this parsonage of bourne and then give a rest both to myself and my reader his first four books and large epistle have been declared to be printed at his being at boscombe anno fifteen ninety four next i am to tell that at the end of these four books there was when he first printed them this advertisement to the reader i have for some causes thought it at this time more fit to let go these first four books by themselves than to stay both them and the rest till the whole might be together published such generalities of the cause in question as are here handled it will be perhaps not amiss 
to consider apart by way of introduction unto the books that are to follow concerning particulars in the meantime the reader is requested to mend the printer's errors as noted underneath and i am next to declare that his fifth book which is larger than his first four was first also printed by itself anno 1597 and dedicated to his patron for till then he chose none the archbishop these books were read with an admiration of their excellency in this and their just fame spread itself also into foreign nations and i have been told more than forty years past that either cardinal allen or learned dr stapleton both englishmen and in italy about the time when mr hooker's four books were first printed meeting with this general fame of them were desirous to read an author that both the reformed and the learned of their own romish church did so much magnify and therefore caused them to be sent for to rome and after reading them boasted to the pope which then was clement the eighth that though he had lately said he never met with an english book whose writer deserved the name of author yet there now appeared a wonder to them and it would be so to his holiness if it were in latin for a poor obscure english priest had writ four such books of laws and church polity and in a style that expressed such a grave and so humble a majesty with such clear demonstration of reason that in all their readings they had not met with any that exceeded him and this begot in the pope an earnest desire that dr stapleton should bring the said four books and looking on the english read a part of them to him in latin which dr stapleton did to the end of the first book at the conclusion of which the pope spake to this purpose there is no learning that this man hath not searched into nothing too hard for his understanding this man indeed deserves the name of an author his books will get reverence by age for there is in them such seeds of eternity that if the rest be like this they shall last till the last fire shall consume all learning nor was this high the only testimony and commendations given to his books for at the first coming of king james into this kingdom he inquired of the archbishop whitgift for his friend mr hooker that writ the books of church polity to which the answer was that he died a year before queen elizabeth who received the sad news of his death with very much sorrow to which the king replied and i receive it with no less that i shall want the desired happiness of seeing and discoursing with that man from whose books i have received such satisfaction indeed my lord i have received more satisfaction in reading a leaf or paragraph in mr hooker though it were but about the fashion of churches or church music or the like but especially of the sacraments than i have had in the reading particular large treatises written but of one of these subjects by others though very learned men and i observe there is in mr hooker no affected language but a grave comprehensive clear manifestation of reason and that backed with the authority of the scripture the fathers and schoolmen and with all law both sacred and civil and though many others write well yet in the next age they will be forgotten but doubtless there is in every page of mr hooker's book the picture of a divine soul such pictures of truth and reason and drawn in so sacred colours that they shall never fade but give an immortal memory to the author and it is so truly true that the king thought what he spake that as the most learned of the nation have and still do mention mr hooker with reverence so he also did never mention him but with the epithet of learned or judicious or reverend or venerable mr hooker nor did his son our late king charles the first ever mention him but with the same reverence 
enjoining his son, our now gracious King, to be studious in Mr. Hooker's books; and our learned antiquary, Mr. Camden, in his Annals, 1599, mentioning the death, the modesty, and other virtues of Mr. Hooker, and magnifying his books, wished that for the honour of this and the benefit of other nations they were turned into the universal language which work though undertaken by many yet they have been weary and forsaken it but the reader may now expect it having been long since begun and lately finished by the happy pen of dr earle now lord bishop of salisbury of whom i may justly say and let it not offend him because it is such a truth as ought not to be concealed from posterity or those that now live and yet know him not that since mr hooker died none have lived whom god hath blessed with more innocent wisdom more sanctified learning or a more pious peaceable primitive temper so that this excellent person seems to be only like himself and our venerable richard hooker and only fit to make the learned of all nations happy in knowing what hath been too long confined to the language of our little island there might be many more and just occasions taken to speak of his books which none ever did or can commend too much but i decline them and hasten to an account of his christian behaviour and death at bourne in which place he continued his customary rules of mortification and self-denial was much in fasting frequent in meditation and prayers enjoying those blessed returns which only men of strict lives feel and know and of which men of loose and godless lives cannot be made sensible for spiritual things are spiritually discerned at his entrance into this place his friendship was much sought for by Dr. Hadrian Saravia, then, or about that time, made one of the prebends of Canterbury, a German by birth, and sometime a pastor both in Flanders and Holland, where he had studied and well considered the controverted points concerning episcopacy and sacrilege, and in England had a just occasion to declare his judgment concerning both, unto his brethren ministers of the low countries which was accepted against by theodore beza and others against whose exceptions he rejoined and thereby became the happy author of many learned tracts writ in latin especially of three one of the degrees of ministers and of the bishop superiority above the presbytery a second against sacrilege and a third of Christian obedience to princes, the last being occasioned by Gretzerus the Jesuit. And it is observable that when, in a time of church tumults, Beza gave his reasons to the Chancellor of Scotland for the abrogation of episcopacy in that nation, partly by letters, and more fully in a treatise of a threefold episcopacy, which he calls divine, human, and satanical, this dr saravia had by the help of bishop whitgift made such an early discovery of their intentions that he had almost as soon answered that treatise as it became public and he therein discovered how beza's opinion did contradict that of calvin's and his adherents leaving them to interfere with themselves in point of episcopacy but of these tracts it will not concern me to say more than that they were most of them dedicated to his and the Church of England's watchful patron, John Whitgift, the Archbishop, and printed about the time in which Mr. Hooker also appeared first to the world, in the publication of his first four books of ecclesiastical polity. This friendship being sought for by this learned doctor, you may believe was not denied by Mr. Hooker, who was by fortune so like him as to be engaged against Mr. Travers, Mr. Cartwright, and others of their judgment, in a controversy too like Dr. Saravia's, so that in this year of 1595, and in this place of Bourne, these two excellent persons begin a holy friendship, 
increasing daily to so high and mutual affections that their two wills seemed to be but one and the same, and their designs, both for the glory of God and peace of the Church, still assisting and improving each other's virtues and the desired comforts of a peaceable piety, which I have willingly mentioned because it gives a foundation to some things that follow. This parsonage of Bourne is from Canterbury three miles, and near to the common road that leads from that city to Dover, in which parsonage Mr. Hooker had not been twelve months, but his books and the innocency and sanctity of his life became so remarkable that many turned out of the road, and others, scholars especially, went purposely to see the man whose life and learning were so much admired. And alas, as our Saviour said of St. John Baptist, what went they out to see? A man clothed in purple and fine linen? No, indeed, but an obscure, harmless man, a man in poor clothes, his loins usually girt in a coarse gown or canonical coat, of a mean stature and stooping, and yet more lowly in the thoughts of his soul, his body worn out not with age but study and holy mortifications, his face full of heat pimples begot by his inactivity and sedentary life. And to this true character of his person let me add this of his disposition and behavior, God and nature blessed him with so blessed a bashfulness that as in his younger days his pupils might easily look him out of countenance, so neither then nor in his age did he ever willingly look any man in the face, and was of so mild and humble a nature that his poor parish clerk and he did never talk but with both their hats on, or both off, at the same time. And to this may be added, that though he was not pure-blend, yet he was short or weak-sighted, and where he fixed his eyes at the beginning of his sermon, there they continued till it was ended, and the reader has a liberty to believe that his modesty and dim sight were some of the reasons why he trusted Mrs. Churchman to choose his wife. This parish clerk lived till the third or fourth year of the late long Parliament, betwixt which time and Mr. Hooker's death there had come many to see the place of his burial and the monument dedicated to his memory of Sir William Cooper, who still lives, and the poor clerk had many rewards for showing Mr. Hooker's grave place and his said monument, and did always hear Mr. Hooker mentioned with commendations and reverence to all which he added his own knowledge and observations of his humility and holiness, and in which such discourses the poor man was still more confirmed in his opinion of Mr. Hooker's virtues and learning. But it so fell out that about the said third or fourth year of the Long Parliament, the then present parson of Bourne was sequestered, you may guess why, and a Genevan minister put into his good living. This and other like sequestrations made the clerk express himself in a wonder, and say they had sequestered so many good men that he doubted if his good master Mr. Hooker had lived till now, they would have sequestered him too. It was not long before this intruding minister had made a party in and about the said parish that were desirous to receive the sacraments as in Geneva to which end the day was appointed for a select company, and forms and stools set about the altar or communion table for them to sit and eat and drink. But when they went about this work there was a want of some joint stools which the minister sent the clerk to fetch, and then to fetch cushions, but not to kneel upon. When the clerk saw them begin to sit down, he began to wonder, but the minister bade him cease wondering and lock the church door. To whom he replied, Pray take you the keys and lock me out. I will never come more into this church, for all men will say my master Hooker was a good man and a good scholar, and I am sure it was not used to be thus in his day. 
and report says the old man went presently home and died i do not say died immediately but within a few days after but let us leave this grateful clerk in his quiet grave and return to mr hooker himself continuing our observations of his christian behaviour in this place where he gave a holy valediction to all the pleasures and allurements of earth possessing his soul in a virtuous quietness which he maintained by constant study prayers and meditations his use was to preach once every sunday and he or his curate to catechize after the second lesson in the evening prayer his sermons were neither long nor earnest but uttered with a grave zeal and humble voice his eyes always fixed on one place to prevent his imagination from wandering insomuch that he seemed to study as he spake the design of his sermons as indeed of all his discourses was to show reasons for what he spake and with these reasons such a kind of rhetoric as did rather convince and persuade than frighten men into piety studying not so much for matter which he never wanted as for apt illustrations to inform and teach his unlearned hearers by familiar examples and then make them better by convincing applications never laboring by hard words and then by heedless distinctions and sub-distinctions to amuse his hearers and get glory to himself but glory only to god which intention he would often say was as discernible in a preacher as a natural from an artificial beauty he never failed the sunday before every ember week to give notice of it to his parishioners persuading them both to fast and then to double their devotions for a learned and a pious clergy but especially the last saying often that the life of a pious clergyman was visible rhetoric and so convincing that the most godless men though they would not deny themselves the enjoyment of their present lusts did yet secretly wish themselves like those of the strictest lives and to what he persuaded others he added his own example of fasting and prayer and did usually every ember week take from the parish clerk the key of the church door into which place he retired every day and locked himself up for many hours and did the like most fridays and other days of fasting he would by no means omit the customary time of procession persuading all both rich and poor if they desired the preservation of love and their parish rights and liberties to accompany him in his perambulation and most did so in which perambulation he would usually express more pleasant discourse than at other times and would then always drop some loving and facetious observations to be remembered against the next year especially by the boys and young people still inclining them and all his present parishioners to meekness and mutual kindness and love because love thinks not evil but covers a multitude of infirmities he was diligent to inquire who of his parish were sick or any ways distressed and would often visit them unsent for supposing that the fittest time to discover to them those errors to which health and prosperity had blinded them and having by pious reasons and prayers moulded them into holy resolutions for the time to come he would incline them to confession and bewailing their sins with purpose to forsake them and then to receive the communion both as a strengthening of those holy resolutions and as a seal betwixt god and them of his mercies to their souls in case that present sickness did put a period to their lives and as he was thus watchful and charitable to the sick so he was as diligent to prevent lawsuits still urging his parishioners and neighbours to bear with each other's infirmities and live in love because as st john says he that lives in love lives in god for god is love and to maintain this holy fire of love constantly burning on the altar of a pure heart 
His advice was to watch and pray, and always keep themselves fit to receive the communion, and then to receive it often, for it was both a confirming and strengthening of their graces. This was his advice, and at his entrance or departure out of any house, he would usually speak to the whole family and bless them by name, insomuch that as he seemed in his youth to be taught of God, so he seemed in this place to teach his precepts as Enoch did, by walking with him in all holiness and humility, making each day a step towards a blessed eternity. And though, in this weak and declining age of the world, such examples are become barren and almost incredible, yet let his memory be blessed by this true recordation, because he that praises Richard Hooker praises God who hath given such gifts to men, and let this humble and affectionate relation of him become such a pattern as may invite posterity to imitate these his virtues. This was his constant behavior both at Bourne and in all the places in which he lived. Thus did he walk with God and tread in the footsteps of primitive piety, and yet, as that great example of meekness and purity, even our blessed Jesus, was not free from false accusations, no more was this disciple of his, this most humble, most innocent holy man. His was a slander parallel to that of chaste Susannas by the wicked elders, or that against St. Athanasius, as it is recorded in his life. For this holy man had heretical enemies, a slander which this age calls trepanning the particulars need not a repetition, and that it was false needs no other testimony than the public punishment of his accusers and their open confession of his innocency. It was said that the accusation was contrived by a dissenting brother, one that endured not church ceremonies, hating him for his book's sake, which he was not able to answer, and his name hath been told me but I have not so much confidence in the relation as to make my pen fix a scandal on him to posterity. I shall rather leave it doubtful till the great day of revelation. But this is certain, that he lay under the great charge and the anxiety of this accusation, and kept it secret to himself for many months, and, being a helpless man, had lain longer under this heavy burden but that the protector of the innocent gave such an accidental occasion as forced him to make it known to his two dearest friends, Edwin Sandys and George Cramner, who were so sensible of their tutor's sufferings that they gave themselves no rest till by their disquisitions and diligence they had found out the fraud and brought him the welcome news that his accusers did confess they had wronged him and begged his pardon to which the good man's reply was to this purpose, The Lord forgive them, and the Lord bless you for this comfortable news. Now have I a just occasion to say with Solomon, Friends are born for the days of adversity, and such you have proved to me. And to my God I say, as did the mother of St. John Baptist, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the day wherein he looked upon me, to take away my reproach among men. And, O oh my God, neither my life nor my reputation are safe in my own keeping, but in thine, who didst take care of me when I yet hanged upon my mother's breast. Blessed are they that put their trust in thee, O Lord, for when false witnesses were risen up against me, when shame was ready to cover my face, when my nights were restless, when my soul thirsted for a deliverance, as the heart panteth after the rivers of water, then thou, Lord, didst hear my complaints, pity my condition, and art now become my deliverer, and as long as I live I will hold up my hands in this manner, and magnify thy mercies, who didst not give me over as a prey to mine enemies. The net is broken, and they are taken in it. O oh, blessed are they that put their trust in thee, and no prosperity shall make me forget those days of sorrow, 
or to perform those vows that i have made to thee in the days of my affliction for with such sacrifices thou o god art well pleased and i will pay them End of chapter 3, part 2